Section 1 of The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 10, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. Mary Beatrice of Modena, Chapter 9, Part 1. It would not have been difficult for a mind so deeply impressed with the vanity of earthly greatness as that of Mary Beatrice to have resigned itself to the all-wise decrees of him by whom kings do reign. If the fact could have been made apparent to her that the scepter had passed from the royal house of Stuart forever. But in common with those who periled their lives and fortunes in the cause of her son, she beheld it in a different light, from that in which the calm moralist reviews the struggle, after time has unveiled all mysteries, and turned the dark page of a doubtful future into the records of the irrevocable past. The devoted partisans of legitimacy, by whom Mary Beatrice was surrounded at Saint-Germain, persuaded her that a peaceful restoration of their exiled prince was at hand. They fancied they recognized the retributive justice of heaven in the remarkable manner in which his rivals had been swept from the scene. The fact was no less strange than true, that in consequence of the premature death of the childless Mary, the utter bereavement of the Princess Anne, and the inevitable failure of the Nassau Stuart line with William the Third, the son of James the Second, had become the presumptive heir of those on whom Parliament had, in the year 1689, settled the regal succession. The events of a few months, of a week, a day, nay, the popular caprice of an hour, might summon him to ascend the throne of his ancestors. Who can wonder if the heart of the widowed queen occasionally thrilled with maternal pride when she looked on her two fair scions in the fresh budding spring of life and promise and thought of the sere and barren stems that intervened between them and a regal inheritance? The nearest Protestant to Anne in the line of succession, Sophia, Electress of Hanover, had, with a magnanimity rarely to be met with where a crown is in perspective, declared herself reluctant to benefit by the misfortunes of her royal kindred, generously expressing a desire that the nation would take into consideration the unhappy case of Le Palre Prince de Gales, as she styled the son of James the Second, that he might be rather thought of than of her family, since he had learned and suffered so much by his father's errors, that he would certainly avoid them all and make a good king of England. Sophia had, it is true, acceded to the flattering wish of Parliament that the Protestant succession should be settled on her and her family. But her scruples and the avowed reluctance of her son, Prince George, to quit his beloved Hanover to reside in England, inspired Mary Beatrice with a sanguine hope that little contest was to be apprehended from that quarter. The sentiments expressed by the electress regarding her youthful cousin were frequently heard in England at the commencement of the last century, not only from the lips of those with whom attachment to hereditary monarchy was almost an article of faith, but from many who dreaded the horrors of civil wars. Sympathy for the calamities of royalty has always been a characteristic of the English, and there was a romantic interest attached to the situation of the widow and orphans of James the Second, which appealed so powerfully to the sensibilities of kind and generous hearts, that the baser members of the Dutch cabinet resorted once more to calumny and forgery for the purpose of counteracting the revulsion of popular feeling, which was far more to be dreaded than the intervention of France. Scarcely had James the Second been dead a month when the notorious William Fuller publicly presented to the Lord's Justices, the Lord Mayor, and several ministers of state a book entitled a full demonstration that the pretended Prince of Wales was the son of Mrs. Mary Gray, undeniably proved by original letters of the late Queen and others, and by depositions of several persons of worth and honor, never before published, and a particular account of the murder of Mrs. Mary Gray at Paris, humbly recommended to the consideration of both houses of Parliament, by William Fuller, Gent. William Fuller had, for many years, earned a base living by devoting both tongue and pen to the fabrication of falsehood for political purposes. 
he was a kindred spirit with oats bedlow and speak and was employed by persons of similar principles to those who had paid and encouraged them the book which peers magistrates and ministers of state were found capable of receiving was the reprint of a libel on the exiled queen mary beatrice and her unfortunate son the malignity of which was only equalled by its absurdity being a new and very marvellous version of the old tale of her imposing a spurious son on the nation who instead of being the child of de brickbat woman as before assumed was he now pretended the son of the earl of tyrconnell by a handsome gentlewoman called mrs mary gray whom lady tyrconnell was so obliging to take the trouble of chaperoning from dublin to st james's palace where she was secretly brought to bed of the pretended prince of wales adding that the said mrs mary gray was conducted to france and there murdered by the command of louis the fourteenth with the consent of her majesty during the absence of king james in ireland in support of this romance he subjoined various forged letters especially one in the name of the exiled queen which he introduces with the following preamble i shall first set down the true copy of a letter writ by the late queen to king james in ireland taken from mr kane when he was apprehended for high treason at the ship tavern in grace church street on the fifth of march sixteen ninety and being writ obscurely i had the honour to make the writing apparently appear to his present majesty his royal consort and several noble lords then present in the king's closet at kensington by the steam of compound sulphur etc which secret was imparted to me by the late queen at saint germain in order to my conveying the same to her majesty's chief correspondence in england the only assertion in this monstrous tissue of absurdity worth inquiring into is whether william and mary actually committed themselves by personally countenancing the barefaced trick of affecting to steam an autograph confession of imposition and murder out of an obscurely written paper for the purpose of vilifying the innocent consort of the uncle and father whom they had driven from a throne the most revolting libel in the book is contained in the statement that a daughter and a nephew could outrage common decency by acting openly as accomplices of the shameless slanderer the indignation of the commons was excited against the originator of so foul a charge and the house finally proceeded to declare that the said fuller was a notorious impostor a cheat and a false accuser having scandalized their majesties and the government abused the house and falsely accused several persons of honour and quality for all which offences they voted an address to his majesty to command his attorney-general to prosecute him which was done accordingly and he underwent the disgrace of the pillory which to one so insensible of shame was no punishment those who are familiar with the journals of parliament and other documentary sources of information are aware that fuller was constantly employed as an official spy and informer by william the third or his secretaries of state that he suffered the punishment of the pillory several times for perjury in his base vocation and continually returned to the charge with the pertinacity of a venomous insect the accusation of correspondence with the exiled queen was constantly preferred by him against persons obnoxious to the existing government not long before king james's death he denounced at the bar of the commons several members of that house as confederate with other gentlemen in a plot for restoring that prince in pursuance of which treasonable design they had he affirmed sent letters to the late queen mary beatrice in a mutton bone as he could bring no evidence of this charge the commons out of all patience voted him a common nuisance fuller strong in the protection of the existing government regarded the censure of the representatives of the people as little as he did the law of god against false witness and republished the libel against mary beatrice in seventeen o one for which he had nine years before been branded with the strongest terms of condemnation a british parliament could express and suffered the disgraceful punishment of the pillory it was obvious that he had been suborned to revive his cruel calumnies against the exiled queen in the first month of her widowhood 
in order to rob her of the sympathy of her former subjects in her present heavy affliction in preparation for the blow which the magnanimous nephew and son-in-law of her late consort was about to aim against her and her son at the opening of parliament william the third was at loo at the time of his unfortunate uncle's death he was sitting at table with the duke of zell and the electoral prince of hanover dining in the presence of his dutch and english officers when it was announced to him that this long expected event had taken place william received the news in silence uttering no word in comment but it was observed that he blushed and drew his hat down over his face being unable to keep his countenance the nature of his secret communing with his own dark spirit no one presumed to fathom he returned to england put himself his servants and equipages into mourning for king james summoned his parliament and caused a bill to be brought into the house of commons for attainting the orphan son of that uncle for whom he and his household had assumed the mockery of woe this bill could not be opposed says burnet much less stopped yet many showed a coldness in it and were absent on the days on which it was ordered to be read the boy was but thirteen yet our amiable prelate's censure on the coldness which many members of the english senate showed in such a proceeding is not on account of their want of moral courage in allowing the bill to pass by absenting themselves instead of throwing it out but because they did not unite in the iniquity of subjecting the young prince to the penalty of being executed without a trial or any other ceremony than a privy seal warrant in the event of his falling into the hands of the reigning sovereign this was not enough to satisfy king william and his cabinet their next step was an attempt to subject the widowed queen his mother to the same pains and penalties it pursues burnet in allusion to the bill for attainting the son of james the second was sent up to the lords and it passed in that house with an addition of an attainder for the queen who acted as queen regent for him this was much opposed for no evidence could be brought to prove that allegation yet the thing was so notorious that it passed and was sent down again to the commons it was objected to there as not regular since one precedent in king henry the eighth's time was brought for it the right reverend historian ventures not to expose his party by mentioning the precedent which they had shame not to rake up from among the iniquities of henry the eighth's slavish parliaments as a warrant for a procedure which casts an indelible stain on william the third and his cabinet the precedent being no other than that of the unfortunate marquis of exeter whom the murderous facilities of the bill of attainer enabled the jealous tutor tyrant to bring to the scaffold in the year fifteen forty without the ceremony of a trial this illegal attempt on the part of william's house of lords to introduce the name of the royal widow par parenthesis into the bill for attainting her son by the insulting designations of the pretended prince of wales and mary his pretended mother is an instance of gratuitous baseness unparalleled even in the annals of that reign in which they sought for a precedent the attainer of margaret of anjou and her infant son edward prince of wales by the victorious yorkists in fourteen sixty one was a case somewhat in point as regards the position of the exiled queen and the irresponsible age of the prince but it has always been regarded as one of the revolting barbarisms of the darkest epoch of our history it took place moreover during the excitement of the most ferocious civil wars that had ever raged in england and was voted by steel-clad barons fresh from the slaughter of a fiercely contested battle where forty thousand men lay dead among whom were sons brothers and faithful followers queen margaret had introduced foreign troops into the kingdom and had caused much blood to be spilt not only in the field but on the scaffold mary beatrice had done none of these things she had shed tears but not blood she had led no hostile armies to the field to contest the throne with william for her son her weapons were not those of carnal warfare she had not so much as recriminated the railings of her foes or expressed herself in anger of those who had driven her into exile stripped her of her queenly title and appanages 
and not only violated the faith of solemn treaties and unrepealed acts of parliament by depriving her both of her income as a queen consort and her jointure as a queen dowager of great britain but even robbed her of her private fortune the solid eighty thousand pounds which she brought from her own country as her marriage portion conduct that appears disgraceful to the national honour when it is remembered that she and her two young children were destitute and depended on the precarious charity of a foreign prince for a home and the common necessaries of life and that neither as duchess of york nor queen consort of england had she ever done anything to forfeit the esteem of her former subjects she had been chaste prudent economical and charitable a fond and faithful wife a stepmother against whom no act of unkindness or injustice could be proved loyal and patient as a subject gracious and dignified as a queen and scarcely less than angelic in adversity her religion was a matter between herself and her god for she never interfered with the consciences of others superstitious in her own practice she might be and probably was but it is certain that if her life and actions had not been irreproachable her adversaries would not have been reduced to the base expedient of employing the slanders of a notorious criminal like fuller to blacken her with charges so monstrous and absurd that they defeated their own ends by exciting the indignation of every generous mind against the wretch who had been found capable of devising the foul calumny the commons though well aware that fuller acted but as the hireling tool of others in thus ostensibly calling public attention to the reprint of his condemned libel on the exiled queen which they had pronounced false and infamous summoned him and the printers and publishers to the bar of their house to answer for the misdemeanor and regardless of significant hints that he was employed by the secretaries of state came to the resolution nemine contradicente that fuller having taken no warning by the just censure received from the house of commons twenty fourth of february sixteen ninety one and the punishment inflicted upon him by just sentence of law has repeated his evil practices by several false accusations and divers scandalous pamphlets this house doth declare the said william fuller to be a cheat a false accuser an incorrigible rogue and ordered that mr attorney do prosecute him for his said offences in this vote the lords also concurred yet they scrupled not at the same time to abet the creatures of the dutch sovereign in their unconstitutional proceedings against the calumniated queen the commons had stoutly refused to pass the attainder of the widow of their old master as an additional clause to that of the unfortunate young prince her son and it is to be regretted that no clerk or reporter was hardy enough to venture his ears by taking notes of the stormy debates which shook the house on a question so opposed by every principle of the english constitution as that of an illegal attempt of the kind against a royal lady of whom no other crime had ever been alleged than the faithful performance of her duties towards a deposed consort and disinherited son duties from which no reverse of fortune could absolve a wife and mother and least of all a queen on the first of february this desolate princess writes to her spiritual friend at chalot i will try to lift up heart which is in truth much depressed and well-nigh broken pray for me near that dear heart which you have with you for the wants of mine which are extreme in conclusion she says the news from england is very strange god must be entreated for them since literally they know not what they do the meekness of this comment on the vindictive proceedings of her foes appears the more touching from the circumstances of its having been penned the very day before the bill for the separate attainder of the royal writer was read for the first time in the house of lords february twelfth old style from a refinement of malice she is designated in that instrument mary late wife of the late king james the title of queen dowager was of course denied her by the sovereign who had appropriated her dower and whose design it was to deprive her also of the reverence attached to royalty the widow of the late king james he dared not call her for there was something touching in that description it came too close to her sad case 
and in six simple words told the story of her past greatness and her present calamities with irresistible pathos they had attainted a boy of thirteen the only son of his mother and she was a widow and had been their queen and they the peers of england were invited to attaint her also but not by her true description not as mary the widow but as mary the late wife of the late king james the violation of the english language in this subtle definition being less remarkable considering that the measure originated with a dutchman than the profound observation of the susceptibilities of the human heart which it denotes and the careful avoidance of the use of titles calculated to inspire reverence or compassion the name of widow contains in itself a powerful appeal to the sympathies of christian men and gentlemen for pity and protection the apostle has said honor such widows as be widows indeed and such they all knew full well was the desolate and oppressed relic of their deposed sovereign noblemen there were in that house as well as peers some of whom remembered the forlorn widow of that unhappy prince such as she was when she first appeared before them in her early charms and innocence as the bride of their royal admiral many had bowed the knee before her when she stood before them a few years later in more majestic beauty on the day of her consecration as their queen when if any one of them had been told that he would hereafter to please a foreign master unite in subjecting her to the pains and penalties of a bill of attainder he would perhaps have replied in the words of hazael is then thy servant a dog that he should do this thing the dangerous contingency of awakening chivalric feelings or compunctious recollections in the hearts of that assembly was avoided the sacred names of queen and widow were denied the question was finally put for the third time on the twentieth of february in the house of lords whether the bill for attainting mary late wife of the late king james of high treason should pass and to the eternal disgrace of those peers who either voted in the affirmative or by absenting themselves from the house on that occasion allowed the iniquity to be perpetrated it was carried in the affirmative twenty peers however among whom the name of compton bishop of london is included had the manliness to enter a protest against the vote as illegal because there was no proof of the allegations in the bill so much as offered and it might be a dangerous precedent the commons when the bill was sent down to them treated it with ineffable contempt they did not so much as put it to the question but throwing it under their table consigned it to oblivion that such a bill could pass a british house of lords must be attributable to the absence of those noblemen who had followed the royal stuarts into exile the number of timorous peers over whom the terror of arrest and impeachment hung and also to the fact that several foreigners had been naturalized and elevated to the peerage by king william whose votes were at his command mary beatrice writes on the twenty fifth of the same february new style while the question was still before the lords to the abbess of chalot in increasing depression of mind you are kind she says my dear mother to think always of your poor unworthy daughter and of the means of comforting her i doubt not but god will reward you for it by giving you the recompense which he has promised to those who do the works of spiritual mercy among those i believe there are none more agreeable to god than to console the afflicted and i think that of all afflictions those of the heart and the soul are the most terrible especially when they are joined together which is at present my sad case after mentioning her intention of coming to chalot on the sixth of march for a little repose of both mind and body of which she says all around her especially her son perceive that she is in great need she adds the affairs of which i spoke in my last letter are not domestic affairs which go on well enough at present but matters of great importance i hope they will be concluded next week i ought to go to marley on thursday but i hope to be free to come to you on monday to open my poor heart and rest my body all those who are about me are convinced of my need of it they all pity me greatly and my son is the foremost to recommend me to take this little journey 
I believe that our dear mother and sisters will be very glad of it, and that the beloved concierge will prepare the apartment with pleasure. Among the Stuart papers in the Hotel de Subis, there is one extremely touching. It is an agitated scrawl in the well-known autograph of the Queen, in which she has translated the act of Parliament passed under the influence of William the Third, attainting her son of high treason by the designation of the pretended Prince of Wales. It is endorsed thus in another hand. 1702. Calfil, qui écrit de la main de la reine d'Angleterre, vous de Jacques du, contenant copie du l'acte pour la conviction du crime de haute trahison du putatif du prince de Galles, le roi Jacques III. The agony with which the widowed queen has translated this last injury of William against her child is apparent in the writing, which is crooked, hurried, and illegible. The attempt to subject herself to the same pains and penalties to which the young prince had been rendered liable is unnoticed. It was the arrow that had been aimed at her son which pierced the heart of the fond mother. Proud and sensitive as Mary Beatrice was by nature, the insults and calumnies with which she had been assailed must have been keenly felt, but her personal wrongs are invariably passed over in silence. In one of her letters to her friend, Angelique Priolo, without date, but evidently written at this agitating period, she says... I have need of consolation, for I am overwhelmed with chagrin, and these fresh affairs are very disagreeable. Alas, they are never otherwise for me. Entreat of God, my dear mother, that he would grant me gifts and graces to bear them, but above all, those of wisdom, of counsel, and of strength, whereof I am at present in such extreme want. After some allusion to the prospect of public affairs in France, which she considered favorable to the cause of her son. She gives the following particulars of her own state. Another consolation is that my health is as good as you could wish for me. Considering how deeply my malady is seated, it certainly does not increase, and if there be any change, it is rather an amendment. I eat well. I have slept better for the last fifteen days, although assuredly my heart is not tranquil, but God can do all. He turns and disposes us as he pleases. He mingles the good and ill according to his holy and always just and adorable will, to which I would conform in all and through all, and against the struggle of my own sinful inclination. We have been at Marley on the Feast of Kings, and the king, that is Louis the Fourteenth, came here three days after. He is always full of kindness and friendship for us. Adieu, my dear mother, till Saturday, eight days hence, in the evening, when I hope to embrace you, and to have more time to converse with you, during this journey, than I have had in the last. My poor heart is oppressed and bursting, but not the less yours. It was the act of Parliament, enforcing an oath for the abjuration of the young prince, her son, that so greatly depressed and agitated the heart of Mary Beatrice. The measure was strongly opposed in the House of Commons, and much diplomacy was practiced there, to throw the bill out by subtle amendments, in order to gain time. But the Jacobite party were outmaneuvered, and it passed the Lords. The Council ordered a special commission to be prepared, for giving the royal assent to it without delay, the forms requiring it to be signed by the King, in the presence of the Lord Keeper and the clerks of the Parliament. The awful sentence... Je tire vers ma fine, occupied the thoughts of the expiring monarch before the deputation arrived at Kensington Palace, and it was many hours ere they could obtain admission into his presence. The pause was of no common interest. The fortunes of the two rivaling claimants of the crown hung on the event. Parliament remained sitting, and the Jacobite party, well aware that William was not in a state to be troubled with business, raised the cry of, adjourn, adjourn, hoping that the bill would be lost by the demise of the sovereign, but a message from the lords prevented their plan from being carried into effect. The deputation entered the royal chamber meantime, but William's nerveless hand being incapable of giving effect to the last office of hatred, which survived the corporeal powers of sinking nature, by signing the bill, the facsimile stamp was affixed in his presence. 
This was the last regnal act of William's life, of which it might truly be said, the end crowns the works. He expired the next day, March 8, 1702, having survived his unfortunate uncle, James II, scarcely six months. This event had been long expected and eagerly anticipated by the friends of the exiled royal family as the epoch of a counter-revolution in favor of the son of James II. Burnett complains that the young prince had a strong party in England who were eager to place him on the throne. In Scotland, the dread of a popish sovereign had become secondary to the fear of seeing the ancient realm degraded into a province to England. The health of the representative of the royal Stuarts had been publicly drunk by the title of James the Eighth and that of Mary Beatrice as the Queen Mother. Ireland only required a leader to rise and proclaim her son from one end of the Green Isle to the other as James the Third. Yet Anne succeeded to the throne of the three realms on the death of William the Third as peacefully as if there had been no such person in existence as a brother whom a closely balanced moiety of her subjects considered their king de jure, that no effort was made in behalf of that prince by the Jacobite party, stimulated by the regent court of Saint-Germain, and supported by his powerful allies, the kindred monarchs of France and Spain, has been regarded as an inexplicable mystery, but like many other historical problems, may be explained by a little research. From the inedited Chalot correspondence, it appears that Mary Beatrice, overwhelmed with the difficulties and perplexities of her position, and above all, with the feverish excitement of the crisis, was attacked with a dangerous illness just before the death of William, which brought her to the verge of the grave and completely incapacitated her from taking any part in the deliberations of her council on the momentous question of what ought to be done with regard to her son's claims to the crown of great britain her life depended on her being kept quiet because of the violent palpitations of the heart and other alarming symptoms with which her illness was accompanied her cabinet torn with conflicting jealousies and passions could agree on nothing. So, of course, nothing was done, and before she was in a state to decide between the opposing counsels of the rival ministers, Middleton and Perth, her stepdaughter Anne was peacefully settled on the throne, and the hopes of royalty were forever lost to her son and his descendants. The convalescence of Mary Beatrice was tedious, and her recovery was impeded by the fasts and other austerities which she practiced, till her spiritual director, Father Ruga, was compelled to intervene, as we find by a letter from that ecclesiastic, to Madame Priolo, dated March 15th, in which he says, that he has given the ladies, Strickland and Molza, to understand the opinions of Her Majesty's physicians and surgeons on this subject, and that he shall do everything in his power for the preservation of a health so precious. However, continues he, the queen has desisted from the mortifications of her body in obedience to those counsels and is following the orders of her physicians and my directions. She has begun to go out for a walk after dinner, and they have taken measures for preventing the importunities of her officers about audiences. Almost the first use the royal invalid made of her pen was to write the following brief note to her friend, Angelique Priolo, which bears evident traces of her inability for application to public business, but, as usual, she appears more troubled at the sufferings of others than her own. Saint-Germain, 13th of April. I know not whether I shall have strength to write to you, my dear mother, for this is the first letter I have attempted since I quitted you. I am in pain for our poor dear de Posse. I send my physician to see her, and render me an exact account of her state. Embrace her tenderly for me. I pray for her with all my heart. The physician will give you an account of my poor health, which, I believe, will not permit me to pass the festivals with you, as I could have wished, but it is not often that I can do as I would. I am not strong enough to tell you more. I am yours, my dear mother, with all my heart, and the same to my dear portress. M. R. Directed for Our Dear Mother. In a letter of a later date, she writes more at length and enters into some few particulars of her illness. 
from one allusion it appears that her ecclesiastics had been amusing her with an account of the miracles said to have been wrought through the intercession of her deceased consort accounts that were at first very cautiously received by mary beatrice it is on the whole a very curious letter at saint germain this second of may at length my dear mother i find a moment of time and enough health to write to you it is certain that i have had a very bad cold for some days past the nights of friday and saturday were so bad i having passed them almost entirely in coughing and with palpitations of the heart that the doctors at last resolved to bleed me of which they have no reason to repent for i am now quite well not having had any more of the cough and the palpitations of the heart have been much less but this last night has been the best and i can say the only entirely good one that i have had for eight months but enough of my poor body as for my heart it is in the same state as it was when i left you never better but often worse according to the things which happen in the day these are always wearisome to me and very disagreeable i have had however the day before yesterday the pleasure of seeing the king that is louis the fourteenth for an hour and a half and yesterday madame de m was here nearly two and a half but in truth their affairs are not pleasant and they have throughout a bad aspect but god can change all that in a moment when it shall please him and he will do it if it be to his glory and for our good it is this only that should be asked of him without wishing for anything else i am impatient to see the brother of the cure of saint persane i hope that you will send him to me soon i have seen about the conversion of souls which is a greater miracle than the healing of bodies attributed to the intercession of our holy king and which gave me pleasure although i am not so sensible of it as i could wish alas i know not of what i am made the only sensibility that remains in me is for pain but i am obliged to you my ever dear mother for the holy jealousy you have of my love to god beseech him to renew it in this poor heart which after all is devoid of rest when it is not occupied with him the royal widow of england goes on to speak of a subject of distressing import to her poverty i am ashamed she says of not having sent you all the money that i owe you i will do it the first opportunity i dare not tell you the state i am in for want of money it would give you too much pain it seems however as if a present to the convent was to be extracted out of the narrow finances of the royal devotee at this most inconvenient season a present for which the abbess was to advance the purchase money on her own account let the veil of the chalice and all the other necessaries be provided continues her majesty for it must be done and in a few days you will be paid adieu my dear mother in three weeks you shall see us if it should please god that my poor children be well the holy ladies of chalot had sent an offering from their garden to the queen for she says in her postscript the salad was admirable and the flowers very beautiful i hope that the king my son and my daughter will thank you for them by lady almond but i always do so both for them and me i am sorry she adds that your nephew has not got anything he must humble himself and not to attach himself to things of this earth for all fail end of section one section two of the lives of the queens of england volume ten by agnes and elizabeth strickland this librivox recording is in the public domain mary beatrice of modena chapter nine part two it was about this period that the dreadful malady which had appeared a few months before king james's death began to assume a painful and alarming form when her majesty consulted the celebrated fagon on her case and entreated him to tell her the truth without reserve he frankly acknowledged that the cancer was incurable but assured her at the same time that her existence might be prolonged for many years if she would submit to a series of painful operations and adhere strictly to the regimen he would prescribe 
She replied, That life was too wearisome to her to be worth the trouble of preserving on such terms. But, repenting of her passionate exclamation, as an act of sinful impatience, she added, that she would endeavor to conform herself to the will of God, and was willing to do everything her physicians required of her. She gives the following account of her progress towards convalescence in a letter to her friend, Angelique Priolo. It is certain that I have suffered enough with my breast during fifteen days, but it is also true that there were fifteen in which I did not suffer more, and that for the last three or four days it appears better than it has done for some months. Nevertheless, I fear that the anguish will return after a time. It must be as God pleases. I supplicate him always, and I entreat you to do the same, that he will deign to diminish my ills or augment my patience. I entreat him with all my heart for the alleviation of your sufferings, but above all for the sanctification of your soul, for I regard that of the first importance, as I know you do that of mine. The king, my son, has continued well since my sickness. God never sends all my crosses at the same time. I hope that God, of his grace, will give me strength to go to Chalot about the eleventh or twelfth of next month. My journey to Fontainebleau is not yet certain, nor can it be for the present. My daughter trembles with fear, lest I should not go. I went the other day to Marley. The coach did not increase my indisposition, God be thanked. Unfit as poor Mary Beatrice was, for the excitement and fatigue of business at that period, she was compelled to rouse herself from the languid repose in which her bodily sufferings had compelled her to indulge, in order to decide on a question of painful import to her. Simon Fraser, generally styled Lord Lovat, had immediately on the death of King William proclaimed the exiled representative of the House of Stuart, King of Scotland, in his own county of Inverness, and soon after, presenting himself at the court of Saint-Germain for the purpose of persuading the Queen Mother, as Mary Beatrice was there entitled, to allow the young prince to follow up this daring act in his favor, by making his appearance among his faithful friends in Scotland, engaging, at the same time, to raise an army of twelve thousand men in the highlands, provided the king of France would assist them with arms and money, and land five thousand men at Dundee, and five hundred at Fort William. Mary Beatrice, enfeebled by her long illness, depressed by the disappointment of the vain hope she had cherished, that her stepdaughter Anne would not presume to ascend the throne of Great Britain after her oft-repeated penitential professions to her unfortunate father, and in defiance of his deathbed injunctions, listened doubtfully to the project. Her two favorite ministers, Carl and Middleton, had united in persuading her that it was only through the medium of treaties and amicable conventions that her son could be established as the reigning sovereign of Great Britain that his cause would be injured by the introduction of French troops, and that there was reason to believe his sister Anne cherished favorable intentions towards him, which would be inevitably destroyed by attempts to disturb her government. On the other hand, the Duke of Perth, who was the governor of the prince, and had been much beloved by the late king, endeavored to stimulate the queen to a more energetic policy. He showed her a letter from the Marquess of Drummond, his eldest son, assuring him that the principal lords of Scotland were ready to take up arms in favor of their hereditary sovereign, if he might only be permitted to appear among them. Nay, more, that a deputation from them was ready to make a voyage to France, to tender fealty in person to the young king. The Marquess of Drummond, Sir John Murray, and Sir Robert Stuart, the head of the clan of Stuart, wrote also to the queen and to the French minister, the Marquis of Torcy, by Lord Lavat, in whom they entirely confided, to urge the same, assuring her that Scotland was ready to throw off the yoke of the Queen of England, and to assert her independence as a separate kingdom, under the scepter of the representative of the royal house of Stuart. Ireland was eager to follow the same course, but it was necessary that he should appear among them, for it could not be expected that sacrifices should be made, and perils of life and limb incurred, for an invisible chief. 
Middleton opposed their plans, and urged the doubtful integrity of Lovat, and the certain dangers to which the prince and his friends would be exposed, and that he had better await patiently, as Queen Anne was childless, and, though still in the meridian of life, her extreme corpulence and general infirmity of constitution rendered it improbable that she would occupy the throne long, and, as a matter of course, the prince would, on her death, peacefully succeed to the throne. In the meantime, he was too young to exercise the functions of regality in his own person, and would be better employed in finishing his education under the eye of his royal mother, than roaming about in a wild, unsettled country like Scotland, with rude highland chiefs, from whom he might acquire habits of intemperance and ferocity, and be exposed to the perils of battle and siege, where, as a matter of necessity, he must conduct himself with the daring gallantry that would be expected from a royal knight-errant. Above all, there was the chance of his falling into the hands of the party that had persecuted him in his cradle, and even before he saw the light. Mary Beatrice was only too ready to yield to reasoning, which was addressed to the fond weakness of maternal love and fear. The terrors of the act of attainer that hung over her boy were always present to her. She remembered the fate of another disinherited and rejected prince of Wales of disputed birth, the gallant, springing young Plantagenet, Edward of Lancaster, stabbed by ruthless hands in the presence of the victorious sovereign, whose crown he had presumed to challenge as his right. There was also the unforgotten scaffold of the youthful Conradin of Swabia, the tearful theme of many a tale of poetry and romance in her native Italy, to appall the heart of the fond mother, and she obstinately, and with impassioned emotion, reiterated her refusal to allow her boy to incur any personal peril during his minority, and while he remained under her guardianship. Severely as the conduct of Mary Beatrice at this juncture has been censured in the Perth memorials, it must at any rate exonerate her from the calumnious imputation of having imposed a spurious error on England, since, if she had been capable of the baseness imputed to her by Burnett, Fuller, Old Mixon, and their servile copyists, she would have used her political puppet in any way that appeared likely to tend to her own aggrandizement, without being deterred by inconvenient tenderness for an alien to her blood, especially as her young daughter would be the person benefited by his fall if he became a victim. With the prospect of a crown for her daughter, and the dignity and power of a queen regent of Great Britain for herself, would such a woman, as she has been represented by the above writers, have hesitated to place a supposititious prince in the gap for the accomplishment of her selfish object? But the all-powerful instincts of nature were obeyed by Mary Beatrice, in her anxious care for the preservation of the son of her bosom, that unerring test whereby the wisest of men was enabled to discern the true mother of the child from the impostor, who only pretended to be so. The leaven of selfish ambition had no place in the heart of the fallen queen. She was ardently desirous of seeing her son recalled to the throne, which she at any rate regarded as his rightful inheritance, and her portionless daughter, recognized as Princess Royal of Great Britain, and after her brother, presumptive heiress of the realm, a station which the extraordinary beauty and fine qualities of the young Louisa promised to adorn. As for herself, she had felt the pains and penalties of royalty too severely, to desire the responsibility of governing her former subjects in quality of queen regent. The genuine simplicity of her character and the warmth of her affections are unaffectedly manifested in the following letter to her friend Angelique. Saint-Germain, this 17th of July. I have but one moment, my dear mother, to tell you that I am very well, and my children also. I went to Marley on Thursday, and found Madame de M, that is Madame de Maintenon, ill enough, but thank God, she finds herself at present much better. Lady Turconnell assures me that all the embroidery will be done for the beginning of September. I beg you not to spare my purse about it, for things of that kind should not be done at all, unless they be done well, and for this, 
above all, which regards the dear and holy king, I would give to my very chemise. I rejoice that our sick are cured, and that the ceremony of the new novice has been so well accomplished. I am hurried to the last moment. Adieu. I embrace you at the foot of the cross. Superscribed to the Mother Priolo. The embroidery mentioned by Mary Beatrice in this letter, and which she exhorts the abbess not to spare expense in having well executed, was for the decoration of the tribune in the conventual church of Chalot, where the heart of her deceased consort, King James, was enshrined, and was to be placed there at the anniversary of his death. That day was kept by Mary Beatrice as a strict fast to the end of her life, and it was commemorated by the religieuses of Shiloh, with all the pompous solemnities of the Romish rite. A vast number of persons, of whom the aged bishop of Autun was the foremost, asserted, that they have been cured of various maladies by touching the velvet pall that covered his coffin, and entreating the benefit of his prayers and intercessions. These superstitious notions are, doubtless, the result of highly excited imaginations wrought upon by the enthusiastic reverence with which the memory of this unfortunate monarch was held in France. The grief of his faithful consort was beguiled by these marvelous legends, although she at first listened doubtfully, as if conscious of her own weak point, and dreading imposition. But the instances became numerous, and being attested by many ecclesiastics of her own church, she soon received them with due unction, and flattered herself that the time was not far distant, when the name of the departed object of her undying love would be added to the catalogue of royal saints and confessors in the Romish calendar. When Mary Beatrice entered upon the second year of her widowhood, she passed several days in meditation, prayer, and absolute seclusion from the world. During that period, she neither received visitors, wrote letters, nor even transacted business, farther than works of absolute necessity. On the 2nd of October, the day she came into public again, she and her son visited King James' nearest paternal relative and dearest friend, the abbess of Maupassant, the eldest daughter of the Queen of Bohemia, for whom she cherished a spiritual friendship. She also held an especial conference with the celebrated Father Mazelon, the Bishop of Autun, Cardinal Noels, and other dignitaries of the Church of Rome, on matters of which she appeared to consider of greater importance than affairs of state, namely, an inscription for the urn which contained the heart of her deceased lord, and the various tributes that had been paid to his memory, in funeral sermons, orations, and circular letters. She writes on these, to her, interesting topics, a long letter to the ex-abbess of Chalot. The following passage betrays the proneness of human affections to degenerate into idolatry. With regard to the epitaph on the heart of our sainted king, I am of opinion that it ought not to be made so soon, since it is not permitted to expose that dear heart to the public to be venerated as a relic, which, however, it will be one day, if it please God, and I believe that it ought to be delayed until that time. Monsieur Doutoun appears of the same opinion, and also Monsieur Le Cardinal, who was with me yesterday two hours on my coming out of my retreat, which has decided me entirely on that point, by saying it ought not to be done at present. Meantime, they are going to make that an epitaph for our parish here, which I forgot to tell him, that is the cardinal, yesterday, or rather, I should say, to remind him of it, for he knows it very well. The literary reader will perhaps be amused to find Her Majesty in the next place, entering so far into the technicalities of publishing, as to discuss new editions, printers, and the business of the press, with Sister Francoise Angelique Priolo, who appears to have been the fair chronicler of the convent of Chalot, to whose reminiscences of the royal widow, her biographer, is so much indebted. The well-known obituary of James II, published in the circular letter of Chalot, seems to have emanated from the same friendly pen, for Mary Beatrice says, About the new edition of our circular letter, I pray you to tell our mother, who is willing, I believe, that this letter should serve for her as well as you. 
that it is true i told monsieur de autun that we would talk it over together at the end of the month not thinking that you were obliged to go to press before then monsieur le cardinal told me yesterday that unless i wished for the impression myself he saw no immediate reason for the reprint but if you are pressed for it or if you apprehend the printer will be otherwise engaged i have nothing to say against the first part but you must see that they omit all that regards me that is to say that they content themselves with naming my name and mentioning that i was among you for three days as to the rest i confess that i am not of opinion that they ought to add anything new to the letter at least not before the abridged copies that i had printed are all gone and m de autun and m le cardinal are of the same mind but really i cannot imagine that there can be any such hurry about it as to prevent us from waiting till we shall have discussed the matter together for i intend if it please god to come to chalot on the twenty-third till the twenty-seventh and then perhaps my reasons will convert you to my opinion or yours may make me change it for it seems to me in general that we are much of the same mind i thank our mother and all our sisters with my whole heart and you especially my beloved mother for what you did at the anniversary of my sainted king all those who were present considered that everything was admirably performed and with much solemnity which gave me great pleasure for if there remain in me any sensibility for it it is only in those things connected with the memory of the dear king i have read with pleasure although not without tears his funeral oration which i considered very fine and i have begged the abbe roguet to have it printed i entreated our mother to send the bills of all the expenses without forgetting the smallest any more than the largest i will endeavour to pay them immediately or at least a good part of them and after that is done i shall still owe you much for the heartfelt affection with which you have done all is beyond payment and will hold me indebted to you for the rest of my life madame de maintenon has been very ill since she came to fontainebleau last thursday the fever left her and for four days she was much better she went out last sunday was at mass and they considered her recovered but on monday the fever attacked her again i await tidings of her to-day with impatience having sent an express yesterday to make inquiries m de autun was charged to request Père Mazelon from me for his sermon at St. Francis de Sales. I hope he will not have forgotten it. On reading over your letter, I find it so ill-written in all respects that I know not whether you will be able to comprehend anything. Did I not force myself to write it, I believe I should forget how to do it entirely. I am ashamed, but with you, my dear mother, you know my heart. There is less need of words." the royal widow was roused from her dreams of spiritual communion with her departed lord by the turmoils and perplexities which awaited her in the affairs of nominal regency in the autumn of seventeen o two the subtle adventurer simon lord lovat presented himself once more at st germain bringing with him letters from two faithful adherents of the house of stuart the earl of errol and the earl mariscal of scotland lord keith aware that he had been an object of distrust to mary beatrice he sought to win her confidence and favor by professing to have become a convert to the doctrines of the church of rome he had succeeded in persuading not only the duke of perth but the pope's nuncio of his sincerity and he was presented by that ecclesiastic to her majesty as a perfectly regenerate character who was willing to atone for all past errors by his efforts for the establishment of her son as king of scotland as a preparatory step for placing him on the throne of great britain simple and truthful as infancy herself mary beatrice suspected not that motives of a base and treacherous nature could have led him to a change of creed so greatly opposed at that time to all worldly interests she was willing to believe that all his professions of zeal for the church and devotion to the cause of her son were sincere his specious eloquence was employed to persuade her that scotland was ready to declare her son king and to maintain him as such against the powers of his sister anne but they wanted money and for the present secrecy 
the latter was a quality in which the regency court of saint germain was notoriously deficient as the devoted partisans of the stuart cause had found too often to their cost the fact that no secret could be kept at saint germain had passed into a warning proverb with the great nobles of scotland and served to deter several of those who were desirous of the restoration of the old royal line from taking steps for compassing this object although mary beatrice was in the habit of disclosing her cares whether spiritual personal or political to her friends at chalot she relied so implicitly on the supposed impossibility of confidence that was reposed in such a quarter ever finding its way to the rival court at st james's that she suffered her mind to be imbued with suspicions that the earl of middleton was not trustworthy lovat assured her that the success of the confederacy of his friends in the highlands depended entirely on her keeping it secret from him thus she was conjoled into the folly of deceiving her ostensible adviser the man who stood responsible for her political conduct and she stripped herself of the last poor remnant of property she possessed in the world by sending the residue of her jewels to paris to be sold for twenty thousand crowns the sum demanded by lovat for the equipment of the highlanders whom he had engaged to raise for the restoration of her son lovat also insinuated suspicions that the most powerful partisan of her family in scotland the earl of arran afterwards duke of hamilton intended to revive the ancient claims of his family to the crown of that realm and thus probably traverse the secret overtures for a future marriage between the heir of that house and the young princess louisa nothing alarmed the widowed queen so much as the possibility of her daughter ever being set up by any party whatsoever as a rival of her son the ruin that might have ensued to the jacobite nobles and gentry from the rash confidence placed by mary beatrice and lovat was averted by the sagacity of louis the fourteenth's minister torcy who gave the earl of middleton timely warning of the intrigue middleton though deeply piqued at the want of confidence shown by his royal mistress was too faithful a servant to allow her to fall into the snares of the unprincipled adventurer he gravely discussed the matter with her complained of being a useless tool himself but besought her not to send lovat to scotland without being accompanied by some person of known and tried integrity to keep watch on him and report his proceedings to her and her council of regency torcy made the same demand in the name of the king his master captain john murray brother to sir david murray of stanhope was entrusted with this office and arrived with lovat in the north of england early in the summer of seventeen o three the exiled queen in the midst of the cares and perplexities with which she found herself beset as the guardian of a prince so unfortunately situated as her son was struggling with the pangs and apprehensions excited by the progress of her terrible malady in one of her letters to the abbess of chalot dated saint germain this second of september she gives the following account of herself i continued in the same languishing state in which i was at chalot three or four days after i left you and since that on my return here i had my breast lance many times for several days after this was over the pain ceased as well as the languor and i am much better i took the day before yesterday a little bath which i shall repeat more or less for i have already bathed fifteen times beaulieu will see you to-morrow or tuesday and he will give you an account of what mariscal said after he had seen me he goes to paris to see that woman of whom you know and those who are in her hands who are better they will bring her others on whom to try this remedy mariscal has assured me that there are not any of them whose case is near so bad as mine in the meantime i avow to you that i am not without apprehension and that i have great need of prayer for we must begin and finish with that i request of our dear mother and sisters to unite with me in this having no necessity to explain to them my wants which they know of old i must ask you to send the money to the benedictine fathers for the masses in order that they may not know that it is for me mary beatrice goes on to explain the object which she hoped to obtain by means far less likely to be pleasing to the almighty 
than the holy and humble spirit of pious resignation which she expresses her sainted king as she fondly calls her departed lord is to be invoked to the end continues she that he may entreat for me of god an entire resignation to his holy will like what he had himself when on earth and that i may feel a holy indifference as to the cure or augmentation of my malady and that the lord would inspire the physicians and surgeons in their treatment of me to do whatever may conduce most to his glory and the good of my soul in healing me if by that means i am still able to serve him better and to be useful to my children or else to give me the patience and fortitude necessary to suffer the greatest torments if it should be more agreeable to him it is two years to-day continues the royal widow and this remark proves that her letter was written in the year seventeen o three since the king that is james fell ill on the day of saint stephen king of hungary after a few more explanations about the course of religious exercises she wished to have performed in her behalf she sends her kind messages to several of the ladies of chalot and especially to sister mademoiselle gabrielle in whose grief she says i sympathize with all my heart for i know what it is to have lost a good mother but her virtue will sustain her under it and god will be to her in the place of all she has lost it is that consolation i desire for her notwithstanding the earnest wish of mary beatrice to submit herself to the will of her heavenly father feeble nature could not contemplate the dreadful nature of the death that awaited her without shrinking the regular medical practitioners could only palliate the anguish of the burning pangs which tormented her the nuns of chalot though to this day the remnant of that community professed to be possessed of a specific for cancers had failed to arrest the progress of the disease in its earlier stages and now she was tempted to put herself under the care of a female who boasted of having performed great cures in cases of the kind madame de maintenon knowing how desperate were the remedies often employed by empirics was alarmed lest the sufferings of her unfortunate friend should be aggravated and her death hastened by allowing any unqualified person to tamper with her disease this lady appears to have behaved in a tenderly sympathizing manner to the royal sufferer whose account of the interview must be given in her own words we wept much together at saint at the sad state in which i found myself she does not much advise me to put myself into the hands of this woman she said that if i began to give ear to those sort of people i should have charlatans besetting me every day with offers of remedies which would keep me in a perpetual state of uncertainty and embarrassment however she agreed that they ought to give a fair trial of her that is the doctress's remedy this we will do and in the meantime i will try to tranquilize my mind and resign myself entirely into the hands of god and i can do no more the progress of her direful malady appears to have been arrested for a time by the operations to which she had submitted she describes herself in her next letter as better though very weak she says she hopes to have the pleasure of coming to spend a week at chalot if her health continues to improve and to go one day to paris while there if strong enough but if not continues she i shall repose myself with my dear good mother i shall hope to find myself in excellent health after your broth her majesty appears to have derived benefit both in health and spirits from this little journey mademoiselle de la motte a lady of noble family who boarded in the convent was suffering from the same complaint as the poor queen and was disposed to try the cancer doctress at paris the queen's french surgeon beaulieu had placed a poor woman who was thus afflicted under the care of the doctress in order to give her remedies a fair trial and he was disposed to think favorably of the result after her return to saint germain the queen writes the following letter to calm the apprehensions of her friend angelique priolo who had heard that she was alarmingly ill saint germain the ninth of november in the name of heaven my dear mother be at rest with regard to me i can assure you with truth that my health is good my strength entirely renewed i eat well i sleep not always well but never very ill 
as for my breast if there be any change since i quitted you it is for the better i think so myself and i am not accustomed to flatter myself beaulieu went yesterday to paris and assures me that he found the sick woman considerably better since the fortnight that he had placed her in the house of the woman where she has been well looked to and attended and eaten nothing injurious i know not if mademoiselle de la motte has done what we resolved on but there is time yet for i believe it is nothing so much advanced as my malady i have had no pain myself for some days and i find myself at present sufficiently at rest be so yourself my dear and too good mother and begin your retreat without disquiet i suppose you will enter upon it to-morrow for it will not be more than ten days before we shall see each other send me this evening tidings of your health and take care of it for the love of me who have such need of your care and of your advice adieu my dear mother let us come to god let us live but for him and let us love only him since writing my letter they have resolved to give the holy viaticum to lady almond i sent to you six books to distribute thus to our mother yourself mademoiselle de la motte monsieur de autun monsieur de brienne le abbe de roguette but do not send this till the last as i have not yet given to monsieur le cardinal de noel or to monsieur le nuncio which i shall do in two or three days after having sent to the princes of the blood having as yet given but to the king and to madame de maintenon the books mentioned by mary beatrice were copies of a brief memoir of james the second which had been prepared and printed at her expense it is written in french in a feeble inflated style having many words and few facts and those by no means interesting to historians being chiefly descriptive of his devotional exercises the royal widow however frequently alludes to this work in the course of her correspondence with the holy ladies of chalot who were of course highly edified with it in a subsequent letter to the abbess of that house she says i send you this letter by father Bochet and a book of the life of the king for him to give you to replace that which you have given to him we are all very well continues her majesty and my son does not mount his horse with such impetuosity as to incur any danger other letters of the widowed queen at this period are of a less cheerful character sickness was in her household and her family her son was dangerously ill and the friend of her childhood the countess of almond struggling with a mortal malady death had already entered her palace and begun to desolate her little world by thinning the train of faithful servants who had followed her and her deceased consort into exile on the sixth of december seventeen o three she writes to her friend angelique priolo we have lost this morning a good old man named dupuy he had been with our sainted king more than forty years and was himself turned of eighty he was a very good man and i doubt not that god has taken him to his mercy our poor lady almond has begun to amend a little since yesterday i hope that we shall accomplish her business if it pleases god i thank our mother and sisters for the prayers they have made for her and request their continuation for she is a person very dear to me and has been useful to me for nearly forty years but we have another want for your prayers for the king my son was attacked with fever yesterday afternoon i hope however nothing will come of it for he is not worse this morning the shivering began at seven o'clock he did not go to bed till near nine and the perspiration lasted till near five they have given him a remedy this morning which has greatly relieved him and i hope the worst is over we cannot however be sure till to-morrow is past so if you have no tidings from me after to-morrow you are to conclude that he is better my own health appears to me better than it has ever been god grant that i may serve him the better for it the countess of almond for whom mary beatrice expresses so much solicitude in the above letter was the anna vittoria montecuculli of the early pages of her biography the same who accompanied her to england when she left her own country as the virgin bride of the duke of york lady almond was with the exception of madame molza 
the last surviving of the companions of her childhood by whom mary beatrice was attended on that occasion one of the few who could sympathize with her feelings towards the land of her birth or enter into her reminiscences of the old familiar palace when they were both brought up her majesty mentions her again with tender concern in the following letter to angelique priolo saint germain the twenty sixth of march the abbe de roguette will charge himself with this letter and save me from sending my courier to-day as i had intended the letter of Milady strickland was already written you will see that i greatly approve of your thought of putting mademoiselle de dempsey at amiens i wish they would take her for three months and i would pay her pension she will give you an account also of lady almond who has had a bad night however i don't think she is so near death as i believed the other day they decide absolutely that she goes to forge i greatly fear she will never return but they must do all they can then leave the event to god Milady strickland gives you the account of my health which is good better indeed than usual i hope that nothing will prevent me from embracing you my dear mother on monday next before compline it must not however wait for me for i am not very sure of my time i believe that i shall go to marley one day this week on the nineteenth of april her majesty thanks angelique priolo for the sympathy she had expressed for the great loss which says she i have had of our dear lady Almon. you know better than any other the cause i have to regret her and you give so true a description of my feelings that i have nothing to add to it yet i must own to you that my heart is so full of grief in its desolation since my great loss that all others appear of less account to me than they would have done before that time i have been so often interrupted since i have been writing to you that i know not what i have said and i am too much pressed for time to write to our mother the king louis the fourteenth came to-day madame de maintenon may perhaps to-morrow lady buckley gives you an account of the sickness of the king my son it will be of no consequence please god but i was alarmed the day before yesterday in the evening i am grieved for the indisposition of mademoiselle de lamotte assure her of my regard and the beloved economie i see well how much the good heart of the dear portress has felt the death of lady almond i thank you and our mother for all the prayers you make and have made for that dear departed one they cannot doubt of her happiness for the history of her life and of her death which had all the marks of a death precious in the sight of god alas i do not believe it had been so near it is impossible to tell you more for i have not a moment of time end of section two section three of the lives of the queens of england volume ten by agnes and elizabeth strickland this librivox recording is in the public domain mary beatrice of modena chapter nine part three the occupations of mary beatrice were anything but agreeable at this period when the treachery of a plausible villain made the loss of the tried friends of early life appear irreparable calamities lord lavat had returned to saint germain in the preceding january seventeen o four and delivered a false account of the proceedings in scotland and the north of england at durham he said in particular the catholics received him with open arms and when he showed them the picture of the young king knelt down and kissed it and prayed for him that there was a general meeting of all the gentlemen of that persuasion soon after and that they sent four of their number to entreat him to inform the queen that all the catholics in the north of england were ready to venture their lives and fortunes for the king whenever his banner should be displayed in that country also that an irish nobleman declared that if the king of france would send them arms he would engage five thousand men to rise in ireland that the earl of levin on his representations begged him to make his peace with the young king and even the earl of argyle had said that rather than the duke of hamilton should get the crown he and his kindred and clan would be the first to draw his sword for that prince 
Mary Beatrice listened at first with eager credulity to tales so flattering to her maternal hopes and returned a gracious answer without consulting Lord Middleton. She had not seen, though her biographer has the irrefragable evidences of Labatt's treachery in the letters addressed by him to the Earl of Nottingham, commencing with the date of his first appearance at Saint-Germain in 1699, proving that he came there as the accredited spy of King William's cabinet to earn not only pardon for his past offenses, but rewards for betraying the secrets of the exiled court. Mary Beatrice had misdoubted him then, and regarding his private character with disgust, induced her royal husband to forbid him their presence, but his pretended conversion and zeal for the Church of Rome made her fancy that he was a regenerate person. Her cooler minister, Lord Middleton, detected at a glance discrepancies in Lovat's statements. He waited on the Queen and showed her a duplicate memorial which Lovat had sent to him. Her Majesty replied that she had received one of the same date and to the same purpose to which she had given her answer already. Middleton, surprised and mortified, replied dryly, that was enough, and withdrew, observing in the bitterness of his heart that he was but an useless tool. He determined, however, not to indulge his resentful feelings so far as to leave the game in the hands of Lovat, by resigning his post, after the diplomatic affront he had received from Her Majesty. He laid the matter dispassionately before the French minister, de Torcy and the nuncio, and got the latter to disabuse the queen. He also induced him to propound a list of questions to Lovat, in the name of Her Majesty, especially demanding who the Irish noblemen and the gentlemen in the north were, who had, as he pretended, made such large promises of assistance to the cause. Lovat declared that one and all had engaged him to promise not to tell their names to any one but the queen, to whom, he said, he was ready to declare them in private audience, and then only on her majesty giving her royal word not to reveal them to the members of her council, because they had experienced how little they regarded secrecy. When Captain John Murray, the companion of Lovat's journey, whom he had contrived to leave in the lurch, arrived at Saint-Germain, he produced many proofs that the latter was the bribed instrument of Queen Anne's cabinet. Lovat took up the tone of an injured person and wrote to the Earl of Middleton. I am daily informed that the Queen has but a scurvy opinion of me, and that I rather did Her Majesty bad than good service by my journey. My Lord, I find by that that my enemies have greater power with the Queen than I have, and to please them and ease Her Majesty, I am resolved to have no more to do with them till the King is of age. In conclusion, he tells Middleton, he relies on the promises the Lady, meaning Mary Beatrice, had made in his behalf. A letter from the Earl of Aylesbury to the young prince's almoner, Saunders, soon after arrived, stating that the expenses of Lovat's journey to Saint-Germain had been defrayed by the cabinet of St. James's. The Duke of Berwick wrote also to Mary Beatrice, warning her against Lovat, and enclosed a letter from an Irish priest, called Father Farrell, exposing the base treachery he had practiced against a faithful adherent of her son's cause in London. Your Majesty, says Berwick, will see here a new confirmation of Lovat's knavery, and I believe it is absolutely necessary that Your Majesty send a French translation of this paper to the Marquis de Torcy. The affair is of great consequence, and Your Majesty may depend that the King's affairs are ruined unless Lord Lovat is apprehended. In consequence of Berwick's advice, Lovat was arrested by the French government and sent to the castle of Angoulême. Abundant reason appeared for detaining him, a close prisoner, for several years. One of his objects in conjoling the widowed queen of James II was to obtain credentials to the adherents of the Jacobite cause. Mary Beatrice had entrusted him with a letter to the Duke of Gordon. This he used as a weapon in a quarrel of his own, by transferring it to an envelope addressed to his great enemy, the Duke of Athol, and then placing it in the hands of Queensberry as an evidence that Athol was in correspondence with the mother of the disinherited representative of the House of Stuart. 
There can be no doubt, but the employment of so unprincipled a person as Lovat did an infinity of mischief to the Jacobite cause in Scotland, especially as the cabinet of Queen Anne made use of his information as a pretense for pursuing arbitrary measures to overawe the opposers of the Union. The intrigues and counter-intrigues, the double treasons, the bribery and corruption, the agitation and the follies that were perpetrated at that momentous crisis belong to general history and can only be occasionally alluded to in these pages in illustration of the letters and personal conduct of the unfortunate widow of the last of our Stuart kings in fulfillment of the duties which her titular office of regent or guardian to the young prince their son imposed on her alas for any woman who is placed in circumstances like those with which mary beatrice had to struggle while carrying the fire in her bosom that was slowly consuming her living frame denied the repose for which her suffering body and weary spirit sighed conscious of her own helplessness and tossed like a feather on a strong stream by the adverse currents of warring parties the duke of marlborough in his secret correspondence with the court of saint germain lamented that his nephew the duke of berwick should have been removed to spain instead of remaining on the spot to be in readiness for action he was in fact the proper person to have acted for the young prince his half-brother being the only man of talent and decision at the exiled court he enjoyed moreover the entire confidence of his royal father's widow who entertained almost a maternal affection for him and he always treated her with profound respect and bears the highest testimony to her moral worth in his memoirs where he speaks of her testimony in a disputed matter as decisive the queen told me so says he emphatically and she was a princess of great veracity berwick had good reason to think well of mary beatrice she had stood his friend with his royal father twice when he had displeased him by contracting love marriages berwick having after the death of his first duchess wedded one of her majesty's maids of honour the daughter of Colonel and Lady Sophia Buckley, Mary Beatrice kindly appointed the young Duchess of Berwick as Lady of the Bedchamber, and treated her almost as if she had been a daughter of her own, retaining her about her person during the Duke's absence in his campaigns. After the death of King James, Berwick wishing to be naturalized as a subject of France, Her Majesty exerted her utmost influence with Louis the Fourteenth and Madame de Maintenon to promote his interests. She also wrote in his behalf so warmly to the Princess de Urson, whom she had formerly known in her early youth, and indeed claimed kindred with through her mother, the late Duchess of Modena, that she succeeded in obtaining for him the post of Generalissimo of the French armies sent by Louis to support his grandson's pretensions to the crown of Spain, against the Archduke Charles, Queen Anne's protégé. The brilliant exploits of the son of James the Second in that campaign were certainly such as to do honor to the earnest recommendation of his royal stepmother, if that title may be bestowed on Mary Beatrice. Those who are familiar with Marlborough's secret transactions, under the feigned name of Armsworth, with the court of Saint-Germain and its agents in England and Holland, and at the same time trace the rise and progress of the deadly hatred between his imperious helpmate and queen anne will be at no loss to divine the nature of the project that was inadvertently traversed by the successful efforts of mary beatrice for the employment of the brilliant talents of one so near and dear to her departed lord in a more important sphere than her impoverished shadow of a court could offer if she had possessed the selfish talents meet for the position she occupied she would have prevented berwick from divorcing his fortunes from those of her son in order to secure those services in his cause which were eventually the means of establishing the intrusive bourbon dynasty on the throne of spain berwick was perhaps the only man attached to the cause of her son whom the cautious favorite of fortune marlborough could rely on and when he was removed from the scene the game might be considered a losing one in august seventeen o four louis the fourteenth gave a grand fete and illuminations at marley to celebrate the birth of a great-grandson of france the infant duke of bretagne the first-born of the duke and duchess of burgundy mary beatrice with her son and daughter were among the guests 
out of compliment to the titular rank they held at that court they were given the place of honor taking precedence of every person but the king of france who according to his invariable custom gave the hand to the widowed queen her feelings were little in unison with the pomp and pageantry of royalty if we may judge from the strain in which she writes the next day to her friend at chalot her faithful heart occupying itself neither on the splendid festivities of which she had been a joyless spectator at marley nor the anticipation of those in which she was about to join during her approaching visit to fontainebleau but in making arrangements to assist in the services of her church for the mournful anniversary of her beloved consort's death saint germain this wednesday these three days have i sought for a moment to write to you my dear mother to let you know that i shall be please god at chalot on monday next fifteenth at five o'clock i hope you will defer the vespers of the dead till that hour i cannot come till the day when i am returning here from fontainebleau where i shall go on monday it will be two days journey by land not by water as m fagon does not approve of the latter i went yesterday to marley and my daughter also for the first time we supped there i found madame de maintenon not half well all have their afflictions i have not seen her since your misfortune i can feel with all my heart for desolate wives and mothers the religious youths are happier for they have nothing nearer than nephews to lose i am however very sorry for that of my dear portress for the love of her i have sent to m de montspan and to m de valmy to make my condolences to her sister-in-law and to say that it was you who informed me of the death of her only son the rest of this letter consists of messages of congratulation or sympathy to various members of the sisterhood of chalot and the royal writer adds with some naivete accommodate all these compliments for good or ill properly my dear mother for i am so pressed for time that i know not what i say the health of her beloved son that child of vows and prayers as his fond father had with his last breath called him was very delicate indeed he appeared to hold his life on a tenure so precarious as to be an object of perpetual anxiety to his widowed mother on the fifteenth of december seventeen o four she writes to the abbess of chalot i thank you for your prayers for the king my son and i entreat you to continue them for certainly he is not better he had the fever again on saturday and sunday they bled him yesterday morning and i do not find that his cold was at all relieved by it but he has no fever to-day god is the master and he must do for him and me whatever it shall please him my daughter is very well and i am better than usual but my dear mother it will be impossible to be at chalot till the sunday after christmas i had reckoned that my sister le veyer would take the habit on the friday and i should return on the saturday morning but in the state in which i see my son i cannot quit him for some days and unless he should be better than he is now i cannot hope to pass christmas with you in the early part of the year seventeen o five all other cares and anxieties that oppress mary beatrice appear to have been forgotten in her trembling solicitude for the health of her boy on the fourteenth of february she informs her friends at chalot that he continues in a languishing condition and recommends him to their prayers six days later he was so seriously ill that the fond mother in the anguish of her heart despairing of the power of medical skill to save him wrote an agitated letter to the abbess of chalot imploring the intercession of that friendly community with heaven on his behalf and also that they would endeavor by earnest prayers to obtain that of the deceased king her husband in whose canonization she was a devout believer for the recovery of her son her letter contains evidences of fervent but misdirected faith a fond reliance on the prayers of others for that which should have been sought of god through the intercession of a divine mediator alone due allowance ought however to be made for the effects of a conventual education on an ardent daughter of the south and above all for the agony of maternal apprehension for the life of her only son under which she wrote no one but the most tenderly devoted of mothers could have desired the life of a male claimant of the crown of england to be prolonged whose existence alone prevented the amicable arrangement of all disputes and difficulties 
by the recognition of her daughter, the Princess Louisa, as the successor of Queen Anne. No jealousies could have been entertained by that sovereign of rivalry from a younger sister, and all national fears for the interests of the Church of England might have been obviated by a marriage with the hereditary Prince of Hanover, a measure that could not even be proposed during the life of her brother. As regarded the succession to the throne of England, the Princess Louisa lay under no disabilities. Neither acts of attainder nor oaths of abjuration had passed against her, and if the personal existence of this youngest and most promising scion of the Stuart line had never been publicly noticed by contending parties, it was perhaps because her political importance was secretly felt by the subtle calculators, who were aware of the delicacy of her brother's constitution, and the yearning of the childless Anne towards the successor of her own name and blood. The death of the unfortunate son of James the Second at that epoch, would have excited a general feeling of sympathy for his mother and sister. The stumbling stone of the offense would have been removed, and all fears of civil wars averted by restoring the regal succession to the regular order. In that case, Mary Beatrice would, as a matter of course, have been recalled to England with her daughter. She would have been relieved of all her debts and pecuniary difficulties by the payment of her jointure and its arrears, she would have had one or more of her former royal abodes assigned for her residence, with a suitable establishment for the youthful heiress presumptive of the realm, and the prospect of increased power and importance in the event of the princess succeeding to the crown during her minority. The unexpected recovery of the prince prevented the realization of this flattering perspective. He completed his seventeenth year, and his sister her thirteenth, in the following June. The Princess Louisa, who had inherited all her mother's beauty, was now regularly introduced at the French court, where, as the daughter of a king and queen of England, and sister to a prince whose title to the crown of that realm was supported by France, she was given precedency over every lady there, except her own mother, who always had the place of honor allowed her by Louis the Fourteenth. The following particulars of a grand ball at Marley, in July 1705, at which the royal exiles of Saint-Germain were present, will show the respectful consideration with which they were treated. At the upper end of the long spacious saloon in which the ball took place, three fautils were placed for the King of France, the widowed Queen of England, and her son. Mary Beatrice, as in the lifetime of her consort, occupied the middle seat. Opposite to them were benches for the dancers. The other members of the royal family occupied pleance. Behind the royal dais were the refreshments. The titular king of England opened the ball with his sister, and the king of France stood all the time they were dancing. This he always would have done every time this young royal pair danced together, if Mary Beatrice had not entreated him to be seated. But it was not till he had paid them this mark of respect twice or thrice, that he would consent to sit down. Mary Beatrice always sat between Louis and her son at supper, with her daughter and the immediate members of the royal family of France. There was a separate table for the officers of her household on these occasions, at which the Duke of Perth presided. The attention which had been paid to herself and her children must have been cheering to the royal widow, for she writes in better spirits than usual to her friend, the Abbess of Chalot, immediately after. Saint-Germain, 27th of July, 1705. I believe, my dear mother, that you were almost ready to be in a pet with Lady Buckley and me, because we have been so long without sending you any news. It is true that we are to blame, but you would be much more so if you could think that it was from forgetfulness, for I should as soon forget my children and myself as forget Chalot and my dear and good mother, Priolo. But since Thursday, we have had journeys and feats, besides which, my little malady often prevents me from writing, and Lady Buckley likes better to wait till she can send you one of my letters, believing that it will give you more pleasure. We are all well here, thank God, and my son much better than usual, and more lively. The latest news from Flanders is not good, but he must not be discouraged, nor cease to pray. From the same letter, we learn that Mary Beatrice had spent some days at Chalot in the beginning of that month, and that she purposed paying another visit to the community there in the course of a fortnight. She was, however, attacked with a relapse of her alarming malady, 
and she announces her disappointment to the abbess and la de posse in these words at saint germain this twelfth of august seventeen o five after all my dear mother there is no more hope of your seeing me for this next holy festival god wills it not since he permits my illness to continue and it is for us to take patience and submit ourselves to his holy will i entreat you and my dear mother priolo for this letter is written for you both not to be disquieted on my account but to recommend me fervently to god and leaving me in the arms of his providence be yourselves at rest for although it is fifteen days that i have suffered from pangs in my bosom almost perpetually and i have a few good nights yet the pains are not violent but i cannot bear the motion of a coach i will send beaulieu in two or three days who will render you an exact account of my state and in the meantime i am very sure that my dear mothers and all our sisters will pray for me to the end that god will grant me either a diminution of my malady or an augmentation of my patience for i confess to you that it fails me sometimes i fear that my dear mother priolo and my poor little portress will make themselves ill again by afflicting themselves too much about my malady try to console them my dear mother and they will console you with god who does all for our good there is no opening in my breast neither does it appear worse than when the mother priolo saw it the last time i have the three thousand francs already but i counted on bringing them to you to-morrow you see what i have done and if you can wait till my other journey which i hope god will not prevent me from making in september i will bring them then m r endorsed for our mother the poor queen continued under surgical treatment for several weeks in a letter to the abbess of chalot dated september fourteenth expressive of her disappointment at being unable to attend the commemorative service at the conventual church for the anniversary of king james's death as the physicians had ordered her to keep her chamber after making some touching allusions to her sufferings she says but god is the master and it is for me to obey and to submit myself with patience when i cannot with joy to that which he is pleased to ordain for me and he has renewed the anguish in my breast for the last four days if after four days continues her majesty i return to my usual state i think of endeavouring to go to fontainebleau by water nothing would draw me there but the love of my daughter and it will be for the last time in my life even if that life should be prolonged mary beatrice did not adhere to this resolution made in the sadness of her heart at a time when she declares that the motion of a coach was insupportable to her and all the pageantry of a court full of fatiguing ceremonies and frivolous etiquettes appeared in the light of vanity and vexation of spirit to her overburdened mind and suffering frame in another of her letters to the abbess of chalot evidently written at this period she says i sent my daughter to you the other day my dear mother and with her my heart and soul not having power at that time to drag my body thither but now i hope to have the pleasure of embracing you myself next thursday i have been dying to go to chalot for the last three months and at last i cherish the hope that god will permit me that pleasure in three days the fallen queen adds with impressive earnestness but we must strive above all to profit our souls by it and for this purpose we must excite and encourage each other reciprocally to adore and to love the very holy decrees of god in everything that he is pleased to do with us that we may submit to it with meekness and patience if we cannot with joy to which i confess i have not yet attained but god will assist us in his mercy and will give us strength proportioned to our difficulties i supplicate this of him with all my heart and am in him my dear mother entirely yours m r endorsed for my dear mother priolo it is certain that the queen's surgeon beaulieu must have possessed great skill in the treatment of cancer for the fatal progress of this dreadful malady was once more arrested and the royal patient to her own surprise and that of all the world became convalescent a cheering account of the improved health of both mother and son in the autumn of the same year appears in the private correspondence of the prince's confessor father saunders dated november twenty eighth seventeen o five 
the king is very well and grows tall and strong the queen also is much better than she was and it is hoped that the lump in her breast is not so dangerous as was once thought the princess is one of the most complete young ladies of her age very witty and handsome and of a most excellent good humor which gains the hearts of all who know her the secret correspondence of the court of saint germain with the jacobite agents in england and scotland meanwhile is rather curious than important marlborough under the nom de guerre of armsworth and godolphin under the name of gilburn or Golston, are frequently mentioned in carl and middleton's letters as making professions to the exiled family the following observation is in one of carl's dated june thirtieth seventeen o five I must also own the receipt of yours of the 3rd of May, wherein you relate what passed between you and Mr. Goulston, which merchant is not so prodigal of his words as his partner Armsworth, and therefore they are somewhat more to be relied on, and unless they both join to deceive, much may be hoped from their agreeing in the same story. Those double-minded statesmen had assured the widow of James the Second that the bill for the protestant succession should be rejected in the scottish parliament and that everything that honour and justice could require should be done for the prince of wales as they still termed the son of their late master mary beatrice was only too willing to be deceived and when the bill for extinguishing the hopes of her son was actually thrown out by that senate she was persuaded by her cabinet to impute it rather to the friendly policy of lord godolphin in refraining from attempting to carry the measure by bribery than to the unalienable attachment of the northern aristocracy to the representative of their ancient monarchs godolphin's lingering regard for the exiled queen rendered him rather desirous of arranging matters with queen anne and her cabinet for the payment of her dowry and its arrears and if he had possessed the moral courage to come forward openly in parliament with a manly appeal to the compassion and justice of a generous and chivalric nation in behalf of the royal widow whose destitution was a reproach to those who had been proud to bend the knee before her in the short-lived days of her greatness there can be little doubt but her claims would have been allowed she had an act of parliament in her favour which even those who had disgraced the name of english peers by their unconstitutional attempt to attaint her had not so much as endeavoured to get repealed because the sense of the house of commons had been clearly shown by furnishing king william with supplies for the express purpose of fulfilling that obligation though he had as before explained applied it to his own use godolphin was aware of all this but his own crooked paths rendered him timid and irresolute his correspondence with the exiled queen and her agents was more than suspected by the whigs lord wharton boldly declared in the upper house that he had my lord treasurer's head in a bag this menace paralyzed the vacillating minister he crouched like a beaten hound and submitted to all and everything that was demanded by his political antagonists even to the outlay of an enormous sum in purchasing a majority in the scotch parliament to carry measures perfectly opposed to his own inclinations and it was supposed no less so to the secret feelings of his sovereign lady queen anne it was in vain that the scotch jacobites urged mary beatrice and her minister for money and arms or that they represented to the arbiter of her son's destiny louis the fourteenth how serviceable even the small sum of thirty thousand livres would be to enable their friends to put arms in the hands of those who burned to decide the question of the union not in the senate but in the field louis had already paid too dearly for yielding to the dictates of his lively sympathy for the widow and orphans of his unfortunate cousin james to venture to act independently of his cabinet at that crisis the expensive wars in which that political blunder had involved france had crippled his resources the victories of marlborough taught him he had work to do to guard his own frontier and although he might perhaps have made the best diversion in his own favour by sending troops and arms to assist in raising an insurrection against queen anne's government in scotland his ministers could not be induced to hazard the experiment on the twentieth of march seventeen o six saunders again notices the improvement of the health of the queen and that the painful tumour in her bosom was decreasing 
he adds the following particulars of her son and daughter the king is very well and grows strong and tall he has begun to ride the great horse and does it very gracefully and all say he will make a very good horseman he has a great desire to make a campaign and the queen has asked it of the king of france who has not as yet consented to it in all appearance it would do our king a great deal of good and be much to his honour and reputation but the king of france will be loath to let him go till he can send him like a king the princess is very tall of her age and by her wit and gracious behaviour charms all that come near her the son of mary beatrice and james the second obtained his political majority on the tenth of june seventeen o six when he completed his eighteenth year the regency of the queen mother was then supposed to terminate but she continued virtually the leading power at saint germain as long as she lived though her son was treated by herself and every one in the exiled court as their sovereign and master he began now to take some share in affairs of state lord middleton commends the industry and application of this prince to business and extols his abilities but these were only shown in the easy pleasant style of his epistolary correspondence whether diplomatic or personal in which he excelled most of his contemporaries the following affectionate congratulation to his friend the marquis of drummond on the approaching marriage of that nobleman is one of the earliest specimens of his familiar letters and is through the courteous indulgence of the baroness willoughby de airsby presented for the first time to the public being an inedited document from the family archives of that noble lady saint germain june twenty ninth seventeen o six having found a safe opportunity of writing into scotland i take that opportunity of writing this note to you i will say nothing to you of my own affairs referring to what i writ to you and my other friends which will be communicated to you by the countess of errol your aunt and so will only add here how pleased i was to hear that your marriage with the duke of gordon's daughter is like to be soon concluded the kindness i have for you and your father makes anything agreeable to me that i think so much for your interest as i think this is i am very sensible of your own and family's services as i hope one day to be in a condition of showing you and of giving you proofs of my kindness for you james r pray remember me very kindly to lord john drummond do the same to lord stormont and assure him i shall not forget the zeal he has for my service nor the care he took of me when a child all that personal kindness and courtesy could do to render the widowed queen and her son easy under the tantalizing fever of hope deferred is done by louis the fourteenth he treated them in all respects as his equals and caused the same honours to be paid to them a fortnight never passed without his making a visit to them in state at saint germain besides coming much oftener in private with madame de maintenon he invited them and his young goddaughter the princess louisa to all his feats at marley versailles and trianon where he invariably treated them as the dearest of relatives and most honoured of guests if the queen came in state he received her as he had done in the lifetime of king james at the entrance of the first anteroom and leading her into the presence chamber stood conversing with her and her son and daughter for some minutes before he conducted them into his private saloon where madame de maintenon was waiting to receive them mary beatrice in fact was paid the same deference in that court as if she had been a queen of france and took precedence of every lady there the near relationship of adelaide of savoy duchess of burgundy to james the second and his children on the one hand and to mary beatrice on the other precluded jealousy on her part she had grown up from infancy in habits of intimacy and affection with the royal exiles mary beatrice was always invited to be present at her accouchments the affectionate interest with which her majesty alludes to one of these events in a letter to the abbess of chalot january seventeen o seven is very pleasing she says god has accorded a great mercy to us in granting us another prince he must be entreated for him i could not possibly arrive at versailles before the birth of the child since the king himself did not enter the chamber till after it was over madame the duchess of burgundy was only ill three-quarters of an hour she is wonderfully well i saw her after dinner and the infant 
he is not so beautiful as the other one but he has a smaller head and is better proportioned and looks as if he would live long as i hope he may through the grace of god sometimes louis the fourteenth would invite mary beatrice to come with her son and daughter and ladies on fine summer afternoons and walk with him and his court in the royal gardens of marley and it was on these occasions that the widowed queen used to take the opportunity of preferring any little request either for herself or others to her royal friend the public promenade was always one of the recreations of the court of saint germain even in the sorrowful days of king james the second but it became much more attractive after the decease of that unfortunate king when his son and daughter and their youthful attendants the children of the jacobite aristocracy english scotch and irish who had followed their majesties into exile grew up and the vivacity of french habits and associations in some degree counterbalanced the depression caused by penury and ruined prospects the lively letters and doggerel lyrics of count anthony hamilton the self-appointed poet laureate of the court of the exiled stuarts proved that after time had a little assuaged the grief of the queen and her children a good deal of fun and frolic occasionally went on in the old palace and its purlieus in one of hamilton's letters to his friend the duke of berwick he says the king our young lord increases every day in wit and the princess his sister becomes more and more charming heaven preserve her from being stolen from us for her lady governess seems to have no other fear than that these two are always near their august mother to whom they pay the most tender and dutiful attention to these precious ones of hers who are adorned with the virtues of their father it is her care to inculcate sentiments of gratitude towards the illustrious protector who in a foreign land by a thousand friendly cares mitigates the hardships of their adverse destiny we will now continues the sprightly old wit speak of our beauties those stars of saint germain who are always cruel and disdainful winter is drawing to an end and they are beginning to prepare their nets against the spring they have repaired washed and spread out all the delicate laces of which their cornets are composed to bleach in your garden all the bushes there are covered with them like so many spiders webs they are putting all their falbalas into order and in the meantime plunged in sweet reveries they permit the designs to sleep on their tapestry frames hamilton describes the son and daughter of mary beatrice as possessing great personal attractions the figure of our young king says he might be chosen by a painter for the model of the god of love if such a deity dared be represented by this saintly court of saint germain as for the princess her hair is very beautiful and of the loveliest tint of brown her complexion reminds us of the most brilliant yet delicate tints of the fairest flowers of spring she has her brother's features in a softer mould and her mother's eyes in another description of her he says she has the plumpness one adores in the divinity of sixteen with the freshness of an aurora and if anything more can be said it must be in praise of the roundness and whiteness of her arms the portrait of a beautiful nameless princess in the costume of the beginning of the eighteenth century in the guard chamber at hampton court will readily be identified by this glowing description of the honorary laureate of saint germain as that of the youngest daughter of james the second even by those who are not familiar with her other portraits how it came there is the question but there can be little doubt of its having been sent to her sister queen anne by the proud mother of this exquisite creature who was good as she was fair notwithstanding all the cares and pecuniary disappointments that at times oppressed the exile queen her family and faithful followers they led a pleasant life in summer time a life which as described by hamilton appears to have been a complete realization of the classic arcadia sometimes the prince and his sister led their young court into the depths of the adjacent forest in quest of sylvan sports or to gather flowers and wild strawberries sometimes they are described as embarking on the calm waters of the seine in their barge which if not very splendidly decorated or of the most approved fashion was large enough to accommodate a joyous party pontally the haven to which the voyagers were usually bound was a rural chateau on the seine within less than a league from the palace of our exiled queen 
it was the residence of the countess de gramont formerly one of the most celebrated of the beauties of charles the second's court she was now a rich and prosperous lady able and willing to contribute to the happiness of the royal stuarts in many ways and anxious to prove that her affections for that family had augmented instead of diminished with the adversity which had distanced many of the creatures of the late king's bounty it was her delight to provide banquets and entertainments of all descriptions for the royal brother and sister whom she had seen grow up from infants she had obtained a lease or grant of the old mill-house of saint germain and its adjacent meadows and for the sake perhaps of being near the english colony she had exerted her taste and expended some of her wealth in turning it into a grecian villa her brother anthony hamilton had changed its homely name mullen o into the euphonious appellation of pontely and there she frequently had the honour of receiving the exiles of saint germain in the course of the summer the royal brother and sister who perhaps were much happier in their free and natural way of life amidst the poverty and mockery of royalty at saint germain than if established in regal splendour at windsor or versailles delighted in performing minor pilgrimages with their followers to any of the churches or chapels within a walk of the palace on these occasions they carried a light refection of fruit cakes and wine with them and made their repast in some pleasant forest bower on their return count hamilton writes to his friend berwick partly in prose and partly in untranslatable doggerel rhyme a piquant description of one of these devotional picnic excursions which was undertaken by the princess louisa and her ladies of honour matronized by the duchess of berwick towards the centre of the forest he says there is a little chapel dedicated to saint Thibault, and this saint Thibault cures the ague now there is a worthy man at saint germain named dykeson who had several fits of it you know our ladies are always charitable to their neighbours so they all set off in company to recommend the invalid to monsieur saint Thibault, the fair nanette that is the duchess of berwick as she knew the least about him chose to beguile her pilgrimage by looking for strawberries by the way i will tell you the names of some of these fair pilgrims who went with her royal highness to make intercessions for the lord dykeson this gentleman's name which mary beatrice herself does not always spell right though he was one of her private secretaries and the comptroller of the household was dickinson hamilton tells his friend that the charming miss plowden was there and those two divinities the ladies dillon and mariscal but none were more agreeable than the duchess of berwick unless it were the princess and that they all went in procession singing and saying every office in the ritual from early matins for the sake of their amiable friend dykeson when they had performed all these charitable devotions they sat down to take a sylvan repast making the green grass their table but a french gentleman of the household the chevalier de sale who had attended them not out of devotion but gallantry was forbidden by the princess to join the circle because he had not conducted himself with becoming piety on the occasion instead of allowing him to have anything to eat she ordered him by way of penance to go and kneel at the chapel door and offer up prayers for the recovery of mr dickinson while they dined the chevalier very humbly recommended himself to mercy alleging in excuse that he had forgotten his breviary and did not know a single prayer by heart so the princess in consideration of his penitence gave him something to eat but made him sit at the foot of a tree at a respectful distance from her and the rest of the pilgrims and rinse all their glasses for them while the forest glades rang with their laughter for our fair devotees could laugh as heartily as pray on those occasions in the midst of their mirth the invalid in whose behalf the pilgrimage to the shrine of saint Thibault had been undertaken and whom they had all forgotten made his appearance unexpectedly before the festive circle they greeted him with shouts of a miracle a miracle and demanded of him the precise hour and minute when the fever left him and according to his accounts it was as they all agreed just as they had addressed the last prayer to saint Thibault in his behalf the repast did not conclude the more gravely on this account nor was the homeward walk the less agreeable the shepherds shepherdesses and woodcutters came to have a look at the courtly pilgrims and admired their hilarity and good humour 
sometimes the royal brother and sister and their noble attendants enacted the characters of shepherds and shepherdesses themselves and never allowed the merry month of june to pass without having one day's feet among the haymakers on the banks of the seine the princess and her stately governess lady middleton always boasting that the haycock which they constructed was neater and more worthy of admiration than those raised by the duchess of berwick and her compeers winter had its pleasures for the british exiles as well as summer mary beatrice gave then her balls and receptions in the chateau and the members of her court were always bidden to the christmas and new year festivities at versailles count hamilton gives a lively description of the shrove tuesday masquerade at saint germain to which the whole town was admitted the barriers being thrown open for that purpose by the orders of the widowed queen in order that high and low young and old english and french might join in the carnival etiquette forbade the prince and princess from wearing masks or assuming any particular characters on these occasions yet they are described as dancing merrily in the midst of the motley throng the princess with peculiar grace and lightness but both excelled in this accomplishment mary beatrice forgot her calamities and her grief on these occasions and smiled to see her children happy in spite of adverse fortune end of section three section four of the lives of the queens of england volume ten by agnes and elizabeth strickland this librivox recording is in the public domain mary beatrice of modena chapter ten part one the frolic and the fun that in spite of care and penury enlivened the exiled court of saint germain were suddenly sobered by a change in the politics of versailles after trifling with the exiled queen and her council and above all with their faithful adherents in scotland during the momentous crisis of the union when even the semblance of support from france would have been followed by a general rising in favor of the son of james the second louis the fourteenth determined in the spring of seventeen o eight to fit out a fleet and armament for the purpose of effecting a descent on the coast of scotland headed by that prince in person this expedition had been kept so secret that neither mary beatrice nor her son were aware of what was intended till the latter received a hasty summons to join the armament the young prince tarried not for preparations but bidding his mother and sister a hasty farewell he set off for dunkirk the place of embarkation attended only by two or three of the officers of his suite leaving his baggage to follow unfortunate in everything he had scarcely reached the coast when he was attacked with the measles every one knows the nature of that malady which requires the patient to be kept in an equal temperature till after the third day the prince was of a consumptive constitution and the weather very cold for it was march nevertheless he would have embarked at all hazards if his attendants would have allowed it his impatience of the delay was almost as injurious to him as the risk of striking in the eruption by exposure to cold would have been aware of the necessity of acting with energy and promptitude he caused himself to be carried on board the french fleet before prudence warranted him in quitting his chamber the wind had meantime changed foul weather ensued and it was not till after several ominous mischances and some personal peril to the royal adventurer that the armament succeeded in getting out to sea and by that time the english fleet under the command of sir george bing had sailed and was on the lookout the feelings of the royal mother during that anxious period of suspense will be best described by herself in one of her confidential letters to her friend angelique priolo after detailing the symptoms of a fit of illness brought on by her distress at parting with her son she says i must take patience in this as in many other things which disquiet me at present and keep me in a state of great agitation for i know nothing certain of my son as you will see by the copy of the newspaper they shall send you my only consolation is the thought that he is in the hands of god and in the place where he ought to be and i hope god in his mercy will have a care of him cease not to pray my dear mother for him and for me for our wants are extreme and there is no one but god who can or will support us i am in spirit with you all 
although my mind is in such agitation that i cannot remain long in a place but my heart will always be with you and my dear mother priolo who i am sure suffer with me and for me the princess louisa who is passionately attached to her brother and earnestly desired to see him established in the regal dignity which she regarded as his right fully shared her mother's anxiety on this occasion as soon as the queen was able to bear the journey they both proceeded to chalot fondly imagining that the prayers which they and their ladies were incessantly preferring to god for his personal safety and success would be more efficacious if offered up in the tribune of the conventual church there where the hearts of queen henrietta maria and her son king james were enshrined the all-powerful affection of mary beatrice for her deceased husband persuaded her that his spirit which she firmly believed to be in a state of beatitude always united with her in prayers to god for the attainment of any object of peculiar interest to both such as the recovery from illness the spiritual enlightenment or personal safety of their children the day the queen and her daughter arrived at chalot it was confidently reported in paris that the prince had succeeded in effecting a descent on the coast of scotland and had been well received the next morning mary beatrice told the nuns that she had dreamed a little old woman came and said to her no he will not land this time now although it was evident that the queen's nerves were unbraced by sickness anxiety fasting and prayer the vision of the oracular little old woman made a great impression both on the community and her ladies and they all began to relate stories of signs and omens i can remember well said the princess louisa though i was not quite four years old at the time that when the late king my father left saint germain to join the armament at calais expecting to embark for england i dreamed that i saw him return in a blue coat instead of the scarlet coat he wore when he went away and he said to me this place must be my england it was not the first time that the dream of the youngest daughter of james the second had been related in that circle for even in her infancy it had been recorded as a solemn revelation that the exile king was to behold his native land no more but to end his days at saint germain to imagine anything of the kind into an augury is almost to ensure its fulfilment james the second allowed more than one opportunity for effecting a landing in england in the absence of the rival sovereign to slip from the idea that a decree had gone forth against his restoration the dream of mary beatrice had in a manner prepared the ladies of her court for the news of the failure of the expedition the cause of its failure remains to this day among the unexplained mysteries of history it is true that in consequence of the fatal three days detention of the prince before the turn of his malady permitted him to embark the wind which had been previously fair changed that forbin the french admiral was out of temper and could not be persuaded to leave the port till the sixth of march and then encountered a heavy storm meantime the english fleet under sir george bing got out to sea gave chase and took to salisbury man of war an english vessel belonging to forbin's fleet bing was greatly superior in force forbin entered the frith of forth just below edinburgh it has been affirmed by some that the prince vainly implored to be permitted to land with the troops provided for that purpose by the king of france or even accompanied only by the gentlemen of his suite so sure did he feel that he should receive an honourable reception but nothing could be prevailed on forbin to permit it others have said that the prince was actually captured in the salisbury and that bing preserved his royal mistress queen anne from a most painful and perplexing dilemma by sending him privately on board forbin's ship having taken his word of honour that he would return to france without attempting to land if this romantic tale be founded on fact bing acted with consummate wisdom in ridding the queen of an invasion at the easy rate of releasing a prisoner whom she could scarcely have ventured to proceed against according to the severity of the law there was a prodigious run on the bank of england at this crisis and some danger of cash payments being suspended national credit being at a low ebb the squadron however which had created such great alarm returned to dunkirk without having attempted much less effected a single stroke 
a letter from mary beatrice to her friend the abbess of chalot apparently written the day after the arrival of her son at saint germain betrays the harassing state of affairs in her little court where every one was charging the disappointment on some inimical person or other the desolation of my soul she says would excite your pity if you could look into its depths my heart is also much broken and i have had for these ten days past business and domestic quarrels that have disquieted and vexed me to a degree of which i am ashamed and i declare to you that coming so immediately on the rest of my troubles i have been completely overwhelmed with it all pray god my dearest mother to succor and support me and to increase my strength for never have i had greater need and never have i appeared so feeble i dare not tell you that i have not yet been with my son i know it is a great fault but these last affairs have scarcely left me time for my prayers and although during the octave of the holy sacrament i have tried to go oftener to church god knows with what distraction of mind i have missed the first procession and the journey to versailles i shall go to marley to-morrow i was on friday at the review my son was there and many of the english who were as it was said well pleased with him my god what a world this is and who can understand it for my part the more i know of it the less i comprehend it unhappy are they who have much to do with it my son had arrived before me on my return from chalot this appears to have been the reason she had missed seeing him as he had been compelled to show himself at the review where it should seem he had been well received notwithstanding the failure of the last expedition in which he had been evidently the victim of state policy as absurd as it was incomprehensible the queen concludes her letter in these words madame de maintenon was here nearly two hours yesterday lady buckley makes me pity her although she does not know the unhappy manner of her husband's death this sentence implies some tragedy connected with the fate of the gallant colonel buckley which the queen had learned but had not courage to communicate to her faithful attendant lady sophia buckley several persons of high rank in the british emigration had been captured in the salisbury among the rest the two sons of the earl of middleton lord claremont and mr middleton and the old attached servant of king james lord griffin mary beatrice was greatly afflicted when she learned that they were all committed close prisoners to the tower to take their trials for high treason she wrote with her own hand an earnest letter to the french minister chamillard begging him to claim them as officers in the service of his royal master and exerted her influence in every possible way for their preservation simultaneously with these events queen anne's cabinet proceeded to set a price on her brother's head anne herself who had hitherto styled him the pretended prince of wales now gave him a new name in her address to parliament calling him for the first time the pretender a cunningly desired sobriquet which perhaps did more to exclude him from the throne than even his unpopular religion the young prince served in the french army in the low countries the same spring as a volunteer under the appropriate title of the chevalier de st george for being destitute of the means of providing a camp equipage and maintaining the state consistent with royalty he claimed no higher distinction than the companionship of the national order with which he had been invested in his fourth year by the late sovereign his father he conducted himself during the campaign so as to win the affection and esteem of his comrades and especially his commander the duc de vendome while her son was in the army mary beatrice was of course deeply interested in all the military operations of which he sent her a regular account in one of her letters to a friend the abbess of chalot she says we have been in expectation of great news for several days past i will tell you in confidence that they have missed in flanders the opportunity of a grand stroke and i fear that a similar one will not present itself any more this campaign god must be praised for all and we ought to try to be satisfied with all that happens i have just learned that the thunder has fallen this night on the abbey of Poissy and burned part of the monastery and what is worse three or four of the religieuses i have sent to the abbess to make inquiries in truth it makes me tremble 
well indeed it might since the scene where this awful tragedy had occurred was only six miles from saint germain in the valley below much less likely to have attracted the lightning than the loftily seated royal chateau where the widowed consort and orphan daughter of james the second were domiciled in another letter of the same period dated at saint germain the twenty third of june mary beatrice says my chevalier is in perfect health thank god and i am better than i have been for a long time we have some hopes of obtaining the liberty of the two middletons and of the other irish prisoners but for my lord griffin they have condemned him to die on the twenty seventh of this month which causes me great pain i recommend him to your prayers and to those of our dear sisters the chevalier st george had the ill luck to be present with his french cousins burgundy and berry at the battle of audenard a witness of the superior military genius of his secret correspondent the duke of marlborough his more fortunate rival the electoral prince of hanover afterwards george the second distinguished himself on the winning side the chevalier caught the malignant intermittent fever of the country at Mans and returned greatly enfeebled for the change of air to saint germain towards the close of the summer it was a cold wet autumn severe winter and ungenial spring the queen was ill anxious and unhappy on account of her son for the intermittent hung upon him for many months yet he was firm in his determination to try his fortunes in another campaign on the eleventh of april seventeen o nine mary beatrice writes to the abbess of chalot to excuse herself from passing the holy week with her friends there the physicians having forbidden her to change her abode that month unless the weather altered very much for the better she adds if the war continues as is supposed the king my son will be very shortly on the point of leaving me for the army it is not right therefore that i should quit him more especially as he is not yet wholly recovered from his fever for he had a little touch of it again yesterday though he perseveres in taking the bark five times a day this is sufficient to show us that the will of god declares against my journey to chalot for this time but when my son is gone i hope that god will permit me to come and remain among you for a long time meanwhile i shall often be there in spirit and i doubt not but my dear mother and our beloved sisters will remember me also when before god to the end that i may obtain from him the graces and the assistance that be needful for the work of my salvation in that place and state where he wills me to be which i ought always to believe and consider the best for me the late defeated audenard the loss of lyle the distress caused by the visitation of a famine and above all the deficiency in the revenues of that kingdom rendered louis the fourteenth not only willing but anxious to listen to overtures of peace instead of the armies taking the field plenipotentiaries were dispatched to meet the victorious marlborough and eugene at the hague to settle preliminaries for an amicable treaty mary beatrice was well aware that no peace would or could be concluded unless louis the fourteenth withdrew his protection from her son the prince was eager to prevent the mortification of a dismissal from the french dominions by trying his fortunes in scotland he had received fresh invitations and assurances of support from the highland chiefs the representations of his secret agents as to his prospects were encouraging enough to induce him to declare that he would come if he were reduced to the necessity of performing the voyage in a hired vessel when he threw himself at the feet of louis the fourteenth and implored his aid the monarch told him plainly the situation as he then was he had enough to do to defend his own dominions without thinking of anything so chimerical as invading those of the victorious queen of great britain the ardor of the youthful adventurer was moreover checked by a significant hint that if he attempted to embroil his present protector further with queen anne by stealing over to scotland and exciting an insurrection there his royal mother would instantly be deprived of her present shelter and her pension which formed the sole provision for the support of herself her daughter and the faithful followers who had sacrificed everything to their adherence to the ruined cause of the house of stuart would be stopped it is a remarkable fact that when torcy mentioned the son of james the second to marlborough 
the latter evinced a warmth of feeling towards the exiled prince scarcely consistent with his professions to the electoral house of hanover he called him the prince of wales and expressed an ardent desire of serving him and that a suitable income should be secured to him nor was he unmindful of the claims of mary beatrice he recommended torcy to renew the demand of her dower insist strenuously on that article to the viscount townsend he said that lord is a sort of an inspector over my conduct he is an honest man but a whig i must speak like an obstinate englishman in his presence marlborough was still more explicit in his conferences with his nephew berwick who being the illegitimate brother of the prince formed a curious link of connection between the great captain of the age and the rejected heir of england undoubtedly marlborough gave wise counsel when he bade the duke of berwick entreat the prince to emancipate himself from the political thraldom of france by offering to disembarrass louis the fourteenth of his presence as a preliminary to the negotiations for peace he clearly demonstrated that no good could ever result from a connection so offensive to the national pride of england for the people over whom he desired to rule would never submit to the imposition of a sovereign from france he hoped he said by extricating the prince in the first place from the influence of france and by prudent arrangement to see all parties united to recognize him as the successor to his sister's throne neither the prince nor berwick felt sufficient confidence in the integrity of marlborough to take his advice men can only judge of intentions by past deeds they call to mind his treachery to their royal father and suspected that the zeal with which he urged pressing the payment of the queen mother's dower was for the purpose of beguiling the prince into bartering his pretensions to a diadem for a pension and at the same time depriving him of the support of his only friend and protector louis the fourteenth the pacific negotiations at the hague proving unavailing the conferences were broken up and hostilities were renewed the chevalier having recovered his health set out for the french headquarters leaving his royal mother to struggle with pecuniary difficulties which neither wisdom could foresee nor prudence prevent all hope of receiving her income as queen dowager of england was of course suspended and the pittance she received from the french government was now unpunctually paid and subject to curtailment on various pretenses the first attempt on the part of the officers of the french exchequer to extort a percentage from her treasurer mr dickinson for paying her pension in ready money was resisted by mary beatrice with some spirit as an imposition and abuse of office which she said she was sure would be displeasing to the king of france they kept her then in arrear and offered to pay in bills on which she was compelled to pay as much for discount as the official thieves had demanded of her in the first instance she mentioned the circumstance to madame de maintenon but that lady who had herself been an underling at court accustomed to perquisites and privileges made light of it and advised her majesty not to incur the ill-will of the financial corps by complaining to the king who was greatly inconvenienced himself by the deficiency in his revenue bitterly did the royal dependent feel the humiliations and privations to which the wrongs of fortune had subjected her and her children and vainly did she endeavor by increasing self-denial and the most rigid economy in her personal expenditure to spare more for the destitute families who had abandoned houses and broad lands in england for her husband's sake the pecuniary difficulties of the fallen queen were embittered about this period by a mortification from a quarter where she least expected it when at chalot her daughter was accustomed to sleep in a chamber that opened into her own an arrangement which their near relationship and tender affection rendered agreeable to both but the queen being deeply in arrears to the convent for the rent of the suite of rooms she occupied the abbess feeling more disposed to consider the benefit of the community than the comfort of their royal friends hinted that having a tenant for the apartment adjoining her majesty's bedroom it would be desirable to remove her royal highness the princess of england to an upper story mary beatrice did not attempt to dissemble the fact that the change would be both unpleasant and inconvenient to her and was greatly hurt a few months later 
on finding that the room was actually let to madame de lorge a lady of high rank and her daughter and that they had made sundry alterations furnished and taken possession of it when however those ladies learned from a letter written by lady sophia buckley to the abbess how greatly the queen and princess would be inconvenienced by their occupation of this apartment they said her majesty should be welcome to the use of it when she came to chalot with the princess the high spirit of mary beatrice revolted at this proposal yet she wrote with great mildness and temper to the abbess on the subject after having desired lady buckley to write to you my dear mother touching the chamber where my daughter lodges at chalot i have remembered me that when last year you proposed to me to change my daughter's apartment and to put her higher i found that it would be very difficult to arrange it as my ladies would have much trouble to accommodate themselves in places which are now occupied by their waiting maids especially for any length of time and that my daughter herself would not be so well above nor would it be so convenient for me as at present i have no other chamber below besides that in which she lodges however if you my dear mother or madame or mademoiselle de lorge have any trouble about taking this apartment i pray you to tell me so plainly with your usual sincerity and i will endeavour to make some other arrangement at least if it be in our power you can if you please consult my dear sisters catherine angelique and mademoiselle gabrielle about it and then take your resolution and send me word for in case my daughter can continue where she is i should wish them to take away the furniture of madame and mademoiselle de lorge and i would send mine i also beg you to have the window put to rights and the other things that are required in the little lodging and send me the bill of what they come to as that is only just i cannot accept the offer madame de lorge makes me of the loan of her chamber i say this in case she wishes to take it away from me the apartment was of course relinquished by the intruding tenant it was indeed the dressing-room of her majesty's chamber which no stranger could with any propriety have wished to occupy and the attempt to deprive her of it served very painfully to remind the royal exiles of their adverse fortunes the princess louisa felt every slight that was offered to her mother or brother far more keenly than they did sometimes she said we are reduced to such pitiable straits and live in so humble a way that even if it were the will of heaven to restore us to our natural rank we should not know how to play our parts with becoming dignity the defeat of the french army at malplaquet on the eleventh of september seventeen o nine increased the general gloom which pervaded all ranks in that nation while it rendered the position of the court of st germain more painful and precarious yet the desolate heart of mary beatrice swelled with maternal pride in the midst of her solicitude for her son had distinguished himself by a brilliant personal action in that fiercely contested fight which had nearly turned the fortunes of the day after mariscal villers was carried dangerously wounded out of the field boufleur sustained the conflict and when the cavalry of the allies broke into his lines he ordered the chevalier de st george to advance at the head of twelve hundred of the horse guards the princely volunteer performed this duty so gallantly that in one desperate charge the german horse was broken and repulsed and nothing but the steady valor of the english troops and the consummate skill of their commanders prevented the rout from becoming general the rejected claimant of the british crown did not disgrace his lineage on that occasion though unhappily serving beneath the banner of the fleur-de-lis and opposed to his own countrymen he charged twelve times at the head of the household troops of france and though wounded in the right arm by a sabre cut he kept the ground manfully under a continuous fire of six hours from the british infantry Boufflers, in his dispatch to his own sovereign detailing the loss of the battle renders the following brief testimony to the gallantry of the royal volunteer the chevalier de st george behaved himself during the whole action with the utmost valour and vivacity the queen who had been residing for many weeks in complete retirement with her daughter at chalot came to welcome her son on his return to st germain where they kept their united court if such it might be called that winter 
the following melancholy letter without date was probably written by mary beatrice towards the spring when depressed by sickness and care and harassed with business which as she pathetically observes was never an agreeable kind at last i find a moment to write to you my dear mother and to ask tidings of your health for which i am in pain for monsieur gaillard told me that it was not too good be careful of it for the love of heaven my dear mother for i have need of you as you know alas there are none left to me now but you and father ruga on earth in whom i can have an entire confidence i have read the homily on providence which is consolatory i cannot say however that i have found consolation in that or anything else god is the master and his holy will be done i am not ill but i sleep badly since i quitted you and i am worse after the bath which i cannot understand but i have omitted it for the last fortnight and take the powders and waters of saint remy the king my son has had a cold but i hope it will not increase he does not keep his room my daughter bathes twice a week she is however very well it has refreshed her i cannot tell you more for want of time save to charge you with my regards after various kind messages to the sisters of chalot she mentions with great concern the sudden illness which had seized one of the most faithful and valued members of her household mr strickland has been attacked with paralysis he has great trouble to speak his wife is in despair they will send him to bourbon i am grieved about it and shall be very sorry to lose him for he is an ancient servant and very affectionate i recommend him to your prayers endorsed to mother priolo reminiscences of her former greatness must have been associated in the mind of the fallen queen with her recollection of the services of the faithful adherent whose illness she mentions with such compassionate feeling and regret robert strickland was her vice-chamberlain he was appointed to that office on the accession of the late king her husband to the throne of great britain and he had walked at the head of her procession at the splendid ceremonial of her coronation what melancholy reverses had since then clouded the horizon of her who was the leading star of that glorious pageant alas for the instability of human pomp and power and worse far worse the deceitfulness of fair day friends of all the courtly train who had contended for the honor of performing services for their young and beautiful queen that day the gay and gallant dorset the magnificent devonshire the specious halifax the astute manchester and the enamoured godolphin the bearers of her regalia who of all these had been willing to follow her in exile and in sorrow were not those men the first to betray their too confiding sovereign and to transfer their worthless homage to the adversary well might the luckless queen prize the manly and true-hearted northern squire who had adhered to her fallen fortunes with unswerving loyalty and having served her as reverently in her poverty and affliction as when he waited upon her in the regal palace of whitehall was now dying in a land of strangers far from his home who can wonder at her lamenting the loss of such a servant another of the queen's letters apparently written in the spring of seventeen ten when her beloved friend Françoise angelique and several of the sisters of chalot were dangerously ill of an infectious fever is in reply to a request from the abbess that she would defer her visit to the convent for fear of exposing her to the contagion and speaks a generous warmth of feeling and freedom from all selfish fears only to be found in persons of piety and moral worth it is altogether a unique royal letter and the reader cannot fail of being amused as well as interested saint germain the fourteenth of may your last letter my dear mother has caused me great pain by the sad account that you give me of the state of several of our dear sisters but above all that of my dear mother priolo of which i could much wish to inform myself and if i had not intended to go to chalot for the rogation i should have been there yesterday or to-day expressly for that purpose i should be glad also to see my poor little portress and i cannot see any reason among all you have mentioned why i should not come you know that i have no fear but of colds and i cannot perceive any cause to apprehend infection with you 
so then with your permission my dear mother i shall reckon to be with you on monday evening about seven o'clock and i entreat you to send me tidings of our invalids this evening the drowsiness of my sister f a that is francoise angelique does not please me i am very glad you have made her leave off the viper broth which is too heating for her i hope the sickness of my sister louise henriette will not be unto death i have prayed much for you all as for your temporal business i saw madame de m that is made to none this day week and she said nothing to me about it nor has she written of it since i fear this is not a good sign i send her a letter i know not whether you have read those of m d'autun to me which you might have done as they have only a flying seal if you have you will be convinced that our good mother of annecy has engaged me very unluckily in the affair of that priest whom she called a saint and who it appears was very far from meriting that name i have made my excuses to m d'autun and will write to him between this and monday we are all very well here thank god i could wish to find all well or at least better with you my daughter must not come but for me there is nothing to fear adieu my dear mother i am yours with all my heart and i embrace my dear mother priolo end of section four section five of the lives of the queens of england volume ten by agnes and elizabeth strickland this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary Beatrice of Modena, Chapter 10, Part 2 On the 16th of May, her son, the Chevalier de St. George, left her to serve his third campaign in the Low Countries, under Marshal Villers, with whom he formed an intimate friendship. The Duke of Berwick was one of the commanders in the French army, and was the medium of a close political correspondence, between his uncle Marlborough and Mary Beatrice. The victorious general of the British army was in disgrace with his sovereign, Queen Anne. His son-in-law, Sunderland, had lost his place in her cabinet. His colleague, Godolphin, had been compelled to resign, and nothing but the influence of the Allies kept himself in command of the forces. While the hostile armies were encamped on the banks of the Scarp, there was a great deal of political coquetry going on between some of the English officers of Marlborough's staff and the personal retinue of the Chevalier St. George, who, at the request of the former, showed himself on horseback on the opposite side of the narrow stream to a party who had expressed an ardent desire to see him medals bearing the impression of his bust and superscription were eagerly accepted by many of those who though they had taken the oath of abjuration could not refrain from regarding the rejected representative of their ancient sovereigns with feelings inconsistent with their duty to the constitutional sovereign marlborough's master of the horse mr pitt was the recipient of several of these medals which charles booth one of the chevalier's grooms of the bedchamber had the boldness to send by the trumpet. Medals were also addressed to several of the general officers, each being enclosed in a paper on which was written, The medal is good, for it bore six hours' fire. You know it was hot, for yourselves blew the coals. This observation was in allusion to the gallant conduct of the exiled prince at Mal Plaquet, which was rendered more intelligible by the following postscript. You know it was well tried on the 11th of September, 1709. Marlborough winked at all these petty treasons, apparently not displeased at seeing the son of his old master making the most of his proximity to the British army. Mary Beatrice, in reply to a communication which Marlborough made to her through his nephew, Berwick, confiding to her his intention of resigning his places under Queen Anne, wrote a very remarkable letter to him, which Marshal Villers himself enclosed in one of his own military notes to the British commander, written in all probability, merely to furnish an excuse for sending a trumpet to the hostile camp for the purpose of delivering it to his double-dealing grace, to whom it was addressed under the name of Gurney, one of the numerous aliases by which he is designated in the Jacobite correspondence. Her Majesty speaks of her son also by the sobriquet of Mr. Matthews. She informs Marlborough that what he wrote to his nephew on the 13th of the last month 
june 1710 was of such great importance to her son as well as to himself that she thinks herself obliged to answer it with her own hand and then continues in these words i shall tell you in the first place that as i was glad to find you still continue in your good resolutions towards mr matthews her son i was surprised on the other hand to see you had a design of quitting everything as soon as the peace was concluded for i find that to be the only means of rendering you useless to your friends and your retreat may prove dangerous to yourself you are too large a mark and too much exposed for malice to miss and your enemies will never believe themselves in safety till they have ruined you there is something very amusing in the pointed manner in which the widow of james the second endeavours to persuade her correspondent that not only his revenge but his self-interest ought to bind him to the cause of her son she lets him see plainly that she understands his game is a difficult one no barrister could have argued the case with greater ingenuity than she does in her quiet ladylike logic she says but as you are lost if you quit your employments i see likewise on the other hand that it will be difficult for you to keep yourself in office as things are now situated so that your interest itself now declares for your honour you cannot be in safety without discharging your duty and the time is precious to you as well as to us in the next paragraph the royal writer replies with equal dignity and diplomacy to some clause in marlborough's letter relating to mrs masham the successful rival who had supplanted his duchess in his sovereign's regard the advice you give us in sending us to the new favourite is very obliging but what can we hope from a stranger who has no obligation to us whereas we have all the reasons in the world to depend upon you since we have now but the same interest to manage and you have the power to put mr matthews her son in a condition to protect you lay aside then i beseech you your resolution of retiring take courage and without losing more time send us a person in whom you can have an entire confidence or if you have not such a man with you allow us to send you one whom we may trust in order to concert matters for our common interest which can never be properly done by letters we shall know by your speedy and positive answer to this letter what judgment we can form of our affairs matters hung on a perilous balance for the protestant succession when a correspondence of which this letter is a sample was going on between the mother of the chevalier de st george and the commander of the british army of which the said chevalier himself was within a morning's ride perhaps if the duchess of marlborough with her vindictive passions and governing energies had been in the camp of the allies the game that was played by marlborough in 1688 at salisbury might have been counteracted by a more astounding change of colors on the banks of the scarp in seventeen ten ninety thousand a year was however too much to be hazarded by a man whose great object in life was to acquire wealth and having acquired to keep it he took the wiser part that of trimming in readiness to sail with any wind that might spring up but waiting to see in which direction the tide of fortune would flow it is to be observed withal that mary beatrice neither makes professions in her letter nor holds out any prospect of reward i must not finish my letter she says in conclusion without thanking you for promising to assist me in my suit at the treaty of peace meaning the payment of her jointure and arrears for which marlborough had always been an advocate under the rose for he took good care not to commit himself by a public avowal of his sentiments on that head my cause continues the royal widow meekly is so just that i have all reason to hope i shall gain it at least i flatter myself that mr matthew's sister that is her stepdaughter queen anne is of too good a disposition to oppose it the pretense made by anne or her ministers for withholding the provision guaranteed by parliament for her father's widow that the fund voted to king william for that purpose had been applied since his death to other uses could scarcely be regarded as a legal excuse especially since the death of the other queen dowager catherine of braganza had placed her appanage and income at the disposal of the crown and this mary beatrice in her bitter penury 
would gladly have accepted in lieu of her own. Marlborough's correspondence is thus alluded to by the Chevalier de St. George, in one of his droll letters to the Earl of Middleton, dated Aris, July 25th, 1710. I shall not write to the Queen today, having nothing to say to her more than what is done. Present my duty to her. I have at last quite done with physic, and I hope with my ague, and that with only ten doses of quinquina, but I shall still keep possession of my gatehouse till the army removes, which must be soon. Our Hector, that is Villers, doth talk of fighting in his chariot, but I don't believe him, especially now that the conferences of peace are certainly renewed. You will have seen before this Gurney's, that is Marlborough's, letter to Daniel, that is Berwick, and another to Hector, in which Foliette's, that is Queen Mary Beatrice's children, himself and the princess his sister, are mentioned. I find Hector very willing to do anything in his power for them. The rest of the letter is very lively and amusing, but chiefly relating to a masked ball at which he had been present. In his next, he says, I was surprised to find by my sister's letter of the 30th that the queen had been ill at Marley, but am mightily glad it is so well over. Present her my duty. Mary Beatrice and her daughter wrote very frequently to the Chevalier de St. George during his absence with the army. Their letters, if preserved, would be of no common interest, endearing and confidential as the style of both these royal ladies was, considering, too, the romantic position occupied by the prince. As for him, he was just two and twenty, and writes with all the gaiety of his uncle, Charles the Second, at the same age. I gave the Mariscal, he says, this day the queen's packet, containing her letter to Marlborough, which I reckon gone by this time. Though Follette has said nothing of her children, yet Hector has again writ about them. I could not put off his writing about them till I heard from you, because he had now no other pretense, as I thought he had. Pray send me back Gurney's, that is Marlborough's, letter to him, that is Villers, for he wants the name of the colonel that is in it. Mary Beatrice, meantime, to spare herself the painful attempt at keeping up the shadowy imitation of a royal court, had withdrawn with her daughter, the Princess Louisa, to her apartments in the convent of Chalot, where they lived in the deepest retirement. Her Majesty occasionally paid flying visits to Saint-Germain for the purpose of holding councils and transacting business, but her ministers generally came to wait on her at the convent. The manner in which the royal widow passed her time when on a visit to the convent of Chalot is thus detailed by one of the ecclesiastics attached to that foundation. At eight o'clock she rises, having previously read the epistle and gospel for the day after the morrow, with great attention, and after that some of the circular letters of the convent containing the records of departed sisters of the order of distinguished piety. She possesses, continues our author, a perfect knowledge of the blessed scriptures, as well as the writings of our holy founder, so that she is able to cite the finest passages on occasion, which she always does so much to the purpose, that one knows not which to admire most, the eloquence of her words, or the aptness of her wit. She knows Latin, French, Italian, and English, and will talk consecutively in each of these languages without mixing them, or making the slightest mistake. But that which is the most worthy of observation in this princess is, the admirable charity and moderation with which she speaks of every one. Of her enemies, she would rather not speak, following the precept of our holy founder, that when nothing good can be said, it is best to say nothing. She has never used one word of complaint or invective of any of them. Neither has she betrayed impatience of their prosperity or joy at their sufferings. She said little of them and recommended those about her to imitate her example, Yet she assured us that she had no difficulty in forgiving them, but rather pleasure. If she heard either good or evil news, she recognized the hand of God in both alike, often repeating the words of the holy psalmist. I was silent and opened not my mouth, for it is thou, Lord, that hast done it. From the same authority we learn that on leaving her chamber, the queen always entered her oratory, where she spent an hour in her private devotions, 
she afterwards attended the public services of the church then returned to dress for the day she either dined in her own chamber or in the refectory with the community where she seated herself in the midst of the sisters near the abbess her ladies occupied a table by themselves she was always served by two of the nuns at ten o'clock one of the sisters read to her for half an hour from the imitation of jesus christ by thomas a kempis or some good book on the love of god she observed all the regulations of the convent when with the community and read listened meditated or worked with them as if she had belonged to the order if there were any sick persons in the infirmary she always visited them in the course of the day during her retreats at chalot she received visits from the dauphin dauphiness and almost all of the princesses of the blood she once assisted at the profession of a novice whom she led by the hand to the altar to receive the veil and bestowed upon her her own name marie beatrice the reverence modesty and profound silence which she observed at church was very edifying if they brought to her letters from her son she never opened them in that holy place or withdrew till the service was concluded when she retired into the sacristy and read them there as she had formerly done with regard to those from the king her late royal husband motives of economy had doubtless as much to do with these retreats of the exiled queen to the convent of chalot as devotion she could live with the princess her daughter and their ladies at a very trifling expense in a place where simplicity of dress and abstentiousness of diet instead of incurring sarcastic observations were regarded as virtues the self-denying habits practised by mary beatrice while an inmate of this convent neither resulted from superstition nor parsimony but from a conscientious reluctance to expend more than was absolutely necessary upon herself in a time of general suffering and scarcity one day when she was indisposed and dining in her own apartment at chalot the two nuns who waited upon her observed that she was vexed at something and spoke angrily to lady strickland the keeper of her privy purse whose office it was to superintend the purveyances for the queen's private table as her majesty spoke in english the nuns did not understand what it was that had displeased her but in the evening she said that she was sorry she had spoken so sharply to lady strickland who had served her faithfully for nearly thirty years they then took the liberty of inquiring what that lady had done to annoy her majesty she thought said the queen that as i was not well i should like some young partridges for my dinner but they are very dear at this time and i confess i was angry that such costly dainties should be procured for me when so many faithful followers are in want of bread at st germain it is true continued her majesty that all the emigrants are not persons who have lost their fortunes for our sakes too many who apply to me for relief are ruined spendthrifts gamblers and people of dissipated lives who have never cared for the king or me but came over to be maintained in idleness out of our pittance to the loss and discredit of more honourable men those sort of people she said were more importunate for relief than any other and had caused her great annoyance by their irregularities for she was somehow considered responsible for the misdemeanors of every member of the english emigration the keepers of the royal forest and preserves of st germain en laye once made a formal complaint to our unfortunate queen that her purveyors had purchased poached game belonging to his most christian majesty for her table mary beatrice was indignant at the charge and protested that it was incredible they assured her in reply that they could bring ample proofs of the allegation having traced the game into the chateau then retorted her majesty with some warmth it must have been poached by frenchmen for i am sure the english are too honourable and honest to do anything of the kind and turning to the vicar of st germain who was present she asked him if he thought they were capable of such malpractices as poaching alas madam exclaimed the old ecclesiastic it is the besetting sin of your people i verily believe that if i were dressed in a hare skin they would poach me the queen then gave orders that for the time to come no game should be purchased for her table or even brought into the chateau unless accompanied by a satisfactory account of whence it came 
lest she should be in any way implicated in the evil deeds of her followers doubtless the well-stocked preserves of his french majesty were somewhat the worse for the vicinity of fox-hunting jacobite squires and other starving members of the british colony at saint germain who had been accustomed to sylvan sports and had no other means of subsistence than practising their woodcraft illegally on their royal neighbours hares and pheasants mary beatrice was the more annoyed at these trespasses because it appeared an ungrateful return for the kindness and hospitality that had been accorded to herself her family and followers by louis the fourteenth who had allowed the use of his dogs and the privilege of the chase to her late consort and her son while at chalot the queen and her daughter were invited to the marriage of the dauphin's third son the duc de berry with mademoiselle d'orlan but they were both at that time so depressed in spirits by the sufferings of their faithful friends at saint germain and the failure of all present hope for the restoration of the house of stuart that they were reluctant to sadden the nuptial rite by their appearance the king of france knowing how unhappy they were excused them from assisting at the ceremonial but the court ladies were ordered to be in grand costume for their state visit of congratulation at marley the following evening when they arrived the princes and princesses and great nobles were disposed at different card tables and according to the etiquette of that time the queen and princess made their visits of congratulation at each of them they then returned to their calm abode at chalot without participation in the diversions of the court the chevalier de st george returned from the army at the end of the campaign ill and out of spirits he came to see his mother and sister at chalot by whom he was tenderly welcomed all three assisted at the commemorative services of their church on the sixteenth of september the anniversary of james the second's death the next day the chevalier escorted his sister the princess louisa back to saint germain but mary beatrice who always passed several days at that mournful season in fasting prayer and absolute retirement remained at the convent for that purpose she was also suffering from indisposition it appears from an observation in the following affectionate billet which the princess louisa wrote to her beloved parent before she went to bed madam i cannot refrain from writing to your majesty this evening not being able to wait till to-morrow as the groom does not go till after dinner i am here only in person for my heart and soul are still at chalot at your feet too happy if i could flatter myself that your majesty has thought one moment this evening of your poor daughter who can think of nothing but you we arrived here just as it was striking nine the king thank god is very little fatigued and has eaten a good supper you will have the goodness to pardon this sad scrawl but having only just arrived my writing-table is in great disorder i hope this will find your majesty much better than we left you after a good night's rest i am with more respect than ever your majesty's most humble and obedient daughter and servant louise marie at saint germain this seventeenth of september in the evening most precious of course must this unaffected tribute of filial devotion have been to her to whom it was addressed the faded ink and half obliterated characters of the crumpled and almost illegibly scribbled letter which was too soon to become a relic of the young warm-hearted writer testify how often it had been bathed in a mother's tears mary beatrice made her daughter very happy by writing to her by her son's physician dr wood and her royal highness responds with all the ardour of a devoted lover in the following pleasant letter madam mr wood gave me yesterday the letter your majesty has done me the honour of writing to me i receive it with inexpressible joy for nothing can equal the pleasure i feel in hearing from you when i have the misfortune to be absent from you i am delighted that you are improved in health and i hope you will be sufficiently recovered to-morrow to undertake the journey with safety i cannot tell you how impatient i am to kiss your majesty's hand and to tell you by word of mouth that i can see nothing nor attend to anything when i am away from you the last few days i have passed here have been weary for i care for nothing without you yesterday and to-day have seemed to me like two ages yesterday i had not even the king my brother for you know he was the whole day at versailles i can do nothing but pace up and down the balcony 
and, I am sorry to say, only went out to the Recollet. Meaning that she attended one of the short services in the Franciscan convent, her royal highness, however, goes on to confess to her absent mamma that she provided herself with better amusement in the sequel, for she says, In the evening, finding a good many of the young people had assembled themselves together below, I sent in quest of a violin, and we danced country dances till the king returned, which was not till supper time. I could write till tomorrow without being able to express half the veneration and respect that I owe to your majesty, and if I might presume to add, the tenderness I cherish for you, if you will permit that term to the daughter of the best of mothers, and who will venture to add that her inclination, even more than her duty, compels her to respect and honor your majesty more than it is possible either to imagine or express, and which her heart alone can feel. Mary Beatrice returned to Saint-Germain towards the end of September, and spent the winter there with her children, she and her son held their separate little courts under the same roof, he as king, and she as queen mother of England, with all the ceremonials of royalty. Their poverty would have exposed them to the sarcasms of the French courtiers and wits, if compassion for their misfortunes, and admiration for the dignity with which the fallen queen had supported all her trials, had not invested her with a romantic interest in the eyes of a chivalric nation. From the monarch on the throne to the humblest of his subjects, all regarded her as an object of reverential sympathy. On the death of the Dauphin in April 1711, Louis Fourteenth sent his grand chamberlain, the Duc de Bouillon, to announce his loss to Mary Beatrice and her son. This was done with the same ceremony as if they had been in reality, what he thought it proper to style them, the King and Queen Mother of Great Britain. Mary Beatrice paid Louis a private visit of sympathy at Marley, the day his son was interred. Her daughter, the Princess Louisa, accompanied her, but it was observed that Her Majesty left her in the coach, for the Dauphin had died of the smallpox, and she feared to expose her darling to the risk of the infection by allowing her to enter the palace. She excused the absence of her son for the same reason." State visits of condolence were afterwards paid by her and her son, in due form to every member of the royal family. These were returned, on the 21st of April, by the French princes and princesses in a body, greatly resembling a funeral procession, for the ladies wore mourning hoods and the gentlemen muffling cloaks. Their first visit was paid to the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, where the respect demanded by him as titular king of England forbade the mourners to be seated, Therefore, after a few solemn compliments had been exchanged, they were ushered into the presence chamber of Queen Mary Beatrice, who was, with all her ladies, in deep mourning, to receive them. Six fautils were placed for the accommodation of the privileged, namely, herself, her son, the new Dauphin and Dauphiness, the Duke and Duchess of Berry. The latter, as the wife of a grandson of France, took precedence of her parents, the Duke and Duchess of Orléans who were only allowed folding chairs. When the party were seated, Mary Beatrice apologized for not being herself in Monte, that is to say, dressed in a mourning hood to receive them, but this, as she always wore the veil and garb of a widow, was incompatible with her own costume, in which she could not make any alteration, even out of respect to the late Dauphin. When this was repeated to Louis the Fourteenth he expressed himself perfectly satisfied with the excuse made by the widowed queen, and kindly said, He would not have wished her to do violence to her feelings by altering her costume to assume a mourning hood, even if it had been for himself instead of his son, the Dauphin. After the princes and princesses had conversed with Mary Beatrice a few minutes, they all rose and signified their wish of returning the visits of Her Royal Highness, the Princess of England as the youngest daughter of James II was always styled in France, but the queen prevented them by sending for her. She was satisfied that they were prepared to pay her daughter that punctilious mark of respect. The princess had absented herself because it was proper that her visits of condolence should be separately acknowledged, and also because etiquette forbade her to sit in her mother's presence on this occasion, and if she stood, the French princesses must also, for as a king's daughter, she took precedence of them all. A Protestant consort, 
a crowned head withal and one who possessed this powerful recommendation to her favour that he had expressed a romantic inclination to espouse her brother's cause was about this time proposed for the princess louisa no other than that erratic northern luminary charles the twelfth of sweden the maternal tenderness of mary beatrice in all probability revolted from sacrificing her lovely and accomplished daughter to so formidable a spouse in the summer of seventeen eleven the chevalier de st george made an incognito tour through many of the provinces of france and mary beatrice to avoid the expense of keeping up her melancholy imitation of queenly state at st germain in his absence withdrew with the princess her daughter to her favorite retreat at chalot it was within the walls of that convent alone that the hapless widow of james the second enjoyed a temporary repose from the cares and quarrels that harassed her in her exiled court a court made up of persons of ruined fortunes with hearts breaking and tempers soured by disappointment who instead of being united in that powerful bond of friendship which a friendship in suffering for the same cause should have knit were engaged in constant altercations and struggles for preeminence who can wonder that the fallen queen preferred the peaceful cell of a recluse from the world and its turmoils to the empty parade of royalty which she was condemned to support in her borrowed palace at st germain where every chamber had its separate intrigues and whenever she went abroad for air and exercise or for the purpose of attending the service of her church she was beset with importunities of starving petitioners who with cries and moving words or the more touching appeal of pale cheeks and tearful eyes besought her for that relief which she had no means of bestowing even her youthful daughter who by nature was inclined to enjoy the amusements of the court and the sylvan pastimes of the forest or the pleasant banks of the seine with her beloved companions and to look on chalot as a very lugubrious place now regarded it as a refuge from the varied miseries with which she saw her royal mother oppressed at st germain they arrived at the convent on the twentieth of july and were received by the abbess and the nuns with the usual marks of respect the following day the queen had the satisfaction of reading a letter written by the bishop of strasbourg to the abbe roguet full of recommendations of her son whom he had seen during his travels mary beatrice was so much delighted with the tenor of this letter and the quaint simplicity of the style that she requested it might be put in the drawer of the archives of james the second to be kept with other contemporary records which she carefully preserved of her royal consort and their son the next day she received a letter from the chevalier himself giving an account of some of the most interesting objects he had noticed during his travels among other things he mentioned having visited the hospital and the silk factories of lyon in the latter he had been struck with surprise at seeing two thousand reels worked by one wheel an observation from which we learn that france was much in advance of england in machinery in the beginning of the last century and that looms worked by water instead of hands performed on a small scale at lyon some of the wonders which we see achieved by the power of steam at manchester and glasgow in the present age like all the royal stuarts the son of james the second took a lively interest in the arts of peaceful life and the progress of domestic civilization his letters to his mother during this tour abounded with remarks on these subjects mary beatrice expressed great satisfaction to her friends at chalot at the good sense which led him to acquaint himself with matters likely to conduce to the happiness of his people in case it should be the will of god to call him to the throne of england the nuns were much more charmed at the prince telling his royal mother that he had been desirous of purchasing for the princess his sister one of the most beautiful specimens of the silks made at lyon for a petticoat but they had not shown him any that he thought good enough for her use he had however wisely summoned female taste to his aid by begging madame lay intendant to undertake the choice for him and she had written to him that she believed that she had succeeded better than his majesty so he hoped his sister would have a petticoat of the most rich and splendid brocade that could be procured to wear in the winter when she left off her mourning the genuine affection for his sister which is indicated by this little trait may well atone for its simplicity 
Mary Beatrice, having no allowance of any kind for her daughter, was precluded by her poverty from indulging her maternal pride by decking her in rich array. The Chevalier de St. George, who had enough of the Frenchman in him to attach some importance to the subject of dress, was perhaps aware of deficiencies in the wardrobe of his fair sister, when he took so much pains to procure for her a dress, calculated to give her, on her reappearance at the French court, the eclat of a splendid toilette to set off her natural charms. The pure, unselfish affection, which united the disinherited son and daughter of James the Second and his queen, in exile and poverty, affords a remarkable contrast to the political jealousies and angry passions which inflamed the hearts of their triumphant sisters, Mary and Anne, against each other, when they had succeeded in driving their father from his throne and supplanting their brother in the regal succession. Mary Beatrice always trembled, lest her daughter, the Princess Louisa, should be induced to listen to the flattering insinuations of persons in her court, who scrupled not to say that nature had fitted her better for a throne than her brother. The Duke of Perth, when governor to the prince, always entreated him to imitate the gracious and popular manners of his sister, telling him that he ought to make his study to acquire that which was with her free and spontaneous. End of section 5《セクション6 of the Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 10, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary Beatrice of Modena, Chapter 10, Part 3. The princess received a very amusing letter from her brother on the 3rd of August, informing her that he had been to Valence and afterwards paid an incognito visit to the army under the command of the Duke of Berwick in Dauphiny. The queen permitted her daughter to gratify the sisters of Chalot by reading this letter aloud to them at the evening recreation, at which they were delighted. The fond mother herself, although she had read it previously, could not refrain from commending the witty and agreeable style in which it was written. She told the nuns, that her son would certainly render himself greatly loved and esteemed wherever he went, adding, that she had been surprised at what he had written to Lord Middleton about two deserters from the regiment of Berwick, who had gone over to the enemy's army, and surrendered themselves to General Rayon, a German, who commanded the army of the Duke of Savoy. When they arrived, General Rayon was with the bailey of a French village, who had come to treat about a contribution. Being informed of the circumstance, he ordered them to be brought before him, but instead of giving them the flattering reception they doubtless anticipated, and asking for intelligence of their camp, he said to them very sternly, You are very base to desert your army, and what renders your conduct still more infamous is your doing so at the time the King of England, your master, is there. I was surprised, continued the Queen to learn that a German had so much politeness as to venture to give my son the name of king. It seems, madam, replied the nuns, as if he had a secret presentiment that the time decreed by Providence is approaching for a happy revolution. The boldness of Mr. Dundas makes us think so, for otherwise, according to the justice, or rather, we ought to say, the injustice of England, he would have been punished for his speech." No, replied the queen. They cannot do him any harm, and his speech has been printed in England, and dispersed throughout Scotland, and everywhere else. It is amusing to find the cloistered sisters of Chalot talking of the speech of an Edinburgh advocate, but not surprising, since the widowed queen of James the Second, who still continued to be the central point to which all the Jacobite correspondents tended, held her privy councils at this time within their grate, and constantly discussed with her ladies, before the favorite members of the community, who had the honor of waiting on her, the signs of the times, and the hopes or fears which agitated her for the cause of her son. If one of the state ministers of France visited Mary Beatrice, and made any particular communication to her, and she prudently kept her silence on the subject, its nature was divined by her looks, or the effect it produced on her spirits, and in due time the mystery unraveled itself. 
in regard however to the speech of mr dundas of arniston there was no necessity for secrecy for the sturdy scot had fearlessly perilled life and limb to give publicity to his treasonable affection for the representative of the exiled house of stuart and his audacity was regarded as a favorable indication of public feeling towards the cause of that unfortunate prince mary beatrice had sent some silver medals of her son to several of her old friends in england among the rest to that errant jacobite lady the duchess of gordon these medals bore the profile of the chevalier de st george with a superscription endowing him with the title of james the third king of great britain ireland and france on the reverse was the map of the britannic empire with a legend implying that these dominions would be restored to him as their rightful king the duchess of gordon to try how the lawyers of scotland stood affected towards a counter-revolution sent one of these medals as a present to the dean of the faculty of advocates it was received by that learned body with enthusiasm and robert dundas of arniston being deputed to convey their acknowledgments to her grace told her that the faculty of advocates thanked her for presenting them with the medal of their sovereign lord the king and hoped her grace would soon have the opportunity of sending them a medal to commemorate the restoration of the king and royal family and the finishing of rebellion usurpation treason and whiggery such was the weakness of queen anne's regnal power in scotland at that time that no notice was taken of this seditious declaration till the hanoverian envoy complained of it to the queen in consequence of his representation orders were given to sir david dalrymple the lord advocate to proceed against dundas but the prosecution was presently dropped and dundas not only printed his speech but defended it in a still more treasonable pamphlet which in due time found its way not only to saint germain but to the convent of chalot and was highly relished by the nuns once when the prospects of the restoration of the exiled stuarts to the throne of britain was discussed the princess louisa said for my part i am best pleased to remain in ignorance of the future it is one of the greatest mercies of god that it is hidden from our sight observed the queen when i first passed over to france if any one had told me i should have to remain there two years i should have been in despair and i have now been here upwards of two and twenty god who is the ruler of our destinies having so decreed it seems to me madam says the princess that persons who like myself have been born in adversity are less to be pitied than those who have suffered a reverse never having tasted good fortune they are not so sensible of their calamities besides they always have hope to encourage them were it not continued she for that it would be very melancholy to pass the fair season of youth in a life so full of sadness sister catherine angelique told her royal highness that her grandmother queen henrietta maria was accustomed to thank god that he had made her a queen and an unfortunate queen thus madam continued the old religious it is in reality a great blessing that your royal highness has not found yourself in a position to enjoy the pleasures and distinctions pertaining to your rank and age truly said the queen turning to her daughter i regard it in the same light and have often been thankful both on your account and that of my son that you are at present even as you are the inclination you both have for pleasure might otherwise have carried you beyond due bounds such was the lessons of christian philosophy with which the royal mother endeavoured to reconcile her children to the dispensations of divine providence which had placed them in a situation so humiliating to their pride and that ambition which is generally a propensity inseparable from royal blood catherine angelique told the queen and princess that their royal foundress as she called queen henrietta maria in the midst of her misfortunes was glad to be a queen and that she would say sometimes it is always a fine title and i should not like to relinquish it for my part observed mary beatrice i can truly say that i never found any happiness in that envy title 
i never wished to be queen of england for i loved king charles very sincerely and was so greatly afflicted at his death that i dared not show how much i grieved for his loss lest i should have been accused of grimace it was during one of these conversations that the name of the late queen dowager catherine of berganza being brought up the princess louisa asked her mother if there were any grounds for the reported partiality of that queen for the earl of feversham no replied mary beatrice not the slightest it is very strange observed the princess thoughtfully how such invidious rumours get into circulation but continued she the prudence of your majesty's conduct has been such as to defy scandal itself which has never dared to attack your name you are too young to know anything about such matters my child replied the queen gravely pardon me madam rejoined the princess these things are always known for as one of the ancient poets has said of princes their faults write themselves in the public records of their times mary beatrice enjoyed unwonted repose of mind and body at this season she had cast all her cares on a higher power and passed her time quietly in the cloister in the society of her lovely and beloved daughter in whose tender affection she tasted as much happiness as her widowed heart was capable of experiencing the lively letters of her son who was an excellent correspondent cheered the royal recluse and furnished conversation for the evening hours of recreation when the nuns were permitted to relax their thoughts from devotional subjects and join in conversation or listen to that of their illustrious inmates it was then that mary beatrice would occasionally relieve her overburdened mind by talking of the events of her past life and deeply it is to be regretted that only disjointed fragments remain of the diary kept by the nun who employed herself in recording the reminiscences of the fallen queen occasionally the holy sister enters into particulars more minute than interesting to the general reader such as the days on which her majesty took medicine and very often the drugs of which it was compounded are enumerated successive doses of quinquina with white powder of whalebone and the waters of st remy appear to have been a standing prescription with her by the skill of her french surgeon beaulieu the progress of the cancer had been arrested so completely that it was regarded at this period as almost cured whether this were attributable to her perseverance in the above prescription or to the diversion caused in her favor by a painful abscess which fixed on one of her fingers at this time may be a question perhaps among persons skilled in the healing arts mary beatrice suffered severely with her finger and her sufferings were aggravated by the tedious proceedings of beaulieu who had become paralytic in her service and though his right hand had lost its cunning was so tenacious of his office that he would not suffer any one to touch his royal mistress but himself her ladies and even the nuns were annoyed at seeing his ineffectual attempts at performing operations with a trembling uncertain hand and said he ought not to be allowed to put the queen to so much unnecessary pain but mary beatrice who valued the infirm old man for his faithful services in past years bore everything with unruffled patience it was a principle of conscience with her never to wound the feelings of those about her if she could avoid it she was very careful not to distinguish one of her ladies more than another by any particular mark of attention for all were faithfully attached to her how much milder her temper was considered by persons of low degree than that of one of her ladies may be inferred from the following whimsical incident one day at dinner she complained that the glass they had brought her was too large and heavy for her hand and as for that out of which she was accustomed to drink which she said was both lighter and prettier the young domestic probationer who washed the glass and china belonging to her majesty's table hearing this ran in a great fright to the economé and confessed that she had had the misfortune to break the queen of england's drinking glass i don't mind the queen knowing that it was i who did it said she but i hope she will not tell lady strickland mary beatrice was much amused when this was repeated to her and laughed heartily at the simplicity of the poor girl the same damsel whose name was claire antoinette constantin being about to take the veil as a humble sister of that convent 
expressed an earnest desire the night before her profession to make a personal confession to the queen of england of an injury she had been the cause of suffering for that she could not be happy to enter upon her new vocation till she had received her pardon the unfortunate widow of james the second having had painful experience of the deceitfulness and ingratitude of human nature doubtless expected to listen to an acknowledgment of treacherous practices with regard to her private papers or letters that had been productive of mischief to her interests and the cause of her son when she consented to see the penitent offender who throwing herself at her feet with great solemnity confessed a peccadillo that inclined her majesty to smile she spake the girl kindly and having talked with her about her profession sent her away with a light heart mary beatrice met one of the nuns in the gallery presently after to whom she said laughing at the same time do you know that sister claire antoinette has just been asking my pardon for causing me the afflicting loss of a little silver cup and two coffee spoons it was derogatory to your majesty for her to say that you could feel any trouble for such a loss replied the nun but she hardly knew what she said when she found herself in the presence of royalty the queen condescended to assist in the profession of the humble claire antoinette the nineteenth of september being a very rainy day the queen did not expect any visitors and was surprised at seeing one of the dauphiness's pages riding into the court who came to announce that her royal highness intended to pay her majesty and the princess of england a visit after dinner she arrived after her retinue at four o'clock accompanied by her sister-in-law the duchess of berry adelaide of savoy duchess of burgundy was then dauphiness the abbess received them at the grate and the princess louisa came to meet them in the cloister leading to the queen's suite of apartments as soon as the dauphiness saw her she signified to her train-bearer that she did not require him to attend her farther and it seems she disencumbered herself of her train at the same time for our circumstantial chronicler says she went to the princess of england in carpo which means in her bodice and petticoat without the royal mantle of state which was made so as to be thrown off or assumed at pleasure the princess louisa conducted the royal guests into the presence of the queen who being indisposed was on her bed she greeted the kind adelaide in these words what has induced you my dear dauphiness to come and dig out the poor old woman in her cell the dauphiness made an affectionate reply i do not know exactly what she said continues our shiloh chronicler but the queen told me that she conversed with her apart very tenderly while the princess entertained the duchess of berry after some time her majesty told her daughter to show the duchess de berry the house and the dauphiness remained alone with her when the princess and the duchess returned the dauphiness begged the queen to allow the princess to take a walk with her to which a willing assent being given they went out together the heavy rain having rendered the gardens unfit for the promenade the royal friends returned into the house and the princess took the dauphiness to see the work with which she seemed very pleased they afterwards rejoined mary beatrice in her apartment as it was saturday afternoon and past four o'clock continues our authority her majesty did not offer a collation to the dauphiness but only fish and bread with a flask of muscat the dauphiness the same day gave orders to the duchess de lauzun that there should be a party made for the chase in the bois de boulogne on purpose for the princess of england and a supper prepared for her at the house of the duchess at passy there were two great obstacles in the way of the princess enjoying this pleasure which the poverty of her royal mother apparently rendered insurmountable she had neither a horse that she could safely mount nor a riding dress fit for her to appear in before the gay and gallant court of france bitter mortifications those for a youthful beauty and she the daughter of a king the amiable dauphiness however who had either been informed of these deficiencies or guessed the state of her unfortunate cousins stud and wardrobe appointments sent one of her equerries on the morning of the important day with a beautiful well-trained palfrey from her own stable for the princess's use together with a splendid riding dress she wrote at the same time to the queen entreating her to permit the princess to join the hunting party on horseback 
for she had sent one of the horses she had been herself accustomed to ride, adding, that she hoped her majesty would excuse the liberty she had ventured to take in presenting, also one of her own hunting dresses to her royal highness, the princess of England, the time being too short to allow of having a new one made on purpose. The pride of a vulgar mind might have been offended at this little circumstance, but Mary Beatrice, though her naturally lofty spirit had been rendered more painfully sensitive by her great reverse of fortune, fully appreciated the affectionate freedom of her royal kinswoman, and wrote to her with her own hand, in reply, that it would be very unkind to refuse what was so kindly meant and courteously offered, that she thanked her very sincerely, and assured her that she should have much joy in the pleasure that had been provided for her child. Meantime, the equerry having brought the horse into the garden, the princess Louisa mounted there, and took a few turns to try his paces, and although she had not been in the saddle for upwards of two years, she felt perfectly self-possessed and assured. The temptation of wending with the royal beauty to the gay green wood, and describing her dress and deportment on that one day, of princely disport with the Dauphiness and the gallant court of France, must be resisted, since it is not the life of Louisa Stuart, but of Mary Beatrice d'Este, which at present claims the attention of the reader. The princess and her governess, Lady Middleton, who accompanied her to the chase, returned to Chalot at a quarter after nine the same evening. On the Tuesday following, Mary Beatrice considered it proper to pay a visit to the King of France at Versailles, and to thank the Dauphiness for her attention to her daughter. It cost her to struggle to emerge from her present quiet abode, to present herself at court again, after so long an absence. She said several times, I am getting such an old woman, that I feel embarrassed myself on such occasions, and shall only be a restraint on others. She took her young bright Louisa with her to Versailles, to make all the round of state visits to the members of the royal family. Her majesty wore a black mantle and cap, but the princess was in full court costume. They returned to the convent at eight in the evening. Mary Beatrice wished to make a round of visits to the religious houses of Paris, and especially to the sisters of St. Antoine, but as the pestilence was raging in that city, she was deterred from the fear of exposing her daughter to the infection. She had promised the princess the pleasure of going to the Italian comedy at this time, and a day was fixed, but the evening before, Lady Middleton represented to the queen that it might be attended with danger to the princess, as Paris was so full of bad air, on which her majesty told her daughter, that although it gave her some pain to deprive her of so small a pleasure, she could not allow her to go. The princess had reckoned very much upon it, but said her majesty's kindness quite consoled her for her disappointment. Never was a mother more devotedly loved and honored than was Mary Beatrice by her sweet daughter, who had now become her companion and friend. One day, when she had allowed the princess to go incognito to Paris with Lady Middleton, to dine with Madame Ross, the married daughter of that lady, she could not help repeating many times during dinner. It must be owned that we miss my daughter very much. Mary Beatrice, notwithstanding her fears of exposing that precious one to the danger of entering the infected city, was persuaded to take her with her to the Church of the English Benedictines, when she went to pay her annual visit of sorrowful remembrance to the remains of her lamented lord, King James, which still remained unburied under a sable canopy, surmounted with the crown of England, in the Isle of Saint-Jacques, though ten years had passed since his death. To avoid attracting attention or the appearance of display, the royal widow and orphan daughter of that unfortunate prince went in a hired coach, attended only by two ladies, the Duchess of Perth and the Countess of Middleton, to pay this mournful duty and to offer up their prayers in the holy privacy of a grief too deep to brook the scrutiny of public curiosity. On one or two previous occasions, the coach of the exiled queen had been recognized and followed by crowds of persons of all degrees, who, in their eagerness to gaze on the royal heroine of this mournful romance of history, had greatly distressed and agitated her, even by the vehemence of their sympathy. 
the french being then not only an excitable but a venerative people full of compassion for the calamities of royalty popular superstition had invested the deceased king with the name of a saint and attributed to his perishable mortal remains the miraculous power of curing diseases his bier was visited by pilgrims from all parts of france and on this occasion his faithful widow and daughter shrouded in their mourning cloaks and veils passed unnoticed among the less interesting enthusiasts who came to offer up their vows and prayers in the isle of saint jacques some persons outside the church asked the coachman whom he had driven there the man not being at all aware of the quality of the party replied that he had brought two old gentlewomen one middle-aged and a young lady this unceremonious description beguiled the fallen queen of england of a smile perhaps from the very revulsion of feeling caused by its contrasts to the reverential and elaborate titles with which royal personages are accustomed to hear themselves named queen now only by courtesy deprived of pomp power and royal attributes mary beatrice had gained by her adversity better things than she had lost patience resignation and sufficient philosophy to regard the distinctions of this world and its vanities in their true light yet like all human creatures she had her imperfections that quaintly minute chronicler the nun of chalot records that she once saw her royal friend visibly discomposed for a very slight matter and that strange to say caused by an unwanted act of awkwardness on the part of her daughter the princess louisa who in drawing the soup to her at dinner spilt it on the tablecloth and all over the queen's napkin her majesty's color rose she looked angry but said nothing in the evening she said she felt so much irritated at the moment that she had with great difficulty restrained herself from giving vent to her annoyance in words she severely censured herself at the same time for allowing her temper to be ruffled by such a trifle mary beatrice bore a serious trial soon after with the equanimity of a heroine and the dignity of a queen on the day of saint ursula as she was about to enter the choir of the conventual church with her daughter to perform her devotions a letter was delivered to her from the duc de lazun informing her that the negotiations for a peace between england and france had commenced which must involve the repudiation of her son's title and cause by louis the fourteenth mary beatrice read the letter attentively through without betraying the slightest emotion then showed it to her daughter who wept passionately the queen turned into the isle of st joseph where finding one of the nuns whom she sometimes employed as her private secretary requested her to write in her name to the duc de lazun thanking him for the kind attention he had shown in apprising her of what she had not before heard and begging him to give her information of any further particulars that might come to his knowledge she then entered the church and attended the service without allowing any one to read in her countenance any confirmation of the ill news which the cheerful eyes of the princess showed that ominous letter had communicated an anxious interest was excited on the subject among the sisters of chalot who certainly were by no means devoid of the feminine attribute of curiosity at dinner mary beatrice showed no appearance of dejection and no one ventured to ask a question the next morning at the hour of relaxation seeing all the nuns near her she said she would impart to them something that was in the duke of lazun's letter namely that their king had said at his levee the english have offered me reasonable terms of peace and the choice of three cities for the treaty she said no more and the abbess of chalot taking up the word rejoined but madam what advantage will your majesty and the king your son find in this peace the queen instead of making a direct reply said peace is so great a blessing that it ought to be rejoiced at and we have such signal obligations to france that we cannot but wish for anything that is beneficial to it at supper she told the community the names of the plenipotentiaries on both sides she said that she had as soon as she was informed of these particulars written to her son to hasten his return because it would be desirable for her to see and consult with him on the steps proper to be taken for supporting his interests the chevalier de st georges was then at Grenoble, 
from whence he wrote a long amusing letter to his sister descriptive of the place and its history and of the principal towns and ports he had visited the princess read the letter aloud to the nuns in the presence of her royal mother who though she had read it before listened with lively interest to all the details mary beatrice gave a medal of her son to the abbess of chalot which says the recording sister of that community will be found among our archives together with a copy of the speech made by the seer dundas in scotland the princess louisa had given the duke de lazun one of these medals in the summer and he in return presented to her through one of his wife's relations sister louise del lorange a nun at that convent a miniature of the queen magnificently set with diamonds in a very pretty chagrin box the princess testified great joy at this present but the queen appeared thoughtful and sad at last she said i have been several times tempted to send it back i see i am still very proud for i cannot bear that any one should make presents to my daughter when she is not able to make a suitable return it is from the same principle of pride continues her majesty that i cannot consent to allow my portrait to be painted now one should not suffer oneself to be seen as old and ugly by those who might remember what one has been when young she was however induced to allow the princess to retain the gift which had been so kindly presented by her old and faithful friend de lazun at supper on the third of november some one told the queen that the marshal tallard had facetiously proposed to the ministers of queen anne that the prince whom they call the pretender should espouse their queen as the best method of reconciling their differences you are mistaken said mary beatrice it was a priest who made that proposal and i will tell you what he said at the recreation to-night all were impatient to hear the right version of the story and at the time appointed mary beatrice told them with some humour that a witty irish priest having been summoned before a bench of magistrates for not taking the oath of abjuration said to their worships would it not be best in order to end these disputes that your queen should marry the pretender to which all present exclaimed in a tone of horror why he is her brother if so rejoined the priest why am i required to take an oath against him the abbess of chalot asked the queen in confidence if the reports about the peace were correct and if so whether anything for the relief of her majesty were likely to be stipulated in the treaty mary beatrice replied that the peace was certain to take place and that she had some prospect of receiving her dower but it must be kept a profound secret because of the irish who would all be about her her great anxiety was to pay her debts of which by far the largest was what she owed to the convent of chalot it gave her much pain she said that she had not been in a condition to pay the annual rent namely three thousand livres for the apartments she hired there the arrears of which now amounted to a very large sum the abbess took the opportunity of reminding her indigent royal tenant of the state of outstanding accounts between her majesty and that house she said that in addition to the eighteen thousand livres her majesty had had the goodness to pay them she had given them a promissory note for forty two thousand more for the last fourteen years mary beatrice was so bewildered at the formidable sound in french figures of a sum which did not amount to two thousand pounds of english money that she could not remember having given such an engagement and begged the abbess to let her see it the abbess produced the paper out of the strong box and her majesty presently recollecting herself freely acknowledged and confirmed it the abbess in the evening called a council of the elders of the community on the subject and they agreed that they ought to thank her majesty for what she had done the very politeness of her creditors was painful to the sensitive feelings of the unfortunate queen she interrupted them with great emotion by saying that one of the greatest mortifications of her life was to have seen how many years she had been lodging with them for nothing and that they must attribute it to the unhappy state of her affairs and to the extremity of that necessity which has no law 
among all the sad records of the calamities of royalty there are few pictures more heart-rending than that of the widow of a king of great britain reduced to the humiliation of making such an avowal the money that should have been devoted to the payment of her rent at chalot had been extorted from her compassion by the miseries of the starving thousands by whom she was daily importuned for bread when at saint germain as long as the royal widow had a livret in her purse she could not resist the agonizing petitions of these unfortunates and when all was gone she fled to chalot literally for refuge she told the community that they might reckon on her good offices whenever they thought it might be in her power to be of service to them one of the nuns who waited on mary beatrice took the liberty of approaching her when they were alone and endeavoured to soothe her wounded spirit by assuring her that the abbess and sisters could never sufficiently acknowledge her goodness and her charity to their house and that the whole community were truly grateful for the blessing of having her among them for her example had inspired them with a new zeal for the performance of the duties of their religion adding that it gave their community great pain when the poverty of their house compelled them to mention anything that was due to them but they should all be most willing to await her majesty's convenience mary beatrice talked of changing her apartments for those lately occupied by mademoiselle de la motte which were only half the rent of hers but it was begged that she would retain her own the next day mary beatrice had the consolation of embracing her son who arrived at chalot on the fourth of november at nine in the morning having slept at chartres the preceding night he entered alone having hastened on before his retinue to greet his royal mother and sister they both manifested excessive joy at seeing him he dined with them in her majesty's apartment and the abbess waited on them at dinner the queen and princess both said several times that he greatly resembled his late uncle king charles the second this prince says the recording sister of chalot is very tall and well formed and very graceful he has a pleasant manner is very courteous and obliging and speaks french well after dinner permission was asked of the queen for the community to have the honour of coming in to see the king as they called her son her majesty assenting they entered and seated themselves on the ground and listened with great interest to the chevalier's conversation which consisted chiefly of his remarks on the various places he had visited during his late tour on which like other travellers he delighted to discourse to reverential listeners mary beatrice kindly sent for sister louise de l'orange one of the nuns who although she was then in her retreat was well pleased at being indulged with a peep at the royal visitor mary beatrice announced her intention of returning to saint germain with her son that evening and said she would not make any ado she paid however a farewell visit after vespers to the tribune where the heart of her beloved consort was enshrined and then returned to her own apartment and waited there while the princess took leave of the abbess and the community notwithstanding the joy of the princess at this reunion with her much beloved brother she was greatly moved at parting from the kind nuns and when she made her adieu to her particular friend sister marguerite henriette she burst into tears the queen herself was agitated she said several times that she could not understand two conflicting inclinations in her mind her desire to return with her son and her fear of quitting her home at chalot for the turmoils and difficulties that would beset her at saint germain at her departure she said a few gracious words of acknowledgment as she passed them to those nuns who had had the honour of waiting upon her her beloved friend francoise angelique priolo was in ill health and the following playful letter without date was probably written to her by mary beatrice soon after her return at saint germain although you have preferred my daughter to me in writing to her rather than to me about which i will not quarrel with you i must needs write two words to you to explain about the money that dempster brings you there are twenty-two louis and of which two hundred livres must be taken for the half year of the perpetual mass twenty-nine for the two bills that you have given to molza and the rest to purchase a goat whose milk will preserve and improve the health of my dear good mother they assure me that they have sent the money for the wood endorsed to the mother priolo 
Mary Beatrice came to see her sick friend at the convent of Chalot on the ninth of December, accompanied by the princess, her daughter, and returned the next day to Saint Germain. End of section six. Section seven of the Lives of the Queens of England, volume ten, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary Beatrice of Modena, Chapter 10, Part 4 The preliminary negotiations for the Peace of Utrecht filled the exiled court with anxiety and stirring excitement. The Duke of Marlborough renewed his secret correspondence with Mary Beatrice and her son, through the medium of his nephew, Berwick, and even committed himself so far as to confer personally with Tunstall, one of the emissaries of the Earl of Middleton. In the curiously mystified official report of these conferences, written by the latter to Middleton, Mary Beatrice is, as usual, mentioned under two different feigned names. Her dower is called her lawsuit, and Marlborough is styled the lawyer. I had two long conferences with him, writes Tunstall, about Mr. Bernard's lawsuit and Mr. Kelly, that is the pretender's, affairs, as to both, which he shows a good will, and gives, in appearance, sincere wishes. But how far he will be able to work effectually in the matter, I leave you to judge. First, as to Mr. Bernard's, that is the Queen's, deed, he says, it must be insisted upon in time, for he looks upon it as certain that an accommodation, or peace, will be made, and if he shall be found capable of helping or signing this deed, he assures Mr. Bernard, that is the Queen, of his best services, but he believes measures are taken in such a manner that he shall be excluded from having any hand in concluding matters at Ponsey, that is the peace. Tunstall goes on to state Marlborough's opinion that the payment of the jointure of the widowed Queen ought to be strenuously insisted upon. And the gaining that point of the deed, continues he, to be of great consequence, not only as to the making my lady Betty, that is Queen Mary Beatrice, easy as to her own circumstances, but very much conducing to the advancing of Mr. Anthony's, that is the Chevalier St. George's, interest, and this not so much again, as to the money itself, as to the grant of it, which cannot be refused, it being formerly conceded at Ponsey, that is the peace of Ryswick and only diverted by the unworthiness of him who then ruled the roast, meaning William the Third. On the subject of the jointure, Marlborough begged Tunstall to assure Mary Beatrice that if the payment were put to the vote of Parliament, it would find many supporters who would be glad of the opportunity of making their compliments to her, a bon gras, and giving some testimony of their good will and if she thought that he were himself in capacity to serve her in that matter, he would be glad of showing himself her humble servant. In the same conference, Marlborough begged that the prince would not listen to any proposal of taking refuge in the papal dominions, for if the queen consented to his doing that, it would be no better than ruining the cause of her son and murdering him outright. He recommended some Protestant state as a more popular asylum and declared, nay, solemnly swore, that the recall of the prince appeared to him as certain to take place. Neither oaths nor professions from that quarter appear to have had much weight at the court of Saint-Germain, if we may judge from the dry comments made by the Earl of Middleton to his political agent on this communication. As for your lawyer, he is gone, and before you meet again, we shall see clearer. He might have been great and good, but God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he can now only pretend to the humble merit of a postboy who brings good news, to which he has not contributed. The affairs of the widow and son of James the Second were far from being in the favorable position which the flattering courtship of the disgraced favorite of Queen Anne led their shallow minister to imagine. Middleton was not, however, the only person deceived in this matter, for the Dauphin paid a visit to Mary Beatrice and the Chevalier at Saint-Germain at this crisis, expressly to congratulate them on their prospects. Mary Beatrice placed great reliance on the friendship, always testified by that amiable prince and his consort, for her and her children, but the arm of flesh was not to profit them. 
the dauphiness was attacked with malignant purple fever on the sixth of february fatal symptoms appeared on the ninth on the eleventh her life was despaired of and they forced her distracted husband from her bedside to breathe the fresh air in the gardens at versailles mary beatrice ever fearless of infection for herself hastened to versailles but was not permitted to enter the chamber of her dying friend she sat with the king and madame de maintenon in the room adjoining to the chamber of death while the last sacraments of the church of rome were administered and remained there during all that sad night she was also present at the consultation of the physicians when they decided on bleeding the royal patient in the foot she saw as she afterwards emphatically observed that physicians understood nothing comparatively speaking of the life of man the issues of which depend on god the dauphiness expired on the eleventh of february the afflicted widower only survived her six days the inscrutable fiat which at one blow desolated the royal house of france and deprived a mighty empire a second time of its heir involved also the ultimate destruction of the hopes of the kindred family of stuart the fast waning sands of louis the fourteenth now sinking under the weight of years and afflictions were rudely shaken by this domestic calamity which was immediately followed by the death of the eldest son of the young pair leaving the majesty of france to be represented in less than three years by a feeble infant and its power to be exercised by the profligate and selfish regent orlan i have been deeply grieved writes mary beatrice for the deaths of the dauphin and our dear dauphiness after the king there are no other persons in france whose loss could have affected us in every way like this the death of the young dauphin has not failed to touch me also we must adore the judgments of god which are always just although inscrutable and submit ourselves to his will the portentous shadows with which these tragic events had darkened the political horizon of her son affected mary beatrice less than the awful lesson on the uncertainty of life and the vanity of earthly expectation which the sudden death of these illustrious persons snatched away in the flower of youth and high and glorious anticipation was calculated to impress the royal widow regarded their deaths as a warning to put her own house in order and in the self-same letter in which she mentions the threefold tragedy to her friend the abbess of chalot she says i pray you my dear mother to send me by the courier the packet that i left with you of my will and also the copies of all the papers written in my hand for monies paid or to pay and likewise what i have promised for my sister madame paula de douglas i would wish to put them all in order before the approach of death whom we see always comes when we think of him the least m endorsed the fifteenth of march seventeen twelve we have not sent the queen her will according to what she has ordained us in this letter but the copies of the papers written by her hand which remain in the box her majesty having done us the honor to consign them to us but not her will these papers were the vouchers which the queen had given to the abbess and community of chalot for the sums of money in which she stood indebted to them as before mentioned for the hire of the apartments she and the young princess her daughter and their ladies had occupied during their occasional residence in that convent for many years whether she came there much or little the apartments were always reserved for her use at an annual rent of three thousand francs this sum less than one hundred and thirty pounds a year the destitute widow of king james the second who had been a crowned and anointed queen consort of great britain had never been able to pay but had been reduced to the mortifying necessity of begging the community of chalot to accept such instalments as her narrowed finances and the uncertain payments of her french pension enabled her to offer with a written engagement to liquidate the debt either when she should receive the payment of her dower as queen of england or at the restoration of the house of stuart under these conditions the compassionate sisterhood of chalot had allowed their royal friend's debt to accumulate to fifty thousand francs up to the year seventeen twelve as specified in the following document having always intended to make arrangements for the good of the monastery of the visitation of saint marie de chalot 
because of the affection which I have for their holy order in general, and to this house in particular, in which I have been so many times received and well lodged, for nearly the four and twenty years that I have been in France, and wishing at present to execute this design better than it is possible for me to do in the circumstances under which I find myself at present. I declare that my intention on retiring into this monastery has always been to give three thousand livres a year for the hire of the apartments I have occupied here since the year 1689, till this present year, 1712, in all which time I have never paid them but 19,000 livres. It still remains for me to pay 50,000, which 50,000 I engage and promise to give to the said monastery of the visitation of Saint-Marie de Chalot on the establishment of the king my son in England. It is remarkable that the agitated hand of the poor exile, who had been queen of the realm, has written the word once familiar, Angelter, in this record of her poverty, an honest desire to provide for liquidation of her long arrears of rent to the convent of Chalot. She continues in these words, And not having the power to do this while living, I have charged the king my son in my testament, and engaged him to execute all these promises, which he will find written by my own hand, and that before one year be passed after his restoration. Alas, poor queen, poor prince, and luckless nuns, on what a shadowy foundation did these engagements rest? Yet at that time, when it was general opinion of Europe, that the childless sovereign of England, Anne, designed to make, as far as she could, reparation for the wrongs she had done her brother, by making arrangements for him to succeed at her demise, to the royal inheritance, in which she had supplanted him, few people would have despised a bond for a sum of money, however large, payable at such a day. I have left also, continues the queen, in my will, wherewithal to make a most beautiful restoration for the great altar of the church of the said monastery of Chalot, dedicated to the Holy Virgin, or a fine tabernacle, if they should like it better, and also I have left for a mausoleum to be made for the heart of the king, my lord and husband. And I engage and promise in the meantime to pay to the said monastery the sum of three thousand livres a year for the time to come, counting from the first of April, 1712. But if through the bad state of my affairs, I should not be able to pay the said annual sum for the future, or only to pay in part, I will reckon all that I fail in as a debt, which shall augment and add to the fifty thousand francs which I owe already, to be paid at the same time, which he, that is her son, will understand, for all the years that I may remain in France. Marie R. The presentiment that death was about to visit her own melancholy palace, which had haunted Mary Beatrice ever since she had wept with Louis the Fourteenth thrice, in a few brief days, over the stricken hopes of gay Versailles, was doomed to be too sadly realized, but not, as she had imagined, on herself. She, the weary pilgrim, who had travelled over nearly half a century of woe, and had carried in her mortal frame, for the last twelve years, the seeds of death, was spared to weep over the early grave of the youngest born and most precious of her children, her bright and beautiful Louisa. On Easter Wednesday, March 29th, Mary Beatrice visited Chalot with her daughter, who was then in blooming health. The nuns told their royal visitors a piteous tale of the damage their house had sustained by the dreadful storm of December 11th, two days after their last visit. Her majesty listened with great concern, regretted her inability to aid them as she could wish, but promised to do her best in representing their case to others. At four o'clock the following day, the Chevalier de St. George, who had been hunting in the Bois de Boulogne, came here, says our Chalot chronicler, in quest of the queen. He behaved with much courtesy to our mother, thanking her for the prayer she had made for him at all times, and for the care she had taken of the queen, his mother, and the consolation she had been to her. He appeared a little indisposed that day, but returned to Saint-Germain in the evening with the queen and the princess. Two days afterwards, he was attacked with the smallpox, to the inexpressible dismay of Mary Beatrice, who knew how fatal that dreadful malady had, in many instances, proved to the royal house of Stuart. 
the princess louisa was inconsolable at the idea of her brother's danger but felt not the slightest apprehension of infection for herself on the tenth of april the malady appeared visible on her while she was at her toilette the distress of the queen may be imagined the symptoms of the princess were at first favorable so that hopes were entertained that not only her life but even her beauty would be spared unfortunately the practice of bleeding in the foot was resorted to in her case and the effects were fatal the last and most interesting communication that ever took place between mary beatrice and her beloved daughter was recorded verbatim from the lips of the disconsolate mother by one of the nuns of chalot who has thus endorsed the paper containing the particulars the queen of england this twelfth of october was pleased herself to repeat to us the words which the princess her daughter said to her and they were written down in her majesty's chamber this evening six o'clock thus we see that six months elapsed ere mary beatrice could bring herself to speak of what passed in the holy privacy of that solemn hour when after the duties enjoined by their church for the sick had been performed she came to her dying child and asked her how she felt madam replied the princess you see before you the happiest person in the world i have just made my general confession and i have done my best to do it so that if they were to tell me that i should die now i should have nothing more to do i resign myself into the hands of god i ask not of him life but that his will may be accomplished on me my daughter replied the queen i do not think i can say as much i declare that i entreat of god to prolong your life that you may be able to serve him and to love him better than you have yet done if i desire to live it is for that alone responded the princess fervently but the tenderness of earthly affections came over the heavenward spirit and she added and because i think it might be of some comfort to you at five o'clock the next morning monday april eighteenth they told the queen that the princess was in her agony she would have risen to go to her but they prevented her by force the princess expired at nine at ten the heavy tidings were announced to her majesty by pere Gaylar, her departed daughter's spiritual director and pere buga her own bitter as the trial was mary beatrice bore it with the resignation of a christian mother who believes that the child of her hopes and prayers has been summoned to a brighter and better world the prince her son was still dangerously ill grief for the departed and trembling apprehension for the last surviving object of maternal love and care brought on an attack of fever which confined her to her bed for several days meantime it was generally reported that the prince was either dying or dead much anxiety was expressed on his account in some of the mysterious jacobite letters of the period deep regret for the loss of the princess and general sympathy for the afflicted mother touched every heart in which the leaven of political animosity or polemic bitterness had not quenched the sweet spirit of christian charity and pity in one of the letters of condolence from some person in the court of queen anne apparently to the countess of middleton on the death of the princess louisa the writer says you cannot imagine how generally she is lamented even by those who have ever been enemies to her family i and mine have shared in your loss that we thought our sorrows could have no addition when we heard your chevalier was recovered but now we find our mistake for since we had yours to my daughter jenny tis said at court he is despaired of and on the exchange that he is dead that he ate too much meat and got a cold from going out too soon if this be true all honest people will think no more of the world for sure never were mortals so unfortunate as we i beg you will make our condoling compliments for to write it myself to your only mistress is tormenting her now but pray assure her i grieve for her loss and the sense i am sure she has of it to a degree not to be expressed but felt with true affection and duty i do not question but you must guess at the concern my sisters were in when we received the news of your loss upon my word i was stupefied at it and cannot help being still anxious for the brother's health notwithstanding your assurances of his recovery for we have so many cruel reports about him that it is enough to make us distracted pray assure his afflicted mother of my most humble duty 
God in heaven send her comfort, for she wants it. Nothing but her goodness could resist such a stroke. Among the letters at the court of Saint-Germain, in which real names are usually veiled, under quaint and fictitious aliases, a flimsy precaution at that time, when the real persons intended must have been obvious to every official in the British government, into whose hands these treasonable missives might chance to fall. There is one really curious from Sheffield, Duke of Buckingham, which is supposed to convey the expression of Queen Anne's sympathy for the illness of her unfortunate brother, and her regret for the death of her young lovely sister. Another, from some warm friend of the exiled family, well known, of course, to the party to whom it was addressed, in reply to a communication that the Chevalier was out of danger, runs as follows. Dear Sir, Hannah, that is Mr. Lilly, says, yours of the twenty-ninth, was the joyfulest her eyes ever saw, for it restored her to life after being dead about a week, but not to perfect health, for her dear louder, that is the princess, and her heart bleeds for poor quail, that is the queen. The heart of the princess Louisa Stuart was enshrined in the silver urn and conveyed to the convent of Chalot, where it was presented, with an elegant Latin oration, to the abbess and community of the visitation of St. Marie of Chalot. They received it with great solemnity and many tears, and placed it, according to the desire of the deceased princess, in the tribune, beside those of her royal father, King James the Second, and her grandmother, Queen Henrietta Maria. Her body was also deposited, by that of her father, in the church of the English Benedictines, in the Rue de Saint-Jacques, Paris, there to remain, like his, unburied, till the restoration of the royal Stuarts to the throne of Great Britain, when it was intended to inter them in Westminster Abbey. The remains of the princess were attended to their temporary resting place by her governess, Catherine, Countess of Middleton, and all her ladies-in-waiting and maids of honor. The Duke of Berwick acted as chief mourner, assisted by his son, the Earl of Tynemouth, the Earl of Middleton, Lord Chamberlain, all the officers of the exiled queen's household, and the English residents at Saint-Germain. The funeral procession was also attended by the French officers of state belonging to the royal chateau and town of Saint-Germain. The death of the Princess Louisa was the greatest misfortune that could have befallen the cause of the House of Stuart, of which she was considered the brightest ornament, and it also deprived her brother of an heiress presumptive to his title, for whose sake much more would have been ventured than for himself, while her ardent devotion to his interest precluded any apprehension of attempts at rivalry on her part. There is a very fine, three-quarter length original portrait of this princess, in the possession of Walter Strickland, Esquire, of Sizer Castle, the gift of Queen Mary Beatrice to Lady Strickland. She is there represented in the full perfection of her charms, apparently about eighteen or nineteen years of age. Nothing can be more noble than her figure, or more graceful than her attitude. She is gathering orange blossoms in the gardens of Saint-Germain. This occupation, and the royal mantle of scarlet velvet, furred with ermine, which she wears over a white satin dress, trimmed with gold, caused her to be mistaken for the bride of the Chevalier de St. George, but she is easily identified as his sister by her likeness to him and to her other portraits and medals. In fact, the painting may be known at a glance for a royal steward and a daughter of Mary Beatrice d'Este, although her complexion is much fairer and brighter, and her eyes and hair are of a lively nut-brown tint instead of black, which gives her more of the English and less of the Italian character of beauty. She bears a slight family likeness, only with a much greater degree of elegance and delicacy of outline, to some of the early portraits of her eldest sister, Queen Mary II. Mary Beatrice received visits of sympathy and condolence on her sad loss from Louis the Fourteenth and Madame de Maintenon. The latter says, in one of her letters, I had the honor of passing two hours with the Queen of England. She looks the very image of desolation. Her daughter had become her friend and chief comfort. The French at Saint-Germain are as disconsolate for her loss as the English, and, indeed, all who knew her loved her most sincerely. She was truly cheerful, affable, and anxious to please, attached to her duties, and fulfilling them all without a murmur. 
the first confidential letter written by mary beatrice after the afflicting dispensation which had deprived her of the last sunshine of her wintry days is dated may nineteenth seventeen twelve it is addressed to her friend angelique priolo it commences with a congratulatory compliment to that religieuse on her re-election to her third triennial as superior of the convent of chalot but the royal writer quickly passes to a subject of deeper sadder interest to herself the death of her child it is not always in the power of a historian to raise the veil that has hidden the treasured grief of a royal mother's heart from the world and after nearly a century and a half have passed away since the agonizing pulses of that afflicted heart have been at rest and its pangs forgotten to place the simple record of her feelings before succeeding generations in her own pathetic words the holy resignation of the christian renders the maternal anguish of the fallen queen more deeply interesting she shall speak for herself but what shall i say to you my dear mother of that beloved daughter whom god gave to me and hath now taken away nothing beyond this that since it is he who hath done it it becomes me to be silent and not to open my mouth unless to bless his holy name he is the master both of the mother and the children he has taken the one and left the other and i ought not to doubt but that he has done the best for both and for me also if i knew how to profit by it behold the point for alas i neither do as i say nor as god requires of me in regard to his dealings with me entreat of him my dear mother to give me grace to enable me to begin to do it i cannot thank you sufficiently for your prayers both for the living and the dead i believe the latter are in a state to acknowledge them before god for in the disposition he put into my dear girl at the commencement of her malady to prepare herself for death i have every reason to hope that she enjoys or soon will enjoy his blessedness with our sainted king and that they will obtain for me his grace that so I may prepare to join them, when, and where, and how, it shall please the master of all things, in his love, to appoint. The poor queen goes on to send messages of affectionate remembrance to the sisters of Chalot, whose kind hearts have sorrowed for her, and with her, in all her afflictions, during her four and twenty years of exile and calamity, but more especially in this last and most bitter grief, in which indeed they had all participated since the princess louisa had been almost a daughter of their house the queen names two of the nuns marie gabrielle and marie henriette and says i shall never forget in all my life the services which the last has rendered to my dear daughter nor the good that she has done her soul although the whole of our dear community have contributed to that which would oblige me if it were possible to redouble my friendship for them all the hapless widow of james the second averts in the next place to another bitter trial which she knew was in store for her that of parting with her son now her only surviving child ever since the commencement of the negotiations for the peace between england and france it had been intimated to the chevalier de st george that it was necessary he should withdraw from saint germain in the first instance and finally from the french dominions in consequence of his dangerous illness and present debility and the indulgence due to the feelings of poor mary beatrice on account of her recent bereavement a temporary delay had been permitted he now began to take the air and gentle exercise on horseback daily and it was considered that he would soon be strong enough to travel i know not continues her majesty when the king my son will set out nor whither i shall go but his departure will not be before the first week in the next month when i learn more about it i will let you know for i intend to come to chalot the same day that he goes from here since if i am to find any consolation during the few days which remain to me i can only hope for it in your house m r when mary beatrice visited louis the fourteenth at marley for the first time after the death of her daughter the heartless ceremonials of state etiquette were alike forgotten by each and they wept together in the fellowship of mutual grief because as the disconsolate mother afterwards said when speaking of the tears they shed at this mournful interview we saw that the aged were left and death had swept away the young all the pleasure 
and all the happiness of the court of versailles expired with the amiable dauphin and dauphiness and the death of the princess louisa completed the desolation of that of the exiled stuarts mary beatrice endeavoured to calm her grief by visiting the monastery of la trappe with her son but confessed that she had not derived any internal consolation from passing two days in that lugubrious retreat it would have been passing strange if she had such an expedition was moreover highly inexpedient as regarded the temporal interests of her son since nothing could have been more distasteful to the english on her return to saint germain the royal widow added the following codicils to the paper containing her testamentary acknowledgments of her debts to the convent of chalot i declare also that my intention and will is that the thousand livres which i have left in my testament to lady henrietta douglas who has been a nun professed in the monastery of the visitation of saint marie de chalot and who bears there the name of sister marie paul be paid to the said monastery notwithstanding the decease of the said sister marie paul douglas marie r done at saint germain the seventh of july seventeen twelve i have left also in my will for the said monastery to found a perpetual mass for the repose of my soul and those of the king my lord and my dear daughter marie r a rent which appears in the sheet of paper on which the poor queen has endeavoured to provide for the payment of her debt to the convent of chalot is thus naively explained by herself in the following notification it is i who by accident have torn this paper but i will that it have effect throughout notwithstanding marie r it was not till the twenty eighth of july that mary beatrice could summon up sufficient resolution to visit her friends at chalot and when she arrived the sight of the nuns who had been accustomed to wait on her and the princess louisa during their long sojourn in the convent in the preceding year renewed her anguish she uttered a bitter cry and exclaimed oh but this visit is different from my last alas who could have told it but god is the master it is he that hath done it and his holy name be forever blessed when she entered she sat down by the princess de conde who had come like herself to assist at the profession of a nun the community retired and she consented to see her friends Françoise angelique and claire angelique for a few moments but nothing seemed to give her consolation the probationer marie helene of Rall, who was about to make her irrevocable vow came to speak to her majesty and said she would pray for her while she was under the black pall pray only that god's holy will may be done said the afflicted mother when the profession was over mary beatrice composed herself sufficiently to give audience to the spanish ambassador and some others who desired to pay their compliments to her she afterwards insisted on visiting the tribune where the heart of her lost darling was now enshrined beside that of her lamented lord king james the sight of those mournful relics thus united renewed all her agonies and it was with difficulty that the nuns could tear her from the spot after she had assisted in the prayers that were offered up for the departed when she was at last induced to return to her apartment the princess de conde endeavoured to persuade her to take her tea but her grief so entirely choked her that she could not swallow and sickened at each attempt the same evening the duchess of lauzun expressed a great desire to be permitted to see her majesty mary beatrice consented to receive her and requested her to be seated the duchess refused the proffered tabaret seeing that the abbess and several of the nuns who were present were sitting according to custom on the ground at the end of the room she went and seated herself in the same lowly position among them the conversation turned on the virtues and untimely deaths of the dauphin and the dauphiness mary beatrice spoke with tender affection of them both and discussed their funeral sermons and orations some of which she praised when she spoke of the grief of louis the fourteenth and the tears she had shed with him for their loss it renewed her anguish for her own more recent bereavement sobs choked her voice and she gave way to a fresh paroxysm of suffocating agony after the departure of the duchess de lazun she became more composed and drawing sister margaret henrietta the favorite friend of her beloved daughter on one side she told her 
that the only consolation she was capable of feeling for the loss of that dear child was in the remembrance of her virtues and in retracing them that at first she feared there was much of vanity in her desire of having a funeral oration made for her the same as had been done for the late king her husband and a circular letter containing a brief memoir but she had consulted her spiritual directors and they had assured her it was her duty to render to the memory of the princess the honours due to her birth and great virtues the royal mother who certainly meant to have a share in the composition of the posthumous tribute to the merits of her departed child said she wished the circular letter to appear in the name of the community of chalot but that she would pay all the expenses of printing and paper the abbess who was present at the consultation entirely approved of the idea and told her majesty that the memorials which sister henriette had kept of her royal highness would be very serviceable to the design the sister brought her notes and presented them to her majesty to whom they were of course inexpressibly precious she received them with mournful satisfaction and said they would be of great use in the circular letter or conventual obituary memorial of her daughter mary beatrice feeling herself much the worse for the excitement of this agitating day wished to return to saint germain she went away at six o'clock in the evening much fatigued and was ill and feverish for several days after her return this day continues the chronicler of chalot lady strickland of sizer came here bringing with her as a present from the queen of england to our house the beautiful petticoat which the king had had manufactured at lyon during his travels for the princess his sister it had never been worn by her for whom it had been purchased the mourning for the first dauphin not having expired when both courts were plunged into grief and gloom by the deaths of the young dauphin and dauphiness and their eldest son which was followed only two months afterwards by that of the young lovely flower of saint germain the belle jupe after the decease of the princess became the perquisite of her governess lady middleton but the royal mother regarding it as a memorial of the affection of her son for his departed sister did not wish it to be worn by any other person than her for whom it had been intended or that the costly materials should be put to other uses than the decoration of the church where her daughter's heart was deposited on her return to saint germain she asked lady middleton what she meant to do with it actuated by a similar delicacy of sentiment her ladyship replied she wished to present it to the convent of chalot out of respect to her royal pupil the queen told her that having a wish to present it herself she would buy it of her lady middleton to humour her royal mistress consented to receive a small sum for it that it might be called the queen of england's gift such little fond conceits served in some measure to divert grief which otherwise must have destroyed life and reason end of section seven section eight of the lives of the queens of england volume ten by agnes and elizabeth strickland this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary Beatrice of Modena, Chapter 11, Part 1 The next trial that awaited the fallen queen was parting from her son. The Chevalier de St. George was compelled to quit Saint-Germain on the 18th of August. He went to livery in the first instance, where a sojourn of a few days was allowed previous to his taking his final departure from France the same day mary beatrice came to indulge her grief at chalot the following pathetic account of her deportment is given by our shiloh chronicler the queen of england arrived at half past seven in the evening bathed in tears which made ours flow to see them it is the first time said the queen on entering that i feel no joy in coming to chalot but my god added she weeping I ask not consolation, but the accomplishment of thy holy will. She sat down to supper, but scarcely ate anything. When she retired to her chamber with the three nuns who waited on her, she cried as soon as she entered, Oh, at last I may give liberty to my heart and weep for my poor girl. She burst into a passion of tears as she spoke. We wept with her. Alas, what could we say to her? She repeated to herself, my god thy will be done 
and then mournfully added, Thou hast not waited for my death to despoil me, thou hast done it during my life, but thy will be done. The nuns were so inconsiderate as to mention to the afflicted mother some painful reports that were in circulation, connected with the death of the princess Louisa, as if it had been caused, rather by the maltreatment of her doctors than the disease. Alas, the poor doctors did their best, replied her majesty. But as your king said, they cannot render mortals immortal. The day after her arrival at Chalot, Mary Beatrice found herself very much indisposed, and her physicians were summoned from Saint-Germain to her aid, but their prescriptions did her no good. Her malady was the reaction of severe mental suffering on an enfeebled frame, and the more physic she took, the worse she became. On the morrow, every one was alarmed at the state of debility into which she had sunk, and her ladies said, one to another, she will die here. One of her physicians, more sagacious than the rest, ordered that the portrait of her daughter, which was on the buffet with that of the Chevalier de St. George, should be removed out of her sight, for the eyes of the bereaved mother were always riveted upon those sweet familiar features. At last, grief found words again. The sick queen sent for Lady Henrietta Douglas to her bedside, and confided to her a vexation that had touched her sensibly. The funeral oration for the Princess Louisa, on which she had set her heart, could not take place. The court of France had signified to her that it would be incompatible with the negotiations, into which his most Christian majesty had entered with Queen Anne, to permit any public allusion to be made to the exiled royal family of England. Therefore, it would be impossible for her to enjoy the mournful satisfaction of causing the honors and respect to be paid to her beloved daughter's memory, which were legitimately due to her high rank as a princess of England, sharing the blood royal of France. The maternal pride of the fallen queen was deeply wounded by this denial, which was the more grievous to her, because she had naturally calculated on the powerful appeal that would be made, by the most eloquent clerical orator in Paris, to the sympathies of a crowded congregation, in allusion to her own desolate state at this crisis, and the misfortunes of her son, an appeal which she fondly imagined would be echoed from Paris to London, and produce a strong revulsion of feeling in favor of the Stuart cause. It was for this very reason, the political use that would be made of this opportunity by the expatriated family of James the Second, that the French cabinet was compelled to deny the gratification to the afflicted queen of having a funeral oration made for her departed child. This mortification then, said Mary Beatrice, must be added to all the others which I have been doomed to suffer, and my only consolation in submitting to it must be that such is the will of God. A needless aggravation to her grief was inflicted on the poor queen at the same time by the folly of the nuns, in continually repeating to her the various malicious reports that had been invented by some pitiless enemy relating to the last illness and death of her beloved daughter. It was said that her majesty had compelled the princess to make her last confession, contrary to her wish, to Père Gaylard, because he was a Jesuit, that she had caused her to be attended against her inclination by her brother's English physician, Dr. Wood, who is styled by our shallow authority, Monsieur Oud, and that the said Oud had either poisoned her royal highness or allowed her to die for want of nourishment. Mary Beatrice said, that it was strange how such unaccountable falsehoods could be spread, that she had allowed her children full liberty in the choice, both of their physicians and spiritual directors, from the time they arrived at years of discretion, that her daughter had earnestly desired to be attended by Dr. Wood, who had done the best for her, as regarded human power and skill, and as for allowing her to sink for want of nourishment, Nothing could be more cruelly untrue, for they had fed her every two hours. Her majesty, having been a good deal excited by this painful discourse, went on to speak in praise of the Jesuits, more than would be worth the trouble of recording, and which came, as a matter of course, from the lips of a princess educated under their influence. Not, she said, that she was blind to the faults of individuals belonging to the order, 
as an instance of which she added that the late king her lord had caused her great vexation by giving himself up to the guidance of father petre admitting him into his council and trying to get him made a cardinal that the man liked her not and she had suffered much in consequence but did not consider that the intemperance and bad conduct of one person ought to be visited on the whole company to which she certainly regarded him as a reproach such then was the opinion of the consort of james the second of father petre such the real terms on which she acknowledged to her confidential friends and religious uses of the same church she stood with that mischievous ecclesiastic with whom she had been unscrupulously represented as leagued in urging the king to the measures which led to his fall neither time nor christian charity were able to subdue the bitterness of her feelings towards the evil counsellor who had overborne by his violence her gentle conjugal influence and provoked the crisis which ended in depriving her husband of a crown and forfeiting a regal inheritance for their son william mary and anne and others who had benefited by the revolution she had forgiven but father petre she could not forgive and this is the more remarkable because of the placability of her disposition towards her enemies while she was at chalot some of her ladies speaking of the duke of marlborough in her presence observed that his being compelled to retire into germany was a very trifling punishment for one who had acted as he had done towards his late master and that they could never think of his treachery without feeling disposed to invoke upon him the maledictions of the psalmist on the wicked never exclaimed the fallen queen have i used such prayers as those nor will i ever use them her majesty continued sick and sad for several days she told the nuns she had a presentiment that she should die that year her illness however ended only in a fit of the gout and we find that at the end of a week she was up and able to attend the services of her church at the profession of a young lady to whom she had promised to give the cross the ecclesiastic who preached the sermon on that occasion discoursed much of death the vanity of human greatness and the calamities of princes and created a great sensation in the church by a personal allusion to mary beatrice and her misfortunes the queen of england he said had given the cross to the probationer without wishing to lose her own she had chosen that convent to be her tomb and had said with the prophet here will i make my rest and for ever here will i live here will i die and here will i be buried also every one was alarmed at hearing the preacher go on in this strain dreading the effect it would have on her majesty in her present depressed state combined with her presages of death but to the surprise of every one she came smiling out of the church and told m de sulpice that she thought the preacher had been addressing his sermon to her instead of the new sister agatha the next day when her son who had been alarmed at the report of her illness came from livray to see her she repeated many parts of the discourse to him the chevalier had been so much indisposed himself since his departure from saint germain that he had been bled in the foot and being still lame from that operation he was obliged to lean on his cane for support when he went to salute his mother as she came out of the church the gout having attacked her in the foot she too was lame and walking with a stick also they both laughed at this coincidence yet it was a season of mortification to both mother and son for the truce with england was proclaimed in paris on the preceding day they held sad councils together in the queen's private apartment on the gloomy prospect of affairs the abbess told him sire we hope your majesty will do us the honour to dine with us as your royal uncle king charles breakfasted when setting out for england that journey will not be yet he replied dryly he dined alone with the queen and returned in the evening to livray on the following friday he came to dine with her again at the convent dressed in deep mourning for his sister and went to the opera at paris in the evening on purpose to show himself because the english ambassador extraordinary for the peace st john lord bolingbroke was expected to appear there in state with his suite that night of this circumstance one of the absent ministers of the council of saint germain 
thus writes to an agent of the party in England. Among other news from France, we are told that Lord Bolingbroke happened to be at the opera with the Chevalier de St. George, where they could not but see one another. I should like to know what my lord says of that knight, and whether he likes him, for they tell me he is a tall, proper, well-shaped young gentleman, that he has an air of greatness mixed with mildness and good nature, and that his countenance is not spoiled with the smallpox, but on the contrary, that he looks more manly than he did, and is really healthier than he was before, and they say he goes to Chalons. It was a remarkable mistake about the Chevalier de St. George not to be marked by the smallpox. That malady marked his countenance in no small degree, and destroyed his fine complexion. The queen and nuns, it seems, amused themselves, after the departure of the Chevalier, not in speculating on what impression his appearance was likely to make on the English nobles who might chance to see him, but how far it was consistent with a profession of Christian piety to frequent such amusements as operas, comedies, and theatrical spectacles of any kind. Mary Beatrice said, She was herself uncertain about it, for she had often asked spiritually-minded persons to tell her whether it were a sin or not, and could get no positive answer. Only the pair Bordeloup had said thus far, that he would not advise Christian princes to suffer their children to go off into such places, and when they did, to acquaint themselves first with the pieces that were to be represented, that they should not be of a nature to corrupt their morals. On the Tuesday following, Mary Beatrice went to Livray to dine with her son. She was attended by the Duchesses of Berwick and Perth, the Countess of Middleton and Lady Talbot, Lady Clare and Lady Sophia Buckley. The Duke of Lauzun lent his coach for the accommodation of those ladies who could not go in that of their royal mistress. The once stately equipages of that unfortunate princess were now reduced to one great old-fashioned coach, and the noble ladies who shared her adverse fortunes were destitute of any conveyance and frequently went out in hired remises. The visit to Livray is thus noticed in Sir David Nairnay's private report to one of his official correspondents. September 1st. Wisely the Queen was here today, and dined with Kennedy, that is the Chevalier, who is in better health, and heartier than I ever saw him at Stanley's, that is Saint-Germain. Her Majesty and her ladies returned to the convent at eight o'clock in the evening. The Chevalier came to dine with his mother again on the Sunday, and the Marquis de Torcy had a long conference with him in Her Majesty's chamber. When that minister took his leave of him, the Chevalier said, Tell the King, your master, sir, that I shall always rely on his goodness. I shall preserve all my life a grateful remembrance of your good offices. The luckless prince was, nevertheless, full well aware that he had outstayed his welcome, and that he must not linger in the environs of Paris beyond the seventh of that month. He came again to Chalot on the 6th to bid his sorrowful mother a long farewell. He was entirely unprovided with money for his journey, and this increased her distress of mind, for her treasurer, Mr. Dickinson, had vainly endeavored to prevail on de Marais, the French minister, through whom her pension was made, to advance any part of what had been due to her for the last six months. The chevalier, true nephew of Charles the Second, seemed not a whit disquieted at the state of his finances. He thanked the abbess of Chalot very warmly for the care she had taken of the queen, his mother, and engaged, if ever he should be called to the throne of England, to make good a broken promise of his late uncle Charles the Second for the benefit of that convent. He talked cheerfully to his mother at dinner in order to keep up her spirits and described to the nuns who waited upon her some of the peculiarities of the Puritans, such, he said, as feasting on Good Friday. The Chevalier drank tea with Her Majesty, and when they exchanged their sorrowful adieu in her chamber, they embraced each other many times with tears, then went together to the tribune, where the hearts of the late King James and the Princess Louisa were enshrined, and there separated. Mary Beatrice wept bitterly at the departure of her son, her last earthly tie. He was himself much moved, and tenderly recommended her to the care of the abbess of Chalot and the nuns, 
and especially to Father Ruga, to whom he said, he deputed the task of consoling her majesty. He slept that night at Livre, and commenced his journey towards the frontier the next morning. In three days, he arrived at chalon sur marne where he was to remain, till some place for his future residence should be settled by France and the Allies. The negotiations for a general peace were then proceeding at Utrecht. Lord Bolingbroke, during his brief stay at Paris, for the arrangement of preliminary articles, had promised the long-withheld jointure of the widowed consort of James the Second should be paid. Mary Beatrice had previously sent in a memorial, setting forth her claims, and the incontrovertible fact that they had been allowed at the Peace of Ryswick, and that the English Parliament had subsequently granted a supply for their settlement. Some delicate punctilios required to be adjusted as to the form in which the receipt should be given by the royal widow, without compromising the cause of her son. Should the queen, observes Lord Middleton, style herself queen mother, she supposes that will not be allowed. Should she style herself queen dowager, that would be lessening of herself, and a prejudice to the king her son, which she will never do. The question is, whether the instrument may not be good without any title at all, only the word, we. For inasmuch as it will be signed, Maria R., and sealed with her seal, one would think the person would be sufficiently denoted. Our counsel here thinks she might sign herself thus, Mary, Queen Consort of James the Second, late King of England, Ireland and France, Defender of the Faith, etc. The last cause was certainly absurd. The simple regal signature, Maria R., was finally adopted after the long protracted negotiations were concluded. Mary Beatrice remained at Chalot in a great state of dejection after the departure of her son. The Duchess Dowager of Orlan, Elizabeth Charlotte of Bavaria, came to visit her towards the latter end of September. Her Majesty probably considered herself neglected at this sad epoch by other members of the royal family of France, for tenderly embracing her, she said, what, madam, have you given yourself the trouble of coming here to see an unfortunate recluse? Monsieur and Madame de Beauvilliers came soon after to pay their respects to Mary Beatrice. She had a great esteem for them, and they conversed much on spiritual matters and books. Her Majesty spoke with lively satisfaction of having received a consolatory letter from Fenelon, Archbishop of Cambrai, in which, without entering into affairs of state or politics, he had said, that he prayed the Lord to give the king, her son, all things that were needful for him, and that his heart might always be in the hands of the Most High, to guard and dispose it according to his will. Although neither wealth nor dominion were included in this petition for her son, the royal mother was well satisfied that better things had been asked. When Monsieur and Madame St. Sulpice came to pay Mary Beatrice a visit in her retreat, they told her they had heard that the Scotch had made bonfires on the birthday of the Chevalier St. George, and shouted God save King James the Eighth, and had burned a figure which they called the House of Hanover. It is true, replied the Queen. And a little time before, they burned the Prince of Hanover in effigy, but that signifies nothing. Our friends expose themselves too much by it. None of them, however, have been punished. It is to be wished, madam, replied her visitors, that these crimes would augment sufficiently to give a turn to the fortunes of your son. Mary Beatrice spoke little at this crisis of what was passing in England, but her looks were closely watched. One evening, it was observed that she was laughing very much with her ladies over a packet she was reading with them. She afterwards told the curious sisterhood that it was a paper ridiculing all that had been printed in London about her son. She also told them of a political fan which had a great sale in England, where it was, of course, regarded as a Jacobite badge. The device was merely the figure of a king, with this motto, Chacun a son tour. On the reverse, a cornucopia, with the motto, Peace and Plenty. Mary Beatrice spoke very kindly of Queen Anne, whom she styled the Princess of Denmark, and appeared distressed at the reports of her illness. She requested her friends to pray for her recovery and conversion, adding, It would be a great misfortune for us to lose her just now. 
the circular letter of the convent of chalot on the death of her own lamented daughter the princess louisa being finished mary beatrice wished to be present when it was read she wept much at some passages but gave her opinion very justly on others where she considered correction necessary they had said that the princess felt keenly the state to which her family and herself had been reduced by the injustice of fortune ha cried the queen but that is not speaking christianly meaning that such figures of speech savoured rather of heathen rhetoric than the simplicity of christian truth they altered the sentence thus in which she had been placed by the decrees of providence that is good said her majesty she desired them to alter another passage in which it was asserted that the princess was so entirely occupied at all times and places with the love of god that even when she was at the opera or the play her whole thoughts were on him and that she adapted in her own mind the music songs and choruses to his praise with internal adoration this mary beatrice said would have been very edifying if it had been strictly true but she thought her daughter was passionately fond of music songs and poetry and took the delight in those amusements which was natural to her time of life though she was far from being carried away by pleasures of the kind the nuns appealed to pere gaylar if it were not so but he replied that he could only answer for that part of the letter which he had furnished namely the account of the last sickness and death of her royal highness mary beatrice then sent for the duchess de lauzun who had been on the most intimate terms of friendship with the princess and asked her what she thought of the passage the duchess said that if they printed it it would throw discredit on all the rest for none who knew the delight the princess had taken in songs and music and had observed that when she was at the opera she was so transported with the music that she could not refrain from accompanying it even with her voice would believe that she was occupied in spiritual contemplations on such subjects as life and death and eternity her majesty then desired the passage should be omitted the assertion had doubtless originated from the princess having remarked that some of the choruses in the opera had reminded her of the chants of her church in the beginning of october madame de maintenon came to pay a sympathizing visit to mary beatrice and testified much regard for her her majesty went into the gallery to receive her and at her departure accompanied her as far as the tribune maintenon promised to come again on the twenty-fifth of the month but being prevented by a bad cold she sent some venison to her majesty which had been hunted by the king mary beatrice expressed herself in reply charmed with the attention of his majesty in thinking of her madame de maintenon came quite unexpectedly three days after and brought with her a basket of beautiful oranges as a present for the queen she had to wait a long time at the gate before the abbess who was with her majesty could come to receive her the duc d'almal who had accompanied madame de maintenon was annoyed at having to wait but she said it was the mark of a regular house that there should be a difficulty in obtaining admittance mary beatrice was much agitated two days later by receiving from this lady a hasty letter apprising her of the alarming illness of louis the fourteenth from cold and inflammation which rendered it expedient to bleed him an operation never resorted to with persons of his advanced age except in cases of extremity oh my god exclaimed the exiled queen when she had read the letter what a calamity for france for his family and for us poor unfortunates what will become of us she wept bitterly and her ladies wept with her at the anticipation of losing their only friend and protector whose existence appeared at that moment inexpressibly precious to the destitute british emigrants who were at that time dependent for food and shelter on the annual pension which he allowed their widowed queen inadequate as this pittance was for the maintenance of the unfortunate colony at st germain it was rendered by the rigid economy and personal sacrifices of their royal mistress a means of preserving several thousands of the faithful adherents of the cause of the stuarts from perishing with hunger and it was doubtful whether this fund would be renewed by a regent in the event of louis the fourteenth's death 
the queen was in too painful a state of excitement to eat at dinner lady middleton read to her a chapter out of the imitation of christ but she sighed heavily and remained in great depression of spirits all day she was in anxious expectation of receiving tidings of the king's health but having none she wrote to madame de maintenon at eight in the evening to make inquiries the next morning at nine o'clock an inquiry brought a letter from madame de maintenon which reassured her the king had borne the bleeding well had passed a good night and was out of danger the gratitude of the fallen queen for the shelter and support that had been accorded by louis to her and her family and their distressed followers and the scrupulous respect with which he had ever treated her blinded her to the motives which had led him to confer personal benefits for political ends how often he had played the part of the broken reed to her unfortunate consort and disappointed the flattering hopes he had raised in the bosom of her son she was willing to forget or to attribute to the evil offices of his ministers mary beatrice gave her royal friend credit for all the generous romance of feeling that formed the beau ideal of the age of chivalry the experience of four and twenty years of bitter pangs of hope deferred had not convinced her of her mistake one of the nuns of chalot told mary beatrice that she was wrong to imagine every one was as free from deceit as herself your own nature madam said she is so upright and truthful that you believe the same of the rest of the world and you do not distrust any one but god who is good knows the wickedness of human nature and i could wish that your majesty would sometimes feel the necessity of a prudent mistrust it is true replied the queen that i never suspect ill and that i have not the spirit of intrigue that belongs to courts nevertheless madam rejoined the religieuse your majesty through the grace of god acquired in your adversity a wisdom that all the cunning and intrigue in the world could never have given you that of conciliating and preserving the affection and confidence of the king your husband he knew said the royal widow how much i loved him and that produced reciprocal feelings in him a few days after this conversation mary beatrice said she could not think without pain that the time of her departure from the convent drew near and that she must return to st germain to that melancholy and now desolate palace her tears began to flow as she spoke of the loneliness that awaited her there alas said she picture to yourselves the state in which i shall find myself in that place where i lost the king my lord and husband and my daughter now that i am deprived of my son what a frightful solitude does it appear i shall be compelled to eat alone in public and when the repast is ended and i retire to my cabinet who will there be to speak to there here i find at least a little society i had thought to remain here always i have spoken of it to the pairs ruga and gaylar and i asked pere ruga to entreat for me enlightenment from god on this subject but he has told me i ought not to think of it i must therefore make the sacrifice and leave this retreat on which i had fixed my desire for it will not be permitted me to enjoy it i have not continued her majesty relied on the opinions of pairs ruga and gaylar alone i have consulted madame maintenon and the duke of berwick and all are of opinion that in the present position of my son's affairs i ought not to retire from the world in fact that i ought to remain for some time at st germain not for any satisfaction that i can find in the world for i have experienced this very day a severe mortification which has touched me sensibly mary beatrice did not explain the circumstance that had annoyed her but said i have written to the king my son about it and see what he has sent in reply she then read the following passage from the letter she held in her hand it is not for me madam to make an exhortation to your majesty that would be great presumption on my part but you know what saint augustine says non preventitur ad sumum palum etiam insolentio nisi cum magno strepita pugna vit cum motibus suis which means explained her majesty who appears to have been a better latin scholar than her friends the religieuses that one cannot even find peace in the silence of a cloister 
if one does not fight manfully against carnal inclinations. She did not read any more of the letter, but only said that, although her son had not the brilliant talents of the princess his sister, he had solid sense. But my daughter, continues the fond mother, had both the brilliant and the solid, they were united in her, and I may say so without vanity, since she is no more. The Chevalier was an excellent correspondent, and wrote many pleasant and often witty letters to cheer his sorrowful and anxious mother in his absence. End of section 8 Section 9 of The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 10, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary Beatrice of Modena, Chapter 11, Part 2. On the 11th of November, Lord Galway came to inform Mary Beatrice that he had seen her son as he passed through Chalons, that he appeared thoughtful, but was very well, and even growing fat, though he took a great deal of exercise, and that he made the tour of the ramparts of that town every day on foot. The king, his father, was accustomed to do the like, said Her Majesty and rarely sat down to table till he had taken his walk. Lord Galway said that, The prince bade him tell Her Majesty that he was much better in health than at Saint-Germain, and wished she could see him. It would give me extreme joy to see him again, replied Mary Beatrice meekly, but I must not desire what is not the will of God. It was upwards of two months since she had enjoyed that happiness. Her Majesty afterwards walked with the community to the Orangery and a detached building belonging to the conventual establishment to some little distance in their grounds, which they called the small mansion. She returned vigorously from this walk without being the least out of breath, and having walked very fast, she asked the nun who had had the honor to give her her hand, if she had not tired her, to which the religieuse, being too polite to reply in the affirmative, said, there were some moments in which she had not felt so strong as usual. Your answer reminds me, rejoins the queen playfully, of what they say in Italy when anyone inquires of another, are you hungry? The answer to which is not yes, but I should have no objection to eat again. The next day, Mary Beatrice mentioned with great pleasure, having received a letter from her aunt, who was then a Carmelite nun. She writes to me with the most profound humility, said Her Majesty. As if she were the least person in the world, I am ashamed to say I have not written to her for a long time. We used to dispute with one another which should be a nun. I was fifteen and she was thirty, when they first spoke of a marriage with the Duke of York, and we each said to the other in secret, It will be you that will be chosen. But the lot fell to me. On the 14th of November, Mary Beatrice found herself weary and indisposed. She had taken one of her bad colds, coughed all the time she was at her toilette, and grew worse towards evening. She had a bad night, with cough and sore throat, and difficulty breathing. At five in the morning, Madame Molza, who slept in her chamber, was alarmed, and called the nun who kept the keys, to come and give her opinion. The nun said Her Majesty was in a high fever, and went to tell the Duchess of Perth, who immediately rose, and wrote to Saint-Germain for Her Majesty's physician, and Monsieur Beaulieu, her French surgeon, to come to her. They did not arrive till two in the afternoon, which caused great uneasiness, for the Queen grew visibly worse, and her mind was so deeply impressed with the death of her daughter, that she thought herself to be dying, and those about her had some trouble to compose her. The fever was so high that it was thought necessary to bleed her, and for two days she was in imminent danger. She was, besides, in great dejection of spirits. Her Majesty, says our Shiloh diary, was very sad during her sickness, not so much at the idea of death, but because she had not her children near her as on former occasions, and above all, it renewed in her remembrance the princess, who had been accustomed whenever she was ill to wait upon her as a nurse. Mary Beatrice had borne the first agony of her bereavement, terrible and unexpected as it was, with the resignation of a Christian heroine. 
but every day she felt it more acutely and during her weary convalescence she pined for her lost treasure with unutterable yearnings while the poor queen was still confined to her chamber a striking sermon was preached in the conventual church on the love of god by pere grayman in which he said that sometimes three sacrifices were required by our heavenly father which he should briefly express in three latin words tua tuos te that is to say thy goods thy children and thyself when this was repeated to mary beatrice she cried with a deep sigh small is the sacrifice of tua or the goods in comparison with tuos the children on a former occasion she had said job bore the loss of his goods unmoved but when he heard of the loss of his children he rent his garments and fell prostrate to the earth mary beatrice had the consolation of receiving a most affectionate and dutiful letter from her son expressing the greatest concern for her illness and begging her to take care of her health for his sake since the most overwhelming of all his calamities would be the loss of her the chevalier was still at chalon sur marne waiting the event of the negotiations at utrecht the payment of the two bills of sixteen thousand francs each which cardinal gualtiero had persuaded the queen to hold after she had regarded them as lost money had enabled her to send him some seasonable pecuniary relief at his greatest need and also to discharge a few trifling debts of her own in england of long standing which had distressed her scrupulous sense of honesty she gave one thousand francs among the three domestic sisters who had waited upon her in her sickness and during her long sojourn in the convent on the first sunday in advent perceiving that all her ladies were worn out with fatigue and weary of the monotony of the life they led at chalot and hearing withal many complaints of her absence from saint germain she at last made up her mind to return thither the next day monday december fifth she was very low-spirited at the thought of it coughed very much all night and in the morning appeared wavering in her purpose but seeing everything prepared for her departure she was about to make her adieu when she was informed the duc de lauzun wished to speak to her it was inconvenient to give audience to any one just as she was setting off on her journey but she judged that he had something important to communicate and gave orders to admit him he was the bearer of evil tidings for he came to break to her the tragic death of the duke of hamilton who had been slain in a duel with lord mahoon not without strong suspicions of foul play on the part of his antagonist second general mccartney the duke of hamilton was at that time the main pillar of her son's cause in scotland he was in correspondence with herself had just been appointed ambassador to the court of france secretly empowered it has generally been supposed by queen anne to make arrangements with the court of saint germain for the adoption of the exiled prince as her successor on condition of his remaining quiet during her life little doubt existed of the duke being able by his great interest in parliament to obtain the repeal of the act of settlement for the royal succession the queen was deeply affected by the melancholy news and the ladies perth and middleton wept bitterly it was a great blow to the whole party and cast a deeper gloom on their return to the desolate palace of saint germain her majesty's chair being brought into the gallery for she was still too feeble to walk she prepared to enter it after she had taken some bread in a little broth but seeing one of the community who had waited on her while she was in the convent she presented her hand to her and said i console myself with the hope of your seeing me again very soon if it please god she was carried into the tribune where the community attended her and having made her devotions there she was conveyed in a chair to her coach mary beatrice arrived at saint germain at two o'clock in the afternoon the interests of her son required that she should stifle her own private feelings and endeavor to maintain a shadow of royal state by holding her courts and receptions with the same ceremonies though on a smaller scale as if she had been a recognized queen mother of england how well did the words of the royal preacher vanitas vanitatus which were so often on the lips of that pale tearful niobe who in her widow's coif and veil and sable weeds of woe occupied the chair of state on these occasions describe the mockery of the attempt 
the melancholy Christmas of 1712 was rendered more distressing to Mary Beatrice by the intrigues and divisions that agitated her counsel, and the suspicions that were instilled into the mind of her absent son, of his mentor, the Earl of Middleton, who had accompanied him from Saint-Germain to Chalons, and acted as his principal adviser. The old story, that he was bribed by the court of St. James's to betray the state secrets of the exiled Stuarts, and had been in the practice of doing this ever since the death of James the Second, was revived, though without any sort of proof, and all the misfortunes and failures that had occurred were charged on his mismanagement and treachery. It was also stated that he had neglected the interests of the Stuart cause in Scotland, and had promoted, instead of opposing, the Union. Middleton justified himself from those charges, but indignantly offered to withdraw from his troublesome and profitless office. Mary Beatrice, having a great esteem for this statesman, and a particular friendship for his countess, was very uneasy at the idea of his resignation. Her principal adviser, at this time, appears to have been the Abbe Innes, who, in one of the mystified letters of that period, thus writes on the subject, Paris, January ninth, 1713. I was never more surprised than when the Queen showed me some letters the King had sent her about Mr. Massey, that is Lord Middleton. And the more I thought of it, the more I am convinced that villainy must proceed originally either from the Irish to remove one whom they looked upon as none of their friends, to make way for one of their friends, or else that it is a trick of the Whigs to ruin Jonathan, that is the king. By insinuating a correspondence with them, to give jealousy to the other party, and by that means, to deprive Jonathan of the only person capable of giving him advice. Mary Beatrice took upon herself the office of mediating between her son and their old servant, Middleton, whose wounded feelings she, not unsuccessfully, endeavored to soothe in the following letter. Saint-Germain, January 28th, 1713. I have not had the heart all this while to write to you upon the dismal subject of your leaving the king, but I am sure you are just enough to believe that it has and does give to me a great deal of trouble, and that which I see it gives the king increases mine. You tell me in your last letter, upon Mr. Hamilton's coming away, that if your opinion had been followed, you had gone first, but if mine were followed, you should never go first nor last. But alas, I am grown so insignificant and useless to my friends, that all I can do is to pray for them, and God knows my poor prayers are worth but little. I own to you that as weary as I am of the world, I am not yet so dead to it, as not to feel the usage the king and I meet with. His troubles are more sensible to me than my own, and if all fell only on me, and his affairs went well, and he were easy, I think I could be so too. But we must take what God sends, and as he sends it, and submit ourselves entirely to his will, which I hope in his mercy he will give us grace to do, and then in spite of the world all will turn to our good. It can scarcely be forgotten that the Princess of Orange, when her sister Anne was endeavoring to inveigle her into the conspiracy for depriving their infant brother of the regal succession, by insinuating that he was a spurious child, feeling dubious that she ought to credit so monstrous a charge without inquiring into the evidences of his paternity, propounded, among other queries, which she sent to Anne, the simple but important question, Is the Queen fond of him? Anne, being an interested witness, replied evasively. Nature, who cannot equivocate, has answered unconsciously to the test in the unaffected gush of maternal tenderness with which Mary Beatrice speaks of her son to Lord Middleton in this letter. She says, You told me in one of your former letters that you were charmed with the king being a good son. What do you think then that I must be, that am the poor old doting mother of him? I do assure you, his kindness to me is all my support under God. Mary, but our unfortunate Italian queen, on whose ignorance some historians have been pleased to enlarge, could write plain English with the same endearing familiarity, as if it had been her mother tongue. Our hissing, growling, grunting northern gutturals had become sweeter to her ear than the silvery intonations of her poetic land, and flowed more naturally to her pen. 
English was the language of those she loved best on earth, the unforgotten husband of her youth and their children. Of the last surviving of these, the pretender, she thus continues in her letter to his offended minister, the Earl of Middleton. And I am confirmed of late, more than ever, in my observation, that the better you are with him, the kinder he is to me. But I am also charmed with him, for being a good master, and a true friend to those who deserve it of him, though I am sorry from my heart that you have not had so much cause of late to make experience of it. M. R. I say nothing to you of business, nor of Mr. Hamilton, for I write all I know to the king, and it is to no purpose, to make repetitions. I expect, with some impatience, a great deal of fear, Humphrey's decision as to France. The meaning of this enigmatical sentence is, whether Queen Anne would permit the Chevalier de St. George to avail himself of the asylum which the Duke of Lorraine had offered him in his dominions. This was in the end privately allowed by her, and publicly protested against by her ministers. Mary Beatrice writes again to the Earl of Middleton on the 9th of February. She had succeeded in prevailing on him to continue with her son, and she says many obliging and encouraging things to him in this letter, which is, however, dry, and chiefly on public business. She there speaks of this secret correspondent, Bolingbroke, by the appropriate cognomen of Prattler, and certainly appears to set very little account on his flattering professions. The position of the son of James the Second appears by no means in so bad a light to the potentates of Europe at this period, as it did to the desponding widow who sat in her companionless desolation at Saint-Germain, watching the chances of the political game. The emperor, though he had publicly demurred for nearly three months, whether he would or would not, grant the chevalier a passport to travel through part of his dominions to bar le duc secretly entertained overtures for connecting the disinherited prince with his own family by a marriage with an archduchess the tender age of his daughter who was only twelve years old was objected by his imperial majesty as an obstacle to her union with a prince in his five and twentieth year but he politely intimated, at the same time, that his sister was of a more suitable time of life. Queen Anne's ill health at this period, the unsettled state of the parties in England, and the lingering affection of the people to hereditary succession, rendered an alliance with the representative of the royal Stuarts by no means undeserving of the attention of the princesses of Europe. The chevalier did not improve the opening that had been made for him, by his generous friend, the Duke of Lorraine, with the court of Vienna. His thoughts appear to have been more occupied on the forlorn state of his mother than with matrimonial speculations for himself. The manner in which he speaks of this desolate princess in the letter he addressed to Louis the Fourteenth on the eve of his final departure from his dominions is interesting. After expressing his grateful sense of the kindness he and his family had experienced from that monarch, he says, It is with all possible earnestness that I entreat of your majesty a continuation of it, for me and the queen my mother, the only person who is left, of all who are dearest to me, and who deserves so much of me as the best of mothers. In writing to Louis the Fourteenth alone, the chevalier would have done little for his mother. He was aware that to render her asylum secure, he must pay no less attention to the untitled consort by whom the counsels of the aged monarch of France were influenced, and with equal earnestness, recommended her to the friendship of Madame de Maintenon in the following elegant billet, which implies more than appears on the surface in the way of compliment. February 19th, 1713. Little satisfied, madam, with the letter I have written to the king, in which I have but faintly expressed my sentiments towards him, where can I better address myself than to you, with a request that you would supply for me everything wherein I have failed? I ventured to rely on the kindness of your heart, and the friendship you have always had for the queen and me, to ask a continuation of it for us both. Permit me to assure you, valueless though it be, of mine, as well as of the high esteem and gratitude I bear you, madam, to whom, after the king, I believe it to be entirely due." Madame de Maintenon was so well pleased with this mark of attention that the next time she saw Queen Mary Beatrice, 
although she made no remark on the letter addressed to herself she set her majesty's heart at rest as to the impression produced by that which he had sent to louis the fourteenth by saying the king your son madam has combined in writing to his majesty that is the king of france the elegance of an academician the tenderness of a son and the dignity of a king the royal mother who had been sent copies of these letters by her son could not refrain from reading them in the pride of her heart to the community at chalot the abbess and her nuns extolled them to the skies and begged her majesty to allow them to be transcribed and placed among the archives of their house mary beatrice expressed some reluctance to do so observing that in the present critical position of her son's affairs it might be attended with injurious consequences if letters so strictly private found their way into print she added significantly that she had been much annoyed at seeing some things published in the dutch gazette not being able in any manner to imagine how the information was obtained this was certainly throwing out a delicate hint that her confidence had not been held sacred by some of the members of that community nevertheless she was persuaded to allow copies of her son's letters both to the king of france and madame de maintenon to be taken these have been so carefully preserved that they have survived the dissolution of the convent mary beatrice spent the residue of this melancholy winter the first she had passed without her children at saint germain her only comfort was hearing from her son that he had been honorably and affectionately received at the court of lorraine by the duke and duchess who were both related to him the duchess of lorraine being the daughter of the late duke of orleans by elizabeth charlotte of bavaria inherited a portion of the stuart blood through her descent from james i and took the most lively interest in her exiled kinsman and did everything in her power to render his sojourn at bar le duc agreeable mary beatrice writes to her friend the abbess of chalot on the twentieth of march a letter commencing with excuses for being an indifferent correspondent because the frequent and long letters she wrote to her son took up all her time her majesty had been making a small but acceptable present to one of the nuns for she says i am glad sister m gabrielle found the tea good but surely that trifling gift did not merit so eloquent a letter of thanks mary beatrice describes her own health to be better than usual expresses herself well pleased with the general bulletin lady strickland had brought of the health of the convent and then says the king my son continues well at bar where the duke of lorraine shows him all sorts of civilities i recommend him earnestly to your prayers my dear mother and to those of your dear daughters he requires patience courage and prudence and above all that god should confirm him in the faith and give him grace never to succumb to the temptations with which he will be assailed by his enemies visible and invisible her majesty then recommends her aged protector louis the fourteenth to the prayers of the sisters of chalot i hope continues she that god will long preserve him to us and that he may enjoy himself the peace he gives to others and which we hope will be signed in this present month of march i desire it with all my heart for the sake of others rather than for myself although it is possible that in time my son may benefit by it meanwhile i leave him and myself also in the hands of god to the end that he may do with us all that pleases him but in whatever state i may find myself be assured my dear mother that i shall be always and with all my heart yours marie r endorsed for my dear mother seventeen thirteen before the proclamation of the peace of utrecht mary beatrice sought the welcome repose of her favorite retreat at chalot the queen of england says the diary of that convent came here on the fifth of may seventeen thirteen she arrived at four o'clock in the afternoon and testified much joy at finding herself at chalot once more she asked our mother the news of the house and inquired particularly after all the sisters while they were preparing her majesty's table she came into the antechamber herself to speak to the two domestic sisters claire antoinette and j m who were accustomed to serve her the next day being very cold she congratulated herself on having come as she did 
for they would never have permitted her to leave saint germain in such weather lest it should make her ill and she repeated many times that she was surprised at finding herself in such good health as she had been for the last six months considering all she had suffered on the sunday after her arrival her majesty said she had prayed to god that he would make her feel his consolations so that she might say with the royal prophet in the multitude of sorrows that i had in my heart thy comforts have refreshed my soul but that added she is what i have not experienced the lord does not make me taste his sweetness mary beatrice told the nuns that since the departure of her son she had no one to whom she could open her heart a deprivation which she had felt so peculiarly hard and yet added she in losing the persons to whom one is accustomed to unburden our hearts we lose also some opportunities of displeasing god by our complaints and acquire the power of passing some days without speaking of those subjects that excite painful emotions this was indeed a point of christian philosophy to which few have been able to attain it must be owned that mary beatrice strove to improve the uses of adversity to the end for which they were designed by him who chastens those he loves the moment at length arrived long dreaded by the sympathizing community of chalot when the abbess was compelled to tell their afflicted guest that a solemn te deum was appointed to be sung in their church as well as all others throughout france on the day of the ascension on account of the peace that peace which had been purchased by the sacrifice of her son and had poured the last vial of wrath on her devoted head by driving him from saint germain and depriving him of the nominal title of which he had hitherto been complimented by the monarchs of france and spain the intimation regarding the te deum was received by mary beatrice without comment she knew that it was a matter in which the abbess had no choice and she endeavoured to relieve her embarrassment by turning the conversation her majesty said afterwards that a printed copy of the treaty had been sent to her but she had not yet had time to read it as it was so bulky a document and she had told lady middleton to open it who had looked for what concerned her and made no further search on the evening of the twenty eighth the queen asked the nun who waited on her if she had seen the paper that was on her chimney-piece i have not had the courage to look at it was the reply ah well said the queen then i must for you and raising herself in the bed where she was resting her exhausted frame she put on her spectacles and began to read it aloud it was a copy of the treaty when her majesty came to the fourth and fifth articles which stated that to ensure forever the peace and repose of europe and of england the king of france recognized for himself and his successors the protestant line of hanover and engaged that he who has taken the title of king of great britain shall remain no longer in france etc etc she paused and said with a sigh the king of france knows the truth whether my son is unjustly styled king or not i am sure he is more grieved at this than we can be the nun in waiting remained speechless with consternation at what she heard and the queen resumed hard necessity has no law the king of france had no power to act otherwise for the english would not have made peace on any other condition god will take care of us in him we repose our destinies she added that the king her son had sent word to her that his hope was in god who would not forsake him when every other power abandoned him the next morning she maintained her equanimity and even joined in the grace chant before dinner the nun who was present when she read the treaty on the preceding evening drew near and said madam i am astonished at the grace god has given you in enabling you to appear tranquil for my part i was struck with such consternation at what i heard that i could not sleep was it not so with you no i assure you said the queen i have committed everything to god he knows better what is good for us than we do ourselves she ate as usual and manifested no discomposure even when her ladies came on the following day and told her of the general rejoicings that were made in england for the peace a few days afterwards mary beatrice told the nuns 
that her son had sent a protest to the plenipotentiaries at utrecht against the articles of the treaty as regarded england and had asserted his title to that crown which had been retorted by the cabinet of st james's addressing an atrocious libel to the same congress complaining that an impostor like the pretender was permitted to remain so near at bar le duc the mother of this disinherited prince related this with emotion but without anger the sympathizing community said all they could to console her telling her the cause of her son was in the hands of god who would they hoped soon restore him to the throne of his forefathers if it be god's good pleasure to do so may his will be accomplished replied the queen she said that she had received an address from edinburgh professing the faithful attachment of the scotch to the house of stuart that both scotland and ireland were well disposed but in want of a leader when mary beatrice found that the allied powers had agreed to compensate the elector of bavaria for the loss of a part of his german territories by making him king of sardinia while the duke of savoy was in his turn to receive more than an equivalent for his sardinian province by the acquisition of the crown of sicily she said with a sigh thus we find that every one recovers his goods in one shape or other at this peace but nothing is done for us yet my god added she raising her eyes to heaven it is your will that it should be so and what you will must always be right being informed subsequently that the duke of savoy was about to embark to take possession of his new kingdom of sicily she said those who have kingdoms lose them and those who had not acquired them through this peace but god rules everything and must be adored in all his decrees the duchess of savoy king james's cousin had written to her in terms expressive of much affection and esteem on which mary beatrice observed that she was very grateful for her regard but she could not have the pleasure of recognizing the duke of savoy as king of sicily because her son had protested against everything that was done at the treaty of utrecht this was indeed retaining the tone of a crowned head when all that could give importance to that dignity was gone one day after the peace of utrecht had sensibly diminished the hopes that had been fondly cherished by the widowed queen of james the second of seeing her son established on the throne of england the princess of conti who was an illegitimate daughter of louis the fourteenth paid her a formal state visit at chalot accompanied by her three daughters mary beatrice with the delicate tact that was natural to her always caused all the fautils to be removed from her reception room whenever she expected any of the princesses who were not privileged to occupy those sorts of seats in her presence the three young ladies as they were leaving the room observing to one another on the absence of the fautils scornfully exclaimed as if imputing it to the destitution of the royal exile what a fine instance of economy but they cannot be ignorant of our mother's rank what will people say of this mary beatrice who overheard their impertinence replied with quiet dignity they will say that i am a poor queen and that this is your way of telling me that i have fallen from my proper rank when the duchess dowager of orlan came to visit mary beatrice she tenderly embraced her and told her how much charmed the duke of lorraine and her daughter were with the chevalier de st george and that they were delighted at having him with them mary beatrice was sensibly gratified at this communication and begged madame to convey her thanks to their highnesses for their goodness to her son not having she said words sufficiently eloquent to express her full sense of it herself the chevalier had found it expedient to leave bar for a temporary visit to Luneville, where everything was however arranged for his comfort through the friendship of the duke and duchess of lorraine his only real trouble at this time was his pecuniary destitution and this caused his mother much greater uneasiness than it did him so self-denying was mary beatrice in all her personal expenses that although she suffered much inconvenience when at chalot from writing on an ornamental escrutoire faced with plates of china she could not be persuaded to purchase a proper writing table even of the cheapest materials and form her ladies one day said to her madam you are not of the same disposition as other princesses 
who before they had been inconvenienced by their writing tables as you have been by this would have changed them a dozen times they would have had the means of gratifying their tastes then rejoined her majesty i have not the little that can be called mine belongs to the poor the kind-hearted duchess of lauzun to whom this conversation was repeated sent the queen a new writing-table for a present but no mary beatrice would not accept the friendly offering she was the widow of a king of england the mother of a prince who claimed the crown of that realm and dowerless exile as she was she would not degrade the national honour of the proud land over which she had reigned by allowing any of the ladies of france to minister to her wants not that she conveyed her refusal in terms calculated to offend madame de lauzun she thanked her courteously but said the table was too low and she was about to purchase one for which she would give proper directions mary beatrice found herself at last compelled to buy a writing-table in order to evade the necessity of accepting the present of the duchess of lauzun it cost the mighty sum of five and forty livres less than eight and thirty shillings and even this outlay occasioned the unfortunate queen a pang when she thought of the starving families at st germain and she asked the nuns whether she ought to give so much money as five and forty livres for a writing table the nuns replied with much simplicity that indeed they seldom gave tradesmen as much as they asked for their goods but they thought that the table was worth the price named her majesty declared that she had no intention to cheapen the article ordered my lady privy purse to pay for it directly and to give a proper recompense to the porter who had brought it poor mary beatrice she must have been more than woman if memories of that splendour that once surrounded her at whitehall rose not before her mental vision on this occasion while hesitating whether she ought to allow herself the indulgence of such an escrutoire as five and forty francs could purchase it would have looked strangely that same piece of furniture in her apartment there beside the costly cabinets and silver filigree tables of italian workmanship which john evelyn admired so greatly and when he saw them decorating the chamber of her royal stepdaughter queen mary thought good conscientious gentlemen that they ought in common honesty to have been returned to their lawful owner end of section nine section ten of the lives of the queens of england volume ten by agnes and elizabeth strickland this librivox recording is in the public domain mary beatrice of modena chapter eleven part three the duke and duchess of berwick and the duchess of lauzun came one day to visit her majesty at chalot and were beginning to devise many alterations and additions for the improvement of her apartments there which were in truth in great need of renovation she listened to everything with a playful smile and then said when my dower shall be paid i may be able to avail myself of some of your suggestions all i have power to do in the meantime is to follow your advice by changing the damask bed into the place where the velvet one now stands which fills up the small chamber too much the chair in which her majesty was sometimes carried up into the tribune or gallery which she occupied in the chapel had become so shabby and out of repair that the nuns and her ladies pressed her to have a new one made she refused at first on account of the expense but at last yielded to their persuasions she ordered that it should be like a chair in the infirmary but a little larger and yet not too large to be carried through the door of the little alley that led to the infirmary for she was constant in her visits to the sick whether she was able to walk or not and at this period in consequence of her great debility she was carried by her attendants in a chair she wished the height from the ground to the top of the back to be five feet like her chair of state at st germain and then it should be covered with silk called gros de tours which she thought would be a cheap and suitable material but when she heard that it was ten livres that is to say eight and four pence an l which would make the chair cost altogether two hundred livres little more than eight pounds she exclaimed that she would not have such a sum expended for that purpose lady strickland recommended camelot a thick watered silk 
with some mixture of wool as more suitable for the cover of the chair and the queen told her to bring her patterns with the price but as she found it would cost fourteen livres more than the other she decided on having the gross de tours of such serious importance had circumstances rendered that trivial saving to a princess who had once shared the british throne and whose generous heart reluctantly abstracted this small indulgence for herself from the relief she accorded from her narrow income to the ruined emigrants at saint germain madame said one of the sisters of chalot you put us in mind of saint thomas of villeneuve who disputed with his shoemaker about the price of his shoes and a few days afterwards gave one of the shoemaker's daughters three hundred reals to enable her to marry for your majesty is parsimonious only to enable you to be munificent in your charities and your offerings at the altar the queen smiled and said to turn the conversation i certainly have no disputes about the price of my shoes but i would fain get them for as little cost as i can when i was in england i always had a new pair every week i never had more than two pair of new shoes in any week i had a new pair of gloves every day and i could not do with less if i changed them it was to the profit of my chambermaids Monsieur de Lauzun once used some exaggeration in speaking to the king, Louis the Fourteenth on the subject of my penury, when he said, Sire, she has scarcely shoes to her feet. This was going a little too far, but it is true, continued she playfully, that they have sewn these ribbons for the second time on my fine shoes. She laughed and showed the shoes as she spoke, adding, They cost me ten livres, i think that it is too much to pay for them but they will not charge less for me that is the way with the artisans my mother would never submit to an imposition she was both generous and magnificent but she did not like to be charged more than the just price for anything when however she had reason to think her tradespeople had been moderate in their charges she would give them out of her own pleasure something over and above the poor queen had cause at this time to apprehend that the cancer in her breast was going to break out again she was also troubled with difficulty of breathing and general debility dr wood whom her son sent to see her advised her majesty to quit chalot because he said the air was too sharp for her and he strenuously objected to the fasts and perpetual succession of devotional exercises practised in that house as injurious to her the abbess and sisterhood were displeased at the english physician's opinion intimated that monsieur oud had better attend to his own business and begged their royal guest to send for beaulieu her own surgeon to prescribe for her beaulieu contradicted all dr wood had said except on the subject of fasting to which he was always opposed as for the air of chalot he said it was nothing so keen as that of saint germain which was almost on a mountain and recommended her majesty to remain where she was mary beatrice said the chalot must be a healthy place for that luxurious princess catherine de medicis built a summer palace there for herself because she considered it the most healthy site near paris the countess of middleton observing with uneasiness that her royal mistress was sinking into ascetic habits told the nuns one day in a pet that the queen spent too much time in prayer at chalot that it was killing her and if the king of france knew the sort of life she led there he would come himself and take her away from them mary beatrice could not refrain from smiling when this was repeated to her by the offended sisters i do not think said she that the king of france would trouble himself about my prayers or that he is likely to interfere with my stay at chalot my ladies who like better to be at saint germain speak according to their own tastes and are thinking more for themselves than for me i doubt in wishing to return they may find pleasure in it but for me think you the life i lead at saint germain can be very agreeable when i am shut up alone in my cabinet every evening after supper till i go to bed writing three or four hours when i am here i write in the morning which is a relief to my eyes there all my time is spent among the miserable for of such alone is my society composed here i have at least cheerful company after my meals and if i have a moment of comfort in life it is here she might have added it is my city or refuge from the importunities and cares with which i am beset at saint germain 
it was again a year of scarcity almost of famine in france and mary beatrice found herself reluctantly compelled by the necessities of her own people as she called the british emigration to withdraw her subscriptions from the benevolent institutions in paris to which she had hitherto contributed feeling herself bound to bestow all she had to give to those who had the greatest claims on her one day an ecclesiastic who came from saint germain to see her told her that every one there was starving on account of the dearness of provisions the intelligence made her very sad she could not sleep that night she said for thinking of it and when she slumbered a little towards morning she awoke with a sensation as if her heart were pierced with a pointed cross it was at this distressing period that the old bishop of condon de matignon who was going to marseilles came to solicit the unfortunate queen to send an offering to the shrine of the immaculate virgin there nothing could be more unseasonable than such a request mary beatrice replied that in truth she had nothing to send and was sorely vexed by his importunity she told the community in the evening of the vexatious application that had been made to her by the aged bishop and the impossibility of her complying with his request since all the profusion of costly jewels she once possessed two only remained one was the little ruby ring which the late king her dear lord and husband when duke of york had placed on her finger at the ratification of their nuptial contract the other was her coronation ring set with a fair large ruby sole relic of the glories of the day of her consecration as queen consort of england and these she could not part with the small diamond added mary beatrice which according to the customs of italy i received at the previous matrimonial solemnization at modena from the earl of peterborough i have sent to my son with my daughter's hair for which he had asked me the nuns endeavored to comfort her by telling her that when her son should be called to the throne of england she would be able to make offerings worthy of herself on all suitable occasions on the subject of the contributions that are frequently solicited of me said the queen i find myself much embarrassed for it appears unsuitable in me to give little and it is impossible for me ever to give much all i have belonging rather to the poor than to myself wisely and well did the royal widow decide in applying her might to the relief of god's destitute creatures rather than gratifying her pride by adding to the decorations of a shrine yet such is the weakness of human nature the force of early impressions and the manner in which even the strongest-minded persons are biased by the opinions of the world that she was deeply mortified at being unable to send the gift that was expected of her by the old bishop she at last expressed her regret that she had given her last diamond to her son instead of adding it to the coronal of the virgin of marseilles madam replied the nuns the use you made of the diamond in sending it to your son was perfectly lawful and these are times when saints themselves would sell the very ornaments of the altar to afford succor to the poor mary beatrice was much entreated to assist at the twofold nuptials of the prince de conti and mademoiselle de bourbon and the duc de bourbon with mademoiselle de conti by which a long feud between those illustrious houses would be reconciled she excused herself on account of her ill health and great afflictions when the princess dowager of conti came in person to invite her then the duc de lauzun came from louis the fourteenth to request her presence at versailles on that occasion and she declined for the same reason she had given to madame conti the duc de lauzun took the liberty of a tried and sincere friend to urge her to accept the invitation telling her that it was necessary that she should appear at versailles on that occasion lest the english ambassador should report her as wholly negligent and forgotten since the peace of utrecht which would prejudice the cause of her son in england the royal widow replied that he had reason on his side but for her part wasted as she was with a mortal malady and crushed with sorrow she could not think of casting a gloom over the joy of others at a bridal festival by her tears which perhaps she might be unable to restrain she therefore prayed him to make her apologies and to represent her wasted form and depressed spirits and her utter unfitness to appear on that occasion 
Lauzun represented at Versailles the sickness and grief of the queen, and Madame Maintenon, to whom Her Majesty wrote to beg her to make her excuses to the King of France, replied in a consolatory tone of kindness, expressing the regrets of the king and his young relatives at her absence, and requesting her to pray for the happiness of the bridal party. Madame de Maintenon added, that she hoped to come to Chalot on the following Monday to see Her Majesty, but in the meantime she could not help informing her that she had learned that many of the English were passing over from London to Calais on purpose, as it was whispered, to come to Chalot to pay their respects to Her Majesty, and to pass on to Bar to see her son. This flattering news was a cordial to the mother of the disinherited representative of the regal line of Stuart, him whom his visionary partisans in England fondly called the King Over the Water. The Peace of Utrecht had, indeed, driven him from the French dominions, and limited his title there to the simple style of the Chevalier St. George, but that very truly would afford ready means of communication between him and those ardent friends who had sworn fealty to him in their hearts, and were ready, like the old cavaliers, who had fought for his grandfather and his uncle, to peril life and limb for his sake. He was remembered in England, and she, his mother, was not forgotten in the land of which she still called herself the queen, though four and twenty years had passed away since she had left its shores, on a stormy winter's night, with that son. Heaven's dearest but most fatal gift to her, then a sleeping infant in her arms. Now he had been driven from her, and for his sake she kept her court in widowed loneliness at Saint-Germain, as a center and rallying point for his friends, and struggled with the sharp and deadly malady that was sapping her existence. Sometime in the month of July, 1713, a fat English merchant, a member of the Society of Friends, whom the worthy sister of Chalot, in her simplicity of heart, calls a trembler or coquere by profession, came to the convent and craved an audience of the widow of his late sovereign, James II. Mary Beatrice, who was always accessible to the English, admitted him without any hesitation. Before he entered her presence, the Quaker gave his hat to a footman, and thus discreetly avoided compromising his principles by taking it off, or appearing to treat the fallen queen with disrespect by wearing it before her. As soon as he saw Her Majesty, he said to her, Art thou the Queen of England? She answered in the affirmative. Well then, said he, I am come to tell thee that thy son will return to England. I am now going to bar on purpose to tell him so. But how know you this? demanded the queen. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, replied the Quaker, showing her a thick pamphlet of his visions printed in London. When will the event of which you tell me come to pass? inquired her majesty. The Quaker would not commit himself by naming any precise time for the fulfillment of his visions, but said, If he had not been convinced of the truth of his predictions, he would never have put himself to the trouble and expense of a journey from London to Bar. The Queen laughed heartily when she related the particulars of this interview to her friends. The Holy Sisters of Chalot, not considering that three clever pinches would have transformed this Quaker's broad-brimmed beaver into the orthodox cocked hat of an abbe of their own church, regarded a Jacobite in drab as a very formidable personage. They protested that he ought to be shut up and treated as a lunatic, and were sure he intended to make some attempt on the life of the king. The reply of Mary Deste proved that she was better acquainted with the tenets of the Society of Friends, and entertained a favorable opinion of their practice. My son has no cause for alarm, said she. These poor people are not wicked, they love the late king very much, and they are so highly esteemed in England for their probity, that they are exempted from the oaths which others are compelled to take. They never overreach others in their merchandise, and they have adopted for their maxim the words of our Lord, when he bids us be meek and lowly in heart, yet they are not baptized. In England all sorts of religions are permitted, pursued the queen. The late king said all these varying sects had had one point of negative union, which was to oppose the authority of the pope. My lord was convinced that he ought not to do violence to the conscience of anyone on the subject of religion. They had been persuaded in England, nevertheless, 
that his majesty had made a league with the king of france to force them to adopt his religion yet when that king drove out the huguenots they were given refuge in england as well as in holland where they rendered us odious as was seen about the time of the birth of the king my son when they conjured up false reports against us continued she in the bitterness of her heart imputing to the harmless refugees whom james had sheltered from the persecutions of his more bigoted neighbor the calumnies with which his nearest and dearest ties of kindred had endeavored to stigmatize the birth of the unfortunate prince of wales me they have accused of things of which i never thought pursued the fallen queen as if i had been as great a deceiver as themselves they have attributed to me crimes of which i am assuredly incapable of imposing a spurious child and committing perjuries others who love me have imputed to me virtues which i do not possess but god will be my judge the nuns endeavored to soothe her by saying they hoped she would see their religion flourish when her son returned in triumph to take possession of his throne should my son return said the queen you will not see any alteration in the established religion the utmost he can do will be to shield the catholics from persecution he will be too prudent to attempt innovations meantime this beloved object of her maternal hopes and fears had been ordered to drink the waters of aix-la-chapelle but the princes of germany would not permit him passports he wrote a few days after to the queen and told her he had seen his enthusiastic quaker liegeman who had related to him his visions and coolly added i am not perhaps so great a prophet as daniel but i am as true a one the prince said he had laughed much at the absurdities of this person and that it must have appeared strange to him that he did not receive any present but added he i am not rich enough to have it in my power to make suitable gifts all i had to bestow on him were some medals i do not love either prophets or readers of horoscopes this trait of sound sense the prince derived from his royal mother whose mind revolted from everything of the sort the same evening after she had read her son's letter mary beatrice said that she could not endure any of those marvellous things neither revelations nor ecstasies madame molza on this spoke of an italian lady the mother of father signori who had lately died in the odor of sanctity who often fell into a trance in which she remained until she was roused by the voice of her confessor adding that her majesty's mother the duchess of modena was delighted to see her it is true replied the queen that my late mother took delight in seeing marvels and mysteries but for my part i cannot endure them and always avoid having anything to do with them on the eighteenth of july elizabeth charlotte duchess dowager of orlan came with her daughter the duchess of orlan to cheer the royal recluse with a friendly visit there was a great deal of kindness and good nature in elizabeth charlotte notwithstanding the vulgarity of her person and manners she had a sincere respect for the virtues and noble qualities of the widowed queen of james the second and although she was so nearly related to the parliamentary heir of the british crown the elector of hanover she expressed a lively interest in the welfare of the unfortunate chevalier de st george and when speaking of him to his mother always gave him the title of the king of england both she and her daughter-in-law told the queen again how much affection the duke and duchess of lorraine expressed for him and how greatly they delighted in his company the queen listened for some time to them before she could command utterance at last she said the duke of lorraine has compassion on my son he has had from his own experience but too much reason to feel for those who are deprived of their rank and possessions the following animated song was composed at this period and sung at the secret meetings of the convivial jacobite gentry in allusion to the friendship experienced by the son of mary beatrice from the court of lorraine all these poetical lyrics found their way to the convent of chalot though we presume not to insinuate that they were ever hummed by the holy sisters at the hour of recreation song tune over the hills and far away bring in the bowl i'll toast you a health to one that has neither land nor wealth the bonniest lad that e'er you saw is over the hills and far awa 
over the hills and over the dales no lasting peace till he prevails pull up my lads with a loud huzza a health to him that's far awa by france by rome likewise by spain by all who forsook but duke lorraine the next remove appears most plain will be to bring him back again the bonniest lad that e'er you saw is over the hills and far awa he knew no harm he knew no guilt no laws had broke no blood had spilt if rogues his father did betray what's that to him that's far away over the hills and far awa beyond these hills and far awa the wind may change and fairly blah and blow him back that's blown awa the feverish hopes which the inspirations of poetry and romance continued to feed in the bosom of the mother of the unfortunate chevalier de st george doomed her to many a pang which might otherwise have been spared mary beatrice received so many visits one day during her abode at chalot that she was greatly fatigued and said she would see no one else but at six o'clock in the evening monsieur de torcy arrived as he was the prime minister of france he was of course admitted the interview was strictly private on taking his leave of the royal widow he said her virtues were admirable but her misfortunes were very great the king her son might be restored but it would not be yet at supper the queen which was unusual was flushed and agitated the nuns took the liberty of saying to her they feared monsieur de torcy had brought her bad news it is nothing more than i already knew replied the queen god be blessed for all his holy will be done she ate little at supper and went to prayers without saying what afflicted her she had a restless night and the next day she was very much depressed they pressed her to take her chocolate and at last to silence the importunities of her ladies she did the same morning she received a letter from mr dickinson the treasurer of her household to show her that he could not send her any money this seemed to augment her trouble however she performed all her devotional exercises as usual but was so weak and exhausted that she could not descend the stairs without extreme difficulty the nuns entreated her to declare the cause of her affliction she confessed that she had not been able to sleep madam said they it must be something that your majesty has heard from monsieur de torcy which has distressed you so much the heart of that minister must be very hard and pitiless it is no fault of monsieur de torcy replied the queen he has a very good heart and has always treated us well the next day in the evening at the recreation she revealed the cause of her vexation to the community when she sent the london gazette to her confessor she said that she had seen in it that both houses of parliament had united in demanding of the princess of denmark that is queen anne not to permit the pretender it is thus said mary beatrice they called the king to be so near their shores and the princess had replied that she had already sent a remonstrance to the duke of lorraine and would again which might perhaps induce him to send him out of his dominions but it was out of her power to force him to do so as he was too far from the sea to fear the fleets of england it was insinuated that the duke of lorraine would not have dared to receive the prince without the consent of anne and that he was waiting there to take advantage of a change of popular feeling we are continued the exiled queen in the hands of god why then should we be cast down i confess that this news disturbed me very much yesterday so much so that i did not wish to speak on the subject i said to myself why should i afflict these poor girls who are about me i ought to keep my trouble to myself but seeing the news had been made public i can no longer hide it phrenologists would say after looking at the contour of this queen's lofty and somewhat elongated head that the organs of caution and secretiveness were wholly absent her conduct through life proves that she was deficient in these faculties she told everything that befell her she might have said with the psalmist i kept silence but it was pain and weariness to me at last the fire kindled and i spake it was generally at the hour of the evening recreation when the rigid rule of conventual discipline was relaxed and the sisters of chalot were permitted to converse or listen to discourse not strictly confined to religious subjects 
that the royal guest gave vent to her feelings by discussing with the sympathizing circle her hopes and fears on the subject of her son or advert to the trials of her past life and the consolation she derived from religion with impassioned eloquence the promises of god in the psalms that he would protect the widow and the orphan were frequently mentioned by her one day the duke of berwick came to visit her and bring her english news in the evening she told the community that both houses of parliament had moved an address to queen anne that she should write to the allies not to suffer the pretender to be so near to england in the course of the debate an old gentleman of eighty years old a member of the house of commons exclaimed take care what you do i was a young man in the time when cromwell in like manner urged the neighboring states to drive away him whom they only called charles stuart this bold hint gave a turn to the tone of the debate which then became sufficiently animated and it was found that the pretender as they call her son had a strong party to speak for him even in that house the nuns told their royal friend that they hoped this good news would reach the king her son before he heard of the endeavor to deprive him of his refuge with the duke of lorraine my son is not easily moved by these sort of things replied mary beatrice he cares only about the agitation that is excited against him the prince was not quite so stoical in this respect his valet de chambre saint paul who had been delayed on his journey brought him the intelligence of the vote of the british parliament on st james's day he wrote to his mother that he had received a fine bouquet but through god's grace he had not been much disturbed by it mary beatrice wrote to him in reply that he had one subject of consolation that the lord had dealt with him as with those he loved for such had their trials in this life a little variation in the monotony of the convent was caused by the arrival of an artist named gobert with a portrait of the chevalier de st george which he had been painting for the queen at bar her majesty was much pleased with it but her ladies and the nuns did not think it quite handsome enough to be considered a successful likeness the chevalier de st george had frequently asked his mother to give him her portrait in her widow's dress and hitherto in vain a spice of feminine weakness lingered in her heart aware how strangely changed she was by time sickness and sorrow since the days when Lely painted york's lovely duchess among the dark-eyed beauties of charles the second's court she refused to allow her likeness to be taken in the decline of life she playfully explained her reluctance to sit again by saying that cardinal bellarmine had refused his portrait to his friends because an old man was too ugly for a picture. But when her son wrote to her from Bar to repeat his request, she said, she could not refuse him anything that might be a solace to him during their separation, and as it would be more convenient for her to have it done at Chalot than at Saint-Germain, she would send for Gobert, the same artist that had painted his portrait, and sit for him. The abbess and nuns then joined in petitioning her to allow a copy to be made for them, but on this she at first put a decided negative. Gobert came the next day to begin the picture, but it was not without great difficulty that she could be persuaded even then to let him take the outline of her head and the dimensions, for that which was to be placed in the tribune with those of her daughter and her son. At last she said, she would be painted in the character and costume of that royal british saint the empress helena showing the cross that she would have her son painted as edward the confessor drawing in her own mind a flattering inference for her son from the resemblance between his present lot and the early history of that once expatriated prince of the elder line of england and fondly imagined that the chevalier would one day be called like him to the throne of alfred mary beatrice said the late princess her daughter should also be painted as a royal english saint a blank is left in the manuscript for the name but in all probability margaret atheling queen of scotland was the person intended her son wrote to beg her to let him have two copies of her portrait one for the duke and duchess of lorraine and another for the princess of vaudemont who had been very kind to him he called a princess of vaudemont an amiable saint and said 
that his greatest comfort was talking with her of his mother and the late princess, his sister. Mary Beatrice was very perverse about her portrait, childishly so, for she ought not to have hesitated for a moment to oblige the friends who had given that asylum to her son, which the kings of France and Spain were unable to bestow. Such, however, are the weaknesses of human vanity. She wrote to her son, that she had already refused her portrait to the community of Chalot, and what she denied to them, she would not grant to others. To which the chevalier replied, that he thought it was very hard for her to deny such a trifle to the good nuns, and that she ought to oblige them, and his friends at the court of Lorraine as well. She then reluctantly conceded the point. When the painter came the next time, the queen was at her toilette, and before she was ready to take her sitting, the Duchess of Orléans came to pay her a visit, and being admitted, remained with her till dinner time. She told her majesty that she thought her looking ill, much altered for the worse in appearance. This remark did not decrease the poor queen's reluctance to go through the business of sitting for her portrait. She took her dinner at half-past one, and appeared much fatigued and out of spirits, saying, she was very sorry she had consented to have her portrait taken. Yet when she found Gobert was waiting, her natural kindness of heart caused her to receive him very graciously. She allowed him to place her in her fautil in the proper attitude, and gave him a long sitting. In the evening, her majesty, with three of her ladies, went to take the air in the Bois de Boulogne. They all set off in the queen's coach, but the royal owner left Lady Middleton and Lady Sophia Buckley in possession of that vehicle, while she walked on with Madame Molza, and they took a solitary ramble for three hours in the forest glades together. She returned refreshed and in better spirits from that little excursion. End of section 10. Section 11 of The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 10, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary Beatrice of Modena, Chapter 11, Part 4. On another occasion, when Mary Beatrice and her ladies had been taking an incognito walk in the Bois de Boulogne, when they came to the ferry, her majesty had a great wish to cross the river in the ferry boat, but her ladies being afraid, they all crossed the Pont Royal, and returned through the Faubourg of Saint-Germain. There the queen had betrayed her incognito by saluting the tourier of the convent of the visitation in that quarter, who, although she was on foot, could not help recognizing her, even if her coach had not been following, her person being well known to all the religieuses of Paris. Mary Beatrice, on her return to Chalot, was very merry, and related all the adventures of her walk to the community. Her majesty walked as far as Longchamp, on one of these incognito expeditions, and visited, by way of recreation, a religious house there. The abbess offered her a collation, which she declined, but partook of some macaroons and fruit, which were handed about in baskets. Mary Beatrice attended the Vespers in their chapel, and was so much delighted with the beautiful singing, led by the abbess, whose voice was one of the finest in France, that she remained for the last evening services, which made her and her ladies so late in their return, that the gates of Saint-Marie de Chalot were closed for the night, and the royal devotee and her noble attendants might have had some trouble in gaining admittance, if Père Gaillard had not, by a lucky chance, passed and found them waiting outside. The poor queen being without money at this time, in consequence of the unprincipled delays on the part of de Marais in the payment of her pension, was greatly troubled to meet the trifling current expenses even of her present economical way of life. Her coach and horses caused her some uneasiness, for the person at whose muse she had been accustomed to keep them sent word that he could not engage for their safety Every one was starving in the suburbs of Paris, and he was afraid they would be stolen from his place. The coachman told her majesty, he thought it would be desirable to keep the coach, at any rate, in the convent court, where it would be locked up within double doors. But this also involved a difficulty, for there was no covered place to put it under, and if exposed to the weather, it would soon fall to pieces. 
these petty cares of everyday occurrence about matters to which the attention of persons of royal birth is never directed were very harassing to her more so perhaps on the aggregate than the great reverse of fortune which had caused them there were times mary beatrice would say when she felt so downcast that the weight of a straw in addition to her other troubles appeared a burden and she dreaded everything our shiloh diary records that on the sixth of august a protestant gentleman whose name from the way it is written there it is impossible to decipher came to take leave of the queen before he returned to england having obtained the leave of her son whom he called his royal master so to do he was one of the saint germain protestants who had attended the prince to lorraine and he told the queen that he and all of his religion were perfectly satisfied with the liberality of their treatment the chevalier had taken a protestant chaplain a regular minister of the church of england with him for the sake of his followers of the reformed religion the earl of middleton being the only roman catholic in his retinue on the twelfth of august mary beatrice dined early that she might give gobert the final sitting for her portrait she told him that he was on no account to make any copies of it which he confessed that many persons had been desirous of obtaining of him the princess de conde who always treated mary beatrice with scrupulous attention came to visit her in the convent that afternoon and told her that she had sent a gentleman to bar purposely to announce the recent marriages of her children to her majesty's son but that lord middleton had warned her envoy that he must not address him by the title of majesty as his incognito was very strict and this had disconcerted the gentleman so much that he did not know what to say however the prince had soon put him at his ease by the frankness of his reception and had made him sit down to dinner with him it is thus sighed the widow of james the second that we have to play the parts of the kings and queens of comedy or rather i should say of tragedy the princess of conde entreated her majesty to come and see her in her newly built palace the petit luxembourg which she had fitted up with extraordinary taste and magnificence the queen's ladies who were of course eager to escape for one day of pleasure from the weary monotony of the life they had led at chalot prevailed on their royal mistress to accept the princess's invitation and the following wednesday being the day appointed mary beatrice went for the first time since the death of her daughter to paris in her old state coach with the arms and royal liveries of a queen of england she and her ladies set out from chalot at three o'clock escorted by count molza who appears to have performed the duties of vice-chamberlain since the death of old robert strickland when her majesty arrived at the petit luxembourg mademoiselle de clermont the eldest daughter of conde came to receive and welcome her as she descended from her coach and conducted her into the apartment of madame la princesse who was on her bed mary beatrice begged her not to disturb herself by rising on her account but the princess insisted on doing the honors of her palace to her illustrious guest the princess's chamber being in the highest suite of apartments she requested her majesty to avoid the fatigue of going down so many stairs by descending in her machine a light fauteuil which by means of a pulley and cord would lower her in the course of a few minutes from the top of the house into the garden mary beatrice seated herself in this machine and took the cordon in her hand as directed but she afterwards acknowledged to her ladies that she felt a slight degree of trepidation when she found herself suspended so many feet from the ground however she performed her descent safely and was immediately ushered into the gorgeous chapel paved with mosaics and the walls and roof embellished with gold crystal and precious stones besides the most precious works of art interspersed with large mirrors that reflected and multiplied the glittering show in all directions mary beatrice said that it would take a full week before she should be able to divert her attention from such a variety of attractive objects sufficiently to compose her mind to prayer an observation characteristic of the wisdom of a devout christian who knew how far a wandering eye might lead the soul from god when the chapel had been duly admired the superb suite of state apartments that looked upon the gardens of the royal luxembourg were exhibited everything was arranged with equal taste and magnificence and though the fallen queen of england felt perhaps 
that there was a degree of ostentation in the manner in which madame la princesse displayed her wealth and grandeur she praised everything and appeared to take much pleasure in examining the paintings sculpture and articles of vertu with which she was surrounded she and her ladies were greatly charmed with the hangings of one of the state beds ornamented with festoons and bouquets of the most delicate flowers of cut paper the work of nuns which the princess herself had arranged on white satin with gold fringes when her majesty rose to take her leave she said she could not allow madame la princesse to take the trouble of attending her to her carriage it would be quite sufficient if mademoiselle de clermont accompanied her and was about to go down with that young lady but the princess de conde seating herself in her machine as she called the chaise volante was at the foot of the stairs first and stood in readiness to pay the ceremonial marks of respect due to the royal guest at her departure from this abode of luxury mary beatrice and her ladies proceeded to a very different place the great ursuline convent in the faubourg de saint jacques where she saw two of her young english ladies miss stafford and miss louisa plowden the youngest sister of king james's little pet mary plowden the queen says our shiloh diary had pity on la petite louison for so they called the youngest plowden who not seeing her mother in her majesty's train began to weep miss stafford was unhappy because she had been removed from the english benedictines where rule was less rigid than in this french house mary beatrice next visited the english benedictine monastery of saint jacques as she was expected all the world had collected to get a sight of la pauvraine d'angleterre so that when she alighted from her coach count molza who had the honor to give her the hand could not get her through the throng the abbot and his brethren stood at the gates to receive her but such was the pressure and excitement of the crowd that two of the ecclesiastics who were endeavoring to assist her majesty found themselves increasing her distress by stepping on the train of her long black mantle so that she could neither advance nor recede and was in some danger of suffocation at last through the assistance of the officer of the guard a passage was forced for her and her ladies she attended the evening service in one of the chapels and afterwards took her tea in the great chamber of assembly which was full of privileged spectators and finished with visiting another nunnery in that quarter having again to encounter fresh crowds of eager gazers in passing to her coach mary beatrice returned to chalot at eight in the evening much fatigued a general reconciliation had taken place at the time of the intermarriages between the conde bourbon and conti families among all the parties engaged in the late feuds except the duc de lauzun who positively refused to go to a grand entertainment of reunion given by one of the dowager princesses on this occasion at passy mary beatrice being the only person in the world who had any influence over his stormy temper endeavoured to persuade him to go he replied with some warmth that he would not and mentioned several causes of offence which justified him he thought in keeping up the quarrel you mean to say you will not oblige me observed the queen not oblige you madam exclaimed lauzun vehemently you know very well that if you were to tell me to walk up to the mouth of the cannon when it was going to fire i would do it i am not likely to put you to such a test said her majesty gravely i only ask you to dine with our friends at passy she carried her point early in august mary beatrice received a letter from her absent son telling her that he had received the precious gift she had sent him of the ring set with the diamond of her espousals and the hair of the princess his sister which he said he should keep as long as he lived he added and that troubled his anxious mother that he had been ordered by his physicians to the waters of plombieres for his health but he could not undertake the journey without twenty thousand livres i know not how i am to come by them observed mary beatrice to the nuns when she was reading her son's letter for their edification i have written to mr dickinson about it not knowing what else to do god will perhaps provide the royal widow was certainly right to place her trust in providence and not in her luckless treasurer and his exhausted funds 
it is impossible not to compassionate the case of this poor mr dickinson who was called upon by every one for money from the queen and her son to their famishing followers so far from obtaining any supply from saint germain her majesty received a heart-rending letter from her old almoner pere ranchy describing the destitution of every one there especially the poor irish many of whom he said must perish for want of food, not having had a sou amongst them for the last two months. Mary Beatrice, who was much in the same case, as regarded ready money, was penetrated with grief at being unable to assist them. For myself, said she, I have some remains of credit to procure the necessaries of life, but these poor people have not. She appeared very sad, and her only comfort was that a great many of her followers were beginning to take advantage of the peace to steal back to England. She told the community of Chalot that of 20,000 persons, of whom the emigration at first consisted, not more than 6,000 able-bodied men were left, that a great many had perished in the French armies, but the maintenance of their widows and children had fallen upon her. This had been provided out of her French pension. How often, said the unfortunate queen, have I bewailed with bitter tears the life I led in England? Her ladies, knowing how irreproachable her conduct had always been from her youth upwards, told her that she could have no cause for repentance. Yes, indeed, she said. I have, considering how little good I did when I had much in my power, especially in the way of charity, I see now that many things which I fancied necessary I might well have done without, and that I should have had more to bestow on others. I give now, in my adversity and poverty, double the sum in alms annually than I did when I had the revenues of a queen consort of England. Infinitely precious, doubtless, in the sight of God, were the self-sacrifices which enabled the fallen queen to minister to the wants of the numerous claimants of her bounty at Saint-Germain. It was literally, in her case, the division of the widow's might among those whose necessities she saw were greater than her own. The object of Père Roche's pathetic representations was to induce Mary Beatrice to make a personal appeal to Louis the Fourteenth on the subject of the unpunctual payment of her pension, no persuasions could prevail on her to do this on her own account, or even that of her son. Her pride and delicacy of mind alike revolted from assuming the tone of an importunate beggar. Her ladies, her counsellors, her ecclesiastics, the sisters of Chalot, all united in urging her to make the effort, telling her that the elector of Bavaria had made no scruple of complaining to his majesty of the inconvenience he had suffered from the procrastination of the officers of the exchequer in dispersing his pension, and that it had been paid regularly ever since. But, said Mary Beatrice, I shall never have the courage to do it. All in Saint-Germain will die of hunger in the meantime, if your majesty does not, was the reply. Greatly agitated, she retired to her closet, threw herself on her knees, and prayed long and earnestly for spiritual succor and strength. She was going that day, August 26th, to Marley, to see Louis the Fourteenth and Madame de Maintenon, before they went to Fontainebleau for the rest of the autumn. Madame de Maintenon had written to the exiled queen from a sickbed, requesting her to come and see her at Marley, for she was suffering very much from inflammation in the face had been bled, and dreaded the approaching removal to Fontainebleau, and all the courtly fatigues that awaited her there. The young princesses, she said, alluding to the brides of Bourbon and Condé, were charmed with the anticipation of their visit, but at her time of life, people felt differently. Mary Beatrice appeared much concerned when she read this letter, for she knew the writer was turned of eighty. She said, Madame de Maintenon had been a true friend to her, and she knew not what she should do if she were to lose her, adding, that she had reckoned on her good offices in speaking to the king for her. The day was intensely hot, and she was herself far from well, and as the hour for her journey approached, she became more and more restless and agitated. However, she composed herself by attending vespers, and after these were over, set off, attended only by Lady Sophia Buckley. 
she arrived at marley at five o'clock and found madame de maintenon in bed and very feeble while they were conversing tete-a-tete -tete, the king entered the chamber unattended mary beatrice who had not seen him for several months was struck with the alteration in his appearance for he was much broken regardless of the ceremonial restraints pertaining to her titular rank as a queen she obeyed the kindly impulse of her benevolence by hastening to draw a fauteuil for him with her own hand and perceiving it was not high enough she brought another cushion to raise it saying at the same time sire i know you are incommoded by sitting so low louis once the soul of gallantry now a feeble infirm old man tottering on the verge of the grave but still the most scrupulously regardful of all the courtesies due to ladies of every rank made a thousand apologies for the trouble her majesty had given herself on his account however madam said he you were so brisk in your movements you took me by surprise they told me you were dying mary beatrice smiled but had not the courage to avail herself of this opportunity of telling her adopted father that her sufferings had been more of the mind than the body then declaring the cause and appealing to his compassion she said afterwards that she talked of subjects the most indifferent in the world while her heart was ready to burst not daring to give vent to her feelings when the king went to take his evening walk or rather to show himself as usual on the promenade mary beatrice told madame de maintenon that she had a great desire to speak to the king on the subject of her pension as eight months had passed since she had received any portion of it and that in consequence every one at saint germain was dying of hunger that she came partly to represent this to his majesty but her courage had failed her though her heart was pierced with anguish at the sufferings of so many people whom she knew so well madame de maintenon appeared touched by this discourse and said she would not fail to mention it to the king who would be much concerned she added that she was however surprised to hear it as she had been told that her majesty had been paid the sum of fifty thousand livres the last time she came it is true replied the queen but that fifty thousand was the arrear of a previous seven months delay and was of course all anticipated the payment she now requested had been due for two months when the last instalment was dispersed and she ought to have received it then but it was too painful to her to press for it it is well known continued she sighing that i should not ask for it now were it not for those poor irish how much do you think was reserved for my use of the last fifty thousand livres less than a thousand crowns to put in my privy purse for necessary expenses of that sum the larger half went to the relief of urgent cases of distress when the poor queen had thus unburdened her mind she went to make her round of visits to the princes and princesses when she was passing through the salon where the great ladies had assembled to make their compliments to her lady sophia buckley told her that madame de beauvilliers and madame de remiremont were following her her majesty who had not observed them in the noble circle immediately turned back to speak to them with every mark of respect and gave them her hand to kiss she would not however appear as if she were assuming the state of a queen of france holding a court by sitting down but stood while she conversed with the ladies who expressed themselves charmed with her politeness to them one and all and the graciousness of her deportment when she visited the princesses she made a point of speaking courteously to their ladies so that she left an agreeable impression everywhere she went the queen says our shiloh chronicler did not return here till near ten o'clock as she had said she would be here at nine lady middleton and madame molza were waiting with us at the gate they were very uneasy because they feared that the queen who was not well when she went away had taken ill at marley it wanted about a quarter to ten when her majesty arrived she made great apologies for being so late and begged that the sisters who waited on her would go to bed but they entreated to be permitted to remain she would not herself go to bed till she had attended prayers in the tribune before she performed her private devotions in her own apartments lady sophia buckley was well pleased with this visit she said 
that all the ladies at the French court had been charmed with her majesty, that they had talked of her at supper, and declared, that no lady in France, since the queen mother, Anne of Austria, had afforded so perfect a model of dignity and politeness. Thus we see, in the midst of all her trials and poverty, Mary Beatrice had the singular good luck of maintaining, in that fastidious and fickle court, the favorable impression she had made at her first appearance there, in 1689, when Louis the Fourteenth had said of her, See what a queen ought to be! The French ladies had told Lady Sophia Buckley that they were always charmed with the Queen of England's visits to Fontainebleau. Her ladyship would have repeated more of the agreeable things that had been said of her royal mistress to the nuns, but Mary Beatrice, who always discouraged everything like flattery, interrupted her by saying gravely, The ladies here have much kindness for me, which was not the case in England, truth to tell, but I have lived since then to become wiser by my misfortunes. At the evening recreation, she said to the nuns, can you believe that I have returned, without having ventured to speak to the king on my business, but I hope what I have done will be the same as if I had, as I have spoken to Madame de Maintenon. The mind of the fallen queen misgave her, that she had committed herself, and she cried, But what shall I do if she should fail me? All would be lost then. But I am wrong, continued she, correcting herself. My God, it is in thee only that I should put my trust, thou art my stay. So pressing was the want of money, that Mary Beatrice was reduced to the painful necessity of taking up a sum to relieve the direful pressure of distress at this crisis. She found a merchant willing to accommodate her with a loan for three months, on the security of her French pension. It was a painful duty, she said, but if she waited till she touched what had been so long due to her, two-thirds of Saint-Germain would have perished. She was also very anxious about her son's health, and determined to supply him with the means of going to the waters of Plombières at any sacrifice. One little expense, which Mary Beatrice indulged herself in out of this loan, was to give a day of pleasure to some lowly individuals in her household, to whom so long a sojourn in a convent had probably been weary work. Our Shiloh diary records that on Tuesday, August 29th, the queen hired a coach for the fils de chambre of her ladies to go to Paris to see a young person of their own degree, take the novitiate habit of a sur domestique at the Ursuline convent, and in the afternoon to see the petite Luxembourg. The girls came back in raptures for the princess de Condé, hearing that they were in the family of the queen of England, had, out of respect to their royal mistress, ordered all the grand apartments to be thrown open to them, and even that they should be introduced into her own private apartment, where she was playing cards. The day Mary Beatrice was at Marley, she had called on the Duke de Berry, the grandson of Louis the Fourteenth, as etiquette required, but he was not at home. On the morrow, he sent a gentleman of his household to make his compliments to Her Majesty, and to express his regret that he was absent, hunting in the plains of Saint-Denis, when she did him the honor of calling, but that he should take an early opportunity of returning her visit. The queen, who had no wish for his company, told the equerry that she thanked his royal highness for his polite attention, which she considered all the same as if he had put himself to the trouble of coming. This, her majesty told the abbess, she had said, in the hope of being excused from his visit, as he was a prince for whose character she had no esteem. Nevertheless, added she, you will see that he will come. The following day, his royal highness made his appearance at the customary hour for formal calls, four o'clock. He came in state, and as he was the next in succession to the throne of France, after the infant Dauphin, etiquette required that the abbess of Chalot should pay him the respect of going with some of the community to receive him at the grate. She only took five or six of the sisters, doubtless the elders of the house, and her reception was not the most courteous in the world, for she begged him not to bring any of his followers into her house. His royal highness appeared a little surprised, and explained that his visit was to the Queen of England, and not to her reverence. 
However, the Holy Mother was resolute not to admit any of his train. He was, therefore, compelled to tell the Chevalier du Roy and three other nobles of high rank who were with him that they could not enter, at which they were much offended. The queen received him in the apartments belonging to the Princess Dowager of Condé, which were on the ground floor, to spare him the trouble, as she politely observed, of going upstairs but doubtless in the hope of being rid of his company the sooner. However, he seated himself by her on the canapé, and appeared in no hurry to depart. While he was conversing with the queen, the Duchess of Perth, wondering what had become of the lords of his retinue, went to inquire, and found them very malcontent, in consequence of the slight that had been put upon them, attributing their exclusion to the pride or over-nicety of the Queen of England. Lady Perth returned, and told her royal mistress in English, of this misunderstanding. Her majesty, who had never thought of such a thing, was much vexed, and when the Duke de Berry begged that she would permit his gentleman to enter, she said, Sir, it is not for me to give that order. The power rests with you, and I beseech you to use it. The gentlemen were then admitted, but chose to mark their displeasure, by remaining with the Princess de Condé, instead of entering her majesty's presence. I am sure, said Mary Beatrice, it was no fault of mine. She was greatly annoyed at the circumstance, trivial as it really was, but she felt the insecurity of her position in that court, and beheld in the Duke de Berry, the probable regent of France. The Queen's principal physician, Monsieur Garvan, came on the 13th of September, to try and persuade her to return to Saint-Germain, but she would not hear of it. She said she should write to her son, to prevent him from paying any attention to those who were pressing him to importune her on that subject. Nothing that any one else can say will make me do it, added she. But if my son asks me, I cannot refuse him. The Duchess Dowager of Orlan came to see Mary Beatrice in her retreat, and brought her a very kind letter from her daughter, the Duchess of Lorraine, expressing, the great satisfaction that both herself and her lord had experienced in the society of the Chevalier de St. George, whom she styled a most accomplished prince. The delighted mother could not refrain from reading this letter to the sisters of Chalot. She expressed her gratitude to the Duke and Duchess of Lorraine, and begged Madame the Duchess of Orléans to tell them that she regarded them as friends whom God had raised up for her and her son at their utmost need, when they looked in vain for any other succor. The Duchess of Roland said, Her daughter was greatly altered, which she attributed to the number of children she had had. Or rather, rejoined the Queen, by the grief of losing them, for, added she with great emotion, there is nothing so afflicting as the loss of children. Her Majesty, continues our recording nun, repeated this several times, and it appeared as if it were only by an effort of virtue that she refrained from speaking of the princess her daughter. That grief was too deep, too sacred to be named on every occasion. There was withal a delicacy of feeling in Mary Beatrice, which deterred her from wearing out sympathy by talking too much of her bereavement. When someone remarked in her presence, that people often love their grandchildren better than they had done their own children, she replied, When I shall have grandchildren, I hope my affection for them will not lead me to spoil them, but I am sure I shall not love them better than I love the king my son, or than I love my poor daughter. The affection of Mary Beatrice, for these her youngest children, was of so absorbing a nature as to render her apparently forgetful of her buried family in England, her three elder daughters, and her firstborn son, the infant Duke of Cambridge. If any one alluded to the loss of those children, which had been among the trials of the first years of her wedded life, she generally replied, that she acknowledged the wisdom and mercy of her heavenly father in that dispensation, as well as in all his other dealings with her, for now she felt an assurance of their eternal happiness, which she might not otherwise have done. Happy, she would add, are those mothers who bear for the Lord. End of section 11. Section 12 of The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 10, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary Beatrice of Modena, Chapter 11, Part 5. On the 16th of September, 1713, being the twelfth anniversary of King James's death, her anguish was renewed by the commemorative offices at which she had assisted in the tribune, where the hearts of the husband and daughter she had loved so fondly were enshrined. Yet she said, that in the midst of her grief she had consolation in the thought that they were both happy in the enjoyment of everlasting peace. She added, that she had often reflected with astonishment on the graciousness of God in preserving to her her son when he bereaved her of the princess, and that she was satisfied that he who is infinitely wise and good had done all in mercy. From these expressions and the general tone of her letters, it is certain that although in compliance with the customs, perhaps in obedience to the authority of the church of which she was a member, Mary Beatrice continued to the end of her life to pray for the repose of the souls of her husband and daughter. She believed that they had already entered into the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. The next day, Saturday, the 17th of September, Mary Beatrice received a packet of letters from her absent son, just after she had entered the chapel to attend Complins, but anxious as she was to hear from him, she would not open the envelope till the service was over. She read her letters while she was taking her tea. The same evening, the princess of Condé, who drank tea with her, showed her a print of the late princess, her daughter, which the painter Lapel had caused to be engraved. The queen looked at it, and repressing the tears with which the sight of those dearly loved features, now veiled forever in the darkness of death, called to her eyes, pursued her discourse on indifferent subjects. Eloquent as she generally was, when the name of that last and fairest of her buried hopes was mentioned, she could not speak of her then. Her heart was too full. She said, that she had a copy of Regal's portrait of Louis the Fourteenth made to send to her son, that portrait, she observed, had always struck her as a great resemblance of his majesty, only it was full thirty years younger than he was, even when she came into France, and he was very much changed and bent since then. She added, he perceives it himself, and says sometimes, formerly I was taller than some of the people about me, who are now taller than me. On the 26th of September, an ecclesiastic came from Saint-Germain to consult with the queen on the means to be taken for the relief of the destitute there, telling her that to his certain knowledge, several persons had passed 30 hours without food. Mary Beatrice was greatly afflicted and said, she was embarrassed to the last degree herself, not daring to importune the king of France, though her pension was several months in arrear, and her son was also without money. She was tantalized with promises from some of Queen Anne's ministers that her dowry should be paid. Secret engagements had been undoubtedly made between the sovereign and Louis the Fourteenth before the Peace of Utrecht, guaranteeing that provision for the widow of James the Second, and the Abbe Gautier had been sent to England to receive the first installment from Harley, the Lord Treasurer, but was put off from day to day. De Marais, the French Minister of Finance, made the promises of the British Minister, touching the payment of the dowry, an excuse for delaying the disbursement of her pension from his royal master. The distress of her followers roused the unfortunate queen once more from the quiescent state of endurance in which she was willing to remain, as regarded her own pecuniary difficulties. She wrote a heart-rending appeal to Madame de Maintenon. She received a letter in reply on Sunday, October 1st, while she was at dinner, in which that lady expressed great sympathy, saying, that her majesty's letter had filled her heart with pity, that she could not think of her situation without pain, and though she did everything in her power to avoid causing any to the king, she could not refrain from representing her distress to his majesty, and that he would speak himself to Monsieur de Marais on the subject. She said also, that he had sent to Monsieur de Torcy, requesting him to write to the Abbe Gautier, not, added the cautious diplomatiste, 
that i dare to solicit for your majesty anything that would be inconvenient to him but merely to testify my zeal for your interests this communication served to raise the spirits of the desolate widow and the good effects of the intervention of the powerful advocate she had succeeded in interesting in her favor appeared in the receipt of the payment of fifty thousand livres of the arrears due to her on her pension small as that sum really was reduced into english pounds it was as the cup of cold water to the fainting caravan in the desert and enabled the exiled queen to accord to many of the famishing emigrants at saint germain the means of dragging on the fever of life for a few months longer common honesty also demanded that she should make a small instalment to the convent of chalot on account of the large sum in which she stood indebted to them not only for a home but very often for food both for herself her ladies and their maids her majesty says the recording sister of chalot gave our mother very privately three thousand livres all in gold but entreated her not to let any one know that she had paid her anything no sooner indeed was it suspected much less known that the widowed consort of james the second had received any portion of her income than she was beset with clamorous demands from all her creditors and clients the irish in particular some readers will doubtless feel disposed to censure mary beatrice for expending money she could ill afford in the following manner the fete day of the abbess occurring while she was at chalot she could not avoid complying with the custom which prescribed that every person in the convent should make some present great or small to that lady for the decoration of her church mary beatrice was not only under great obligations to the house but considered it necessary to give according to her rank rather than her means as the widow of a king of england and bearing the title of queen she determined not to be outdone by any french lady on this occasion having privately got the assistant sister marie helene to measure the width of the choir she sent her careful privy purse lady strickland to paris to purchase the materials for a curtain called by our nun an apparament to hang up before it instead of a piece of tapestry lady strickland performed her commission it seems to admiration for she made a choice of a beautiful piece of red brocade flowered with gold and silver and edged with a splendid gold fringe with a rich heading sister marie helene who possessed the pen of a ready writer composed by the queen's desire some verses suitable to the occasion to accompany the present meantime the matter was kept as secret as anything could be in which three ladies were concerned till the important day arrived after the abbess had received all the other little offerings they were placed in the chamber of assembly and the queen was invited to come and look at them her majesty had something obliging to say of everything and when she had inspected all she bade sister marie helene bring her gift and present it to the abbess with the verses in her name it was quite a surprise and the whole community were eloquent in their admiration of the elegance and magnificence of the offering but the queen imposed silence not loving to hear her own praise the community wished to have the arms and initials of the royal donor emblazoned on the paramount but mary beatrice would not permit it saying that it would appear like vanity and ostentation and that she should consider it highly presumptuous to allow anything to her own glorification to be placed in a church cardinal galterio who had seen the chevalier de st george at the court of lorraine after his return from plombieres came to bring letters from him to his widowed mother and rejoiced her heart with good accounts of his health and recommendations of his conduct mary beatrice told the nuns that she had laughed and cried alternately at the sight of the cardinal who was her countryman because she had thought to see his face no more the coquer as our chalot chronicle designates the enthusiastic broad-brimmed jacobite before mentioned paid the queen a second visit about this time mary beatrice received him in the presence of her friend cardinal galtiero and behaved so graciously to him that he left her highly delighted with the interview the conference between so remarkable a trio as our italian queen a cardinal and a quaker must have been an amusing one 
Martin, the Haitian envoy at Paris, notices the Quaker's visit to the Chevalier de St. George in a letter to Robethon, the Hanoverian minister, in which he mentions the return to Paris of one of his friends, who had spent two months with the exiled prince at Bar, where he got much into his confidence, and spoke very favorably of him. The Chevalier himself told Martin's friend, that a Quaker, who was much spoken of in England at that time, came to Bar on purpose to see him, and when he entered the room, addressed him in these words, Good day, James. The Spirit desired me to come to thee, to tell thee, that thou shalt reign over us, and we all wish it. I come to tell thee, that if thou hast need of money, we will pay thee amongst us from three to four millions. The prince wanted to make him some present, but he would not take anything. The prince made him eat at his own table. Mary Beatrice would gladly have ended her days in the retirement of Chalot, but for the sake of her beloved son's interest, she was induced to return to Saint-Germain towards the end of November, to the great joy of her ladies, the Duchess of Perth, the Countess of Middleton, Lady Sophia Buckley, and Madame Molza, who, though they were zealous Roman Catholics, appear to have considered six months' conformity to conventual rules, rather too much of a good thing. Before the widowed queen quitted Chalot, one of the nuns congratulated her on the beneficial effects the waters of Plombieres had produced on the weekly constitution of the Chevalier de St. George, adding, that she should pray for the improvement of his health and the preservation of his life as the most important things to be desired for him. How can you say so? cried the queen. Is there no other good thing to be desired for my son? Madam, replied the nun, we know that on these depend his fortunes. Ah, my sister, said the royal mother, think not too much of his temporal good, but rather let us ask sanctification and constancy in his religion for my son, and the accomplishment of God's holy will, whatever it may be. With this strong feeling on her mind, Mary Beatrice ought not to have coveted the throne of a Protestant realm for her son. Such, however, are the inconstancies of maternal ambition. General reports were at that time prevalent that the Chevalier de St. George was about to comply with the earnest solicitations of his friends of the Church of England by abjuring that of Rome. The resignation of the Earl of Middleton, the only Roman Catholic in his train at Bar, appeared a preliminary to that step. Few could believe that he would hesitate to imitate the example of his great-grandfather, Henry of Navarre, when, under similar temptations, he had sacrificed his Protestantism for a crown. The unfortunate family of Stuart were, with one exception only, singularly deficient in the wisdom of this world. The Merry Monarch was the only man of his line, who possessed sufficient laxity of principle to adapt himself to the temper of the times in which he lived. The son of James the Second had not only been imbued by his parents with strong prejudices in favor of the faith in which he had been educated, but a feeling of spiritual romance induced him to cleave to it as a point of honor, the more vehemently, whenever he was assailed with representations of how much his profession was opposed to his worldly interests. Among the Shiloh records, a paper is preserved in the well-known hand of the widow of James the Second, enclosed in a letter to the abbess of Shalot, headed, Abstract of a letter from the king my son, written by him to me in English, the 30th of December, 1713. I doubt not that the reports, positive and circumstantial as they are, which are in circulation of my having changed my religion, have reached you, but you know me too well to be alarmed, and I can assure you that with the grace of God, you will sooner see me dead than out of the church. Under this, the royal mother has, with characteristic enthusiasm, written, For my part, my dear mother, I pray God that it may be so, and rest in firm reliance that God, in his mercy, will never abandon that dear son, whom he has given me, and of whom his divine providence has, up to the present time, taken such peculiar care. At Saint-Germain, January 26, 1714. Maria R. In the letter wherein the preceding abstract is enclosed, the Queen says, 
I have been delighted to see these lines written by my hand, and am well persuaded that they are imprinted on his heart. I have written to this dear son, that I threw myself on my knees after I had read them, and thank God with all my heart, that through his mercy both were inspired with the same sentiments, he in wishing rather to die, and I in desiring rather to see him dead than out of the church. The name of Bigot will, doubtless, be applied to Mary Beatrice by many readers of the above passage, and perhaps with justice, for confining exclusively to one peculiar section, a term which includes the righteous of every varying denomination of a great Christian family. The accidents of birth and education had made this princess a member of the Latin church, but if she had been born and brought up as a daughter of the Church of England, or any other Protestant community, there can be little doubt, but she would have been equally zealous and sincere in her profession, and no less ready to sacrifice temporal advantages for conscience' sake. The enthusiastic attachment of Mary Beatrice to her own religion prompted her to give as much publicity to her son's assurances on the subject of his determination to adhere to the Romish communion, as if it had been her great object to exclude him from the throne of England. Among Bothmar, the Hanoverian minister's papers, there is an intercepted letter headed thus in Robethon's hand. Paris, 31st of January, 1714, from the secretary of the pretender's mother to Lord Aylesbury, which ends with these words. Our friend at bar le duc remains firm in his persuasions as yet, though many efforts have been made to bring him over. It was a great comfort to his mother to find his firmness in that point by a letter under his own hand. We shall see what the darling hopes of a crown will do when proper steps are made towards it. The death of Queen Anne was almost hourly expected at that time. All Europe stood at gaze, awaiting with eager curiosity the proceedings of the rival claimants of the crown of Great Britain. That the prospects of the expatriated son of James the Second and Mary Beatrice were regarded at that crisis as flattering may be inferred from the encouragement given by the Emperor of Germany to the secret overtures for a matrimonial alliance between that prince and the archduchess, his sister. The favorable dispositions of the dying sovereign of Great Britain toward her disinherited brother were generally asserted, and it may, perhaps, be considered as symptomatic of the state of her mind at the approach of death that she was willing to accord the long-withheld provision of her royal father's widow. Early in the year 1714, Mary Beatrice received the first, last, and only installment from the British government, ever paid to her of the jointure settled upon her by the Parliament of England. Queen Anne, on the 23rd of December, 1713, signed the warrant authorizing the payment of £11,750 out of the £500,000 lately granted by Parliament for the liquidation of her own private debts. £50,000 per annum was the sum originally claimed by the exiled queen, but her necessities, and above all, her desire of entering into amicable relations with Queen Anne, for the sake of her son, induced her gladly to accept a first quarter's payment on the Lord Treasurer Harley's computation of the dower at £47,000. The acquittance she gave was simply signed, Marie Rain. This transaction was subsequently made one of the heads of Harley, Earl of Oxford's impeachment in the House of Lords, when, among other political offenses, he was accused. Of having by means of Matthew Pryor, the poet, held secret correspondence with Mary, consort to the late King James, and that he had also had frequent conferences with the Abbot Galtier, a popish priest, her emissary, to concert settling the yearly pension of the said £47,000 upon her, for life, under pretense of those letters patent, that he had advised Her Majesty, Queen Anne, to sign a warrant to himself, reciting the said grant of the late King James for payment thereof. To this accusation, the Earl of Oxford pleaded, that the consort of James the Second was legally entitled to receive the jointure, which had been secured to her by an act of Parliament, and guaranteed by the private articles of the Treaty of Ryswick, and the legality of her claims not being doubted by Her Majesty, 
Queen Anne's, counsel at law, he had considered it his duty to pay proper attention to it. And being a debt he had thought himself authorized to pay it out of the fund of five hundred thousand pounds, which had been provided for the liquidation of Her Majesty's debts. The arrears of the dower, for all the years that this unfortunate queen had been deprived of her provision, amounted to upwards of a million of sterling English money. Her urgent necessities rendered her glad to compound that claim, for the sake of touching the above eleven thousand seven hundred and fifty pounds in ready money. That sum enabled her to relieve the distresses of her unfortunate followers, who had been for many months perishing before her eyes of want. The Earl, or as he was entitled in that court, the Duke of Melfort, having returned to Saint-Germain, died there in the beginning of the year 1714, leaving his wife and family almost in a state of destitution. He was a man whose violent temper, defective judgment, and headlong zeal for the interests of the Church of Rome contributed to the ruin of his royal master and mistress, but the assertion that the exiled family regarded him in any other light than that of a faithful servant, is disproved by the affectionate manner in which the Chevalier de St. George recommended his family to the care and protection of Queen Mary Beatrice. The following inedited letter of condolence, addressed by that prince to Lady Melfort, which, through the courtesy of the present Duke de Melfort, is here for the first time, placed before the historical reader, must set that dispute at rest forever. Bar, February 3rd, 1714. The true sense I have of the late Duke de Melfort's long and faithful services makes me sincerely share with you in the loss both you and I have made of him. It is a sensible mortification to me not to be able to be of that comfort and support to you and your son and whole afflicted family, which you so justly deserve from me. All I could do was to recommend you all to the Queen's goodness and bounty, which I did before the Duke of Melfort's death, whose merit is too great ever to be forgotten by me, who desire nothing more than to have it in my power of showing you and your family how truly sensible I am of it, and the particular esteem and kindness I have for yourself. James R. For the Duchess of Melfort. In consequence of her son's recommendation, Her Majesty appointed the Duchess de Melfort as lady of the bedchamber, and one of her daughters, maid of honor. The same young lady, probably, who while in the service of the late Princess Louisa, was celebrated by Count Hamilton, by the name of Mademoiselle de Melfort, among the beauties of Saint-Germain. A melancholy change had come over these royal bowers since then, after the death of the princess, and the enforced absence of her brother. The sportive liar of their merry old poet, Chevalier Hamilton, was never strung again. His gay spirit was quenched at last, with sorrow, age, and penury. Towards the spring of 1714, Mary Beatrice was attacked with so severe an illness that she was given up by her physicians. She received the intimation with perfect calmness. Life had now nothing to attach her, except a longing desire to see her son. Louis the Fourteenth and Madame de Maintenon came to take leave of her, and testify much concern. They paid her great attention during the whole of her illness, from first to last. After she had received the last sacraments of her church, contrary to all human expectation, she revived and finally recovered. Her great patience, tranquility, and docility in sickness were supposed to be the reasons that her feeble frame had survived through illness that would have proved fatal to younger and more vigorous persons. So it is true that the race is not always to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. The queen's beloved friend, Angelique Priolo, was so dangerously ill at the same time, that her life was despaired of also, and she too recovered. The first letter written by Mary Beatrice during her convalescence, dated May 22nd, was to congratulate that lady on her amendment, and to express her regret that in consequence of bad weather, she was unable to come and see her, and recruit both mind and body by spending a few days at Chalot. It is very proper, she says, that I should come to testify in person the joy I feel in the new life that God has given you, and that I should give you some signs of that, which he has also restored to me, 
for no one could be nearer death than I have been without dying. I believe, however, that you have not been in less danger than I was, only you did not see it so plainly, for my head was perfectly clear and self-possessed, even when it was supposed that I had less than an hour to live. But I was not worthy to appear before God, and it is meet that I should suffer, still more in this life, to do penance for my sins, and I shall be too happy, if God, in his mercy, will spare me in the other. Her Majesty goes on to express, her intention of coming to Shalot, as soon as the weather should change for the better, provided her health continues to amend, seeing she gains strength very slowly. She sends affectionate messages to the sisterhood in general, and to some of the invalids by name, requesting the prayers of the community for herself and her son, who is at present, she says, at the waters of Plombières. This very interesting letter concludes with these words. Adieu, my dear mother, till I can give you, in person, the particulars of the state of mind and body in which I am at present, and of my feelings when I believed myself dying, at which time both my heart and soul were far more tranquil than when I am well. It was one of the effects of God's mercy on me. The utter prostration of physical powers in which the royal widow remained for many weeks after this severe and dangerous illness is probably the reason that her name is so little mentioned in connection with the political history of a crisis, in which, as the mother of the Chevalier de St. George, she was only too painfully interested. The stormy conflicts, on the subject of the succession, that rudely shook the ebbing sands of her august stepdaughter, Queen Anne, will be related in the biography of that queen. During the last weeks of Queen Anne's illness, Mary Beatrice transmitted the intelligence she obtained on that subject regularly to her son. Her proceedings were, of course, closely watched. Prior, in his dispatch to Lord Bolingbroke of August 17th, he expresses himself uncertain whether his royal mistress were alive or dead. The widow of James II had received earlier tidings of the event, for we find by the same letter that she had sent off an express to her son in Lorraine. This express was dispatched by Mary Beatrice on the 12th of August, the day the news of Queen Anne's death reached her. The moment the Chevalier de St. George learned the demise of his royal sister, he took post and traveled incognito with utmost speed from Bar to Paris to consult the queen, his mother, and his other friends. Having resolved, says the Duke of Berwick, to cross over to England to assert his rights. As he was prohibited from entering France, Mary Beatrice came to meet him at Chalot, where the Duc de Lazune had hired a small house, in his own name, for the reception of the royal adventurer, whose person was too well known at Saint-Germain, for him to venture to brave the authority of his most Christian majesty by appearing there. Surrounded as both the mother and son were with spies, the secret of his arrival in the purlieus of Paris was quickly carried to the court of France. Louis the Fourteenth had paid too dearly for his romantic sympathy for the widow and son of James the Second, on a former occasion to commit himself a second time, by infringing the peace of Utrecht, as he had done that of Ryswick, to dry the tears of an afflicted queen. France was not in a state to maintain a war. Her monarch was turned of seventy-six. The age of chivalry was over. Instead of trusting himself to listen to the impassioned pleadings of the Constance and Arthur of modern history, he wisely sent his cool-headed minister, de Torcy, to persuade the luckless claimant of the British crown to return whence he came, and if he could not prevail, to tell him that he had orders to compel him to leave France without delay. As no invitation arrived from England, but on the contrary, George I had been peacefully proclaimed, it was judged unadvisable for the Chevalier to attempt to proceed thither, destitute as he was of money, ships, or men, and uncertain where to land. To have had the slightest chance of success, he ought to have been on the spot before the death of Queen Anne, ready to carry the field by a prompt appeal to the suffrages of the people. Now there was nothing to be done but to await quietly the effect that might be produced by the manners and appearance of the new sovereign, 
who had been called to the throne of the Plantagenets. Mary Beatrice and her son perceived too late how completely they had been fooled by the diplomacy of Harley. It must be confessed that neither the Queen nor the Earl of Middleton had put any confidence in the professions of that statesman till by the disbursement of a quarter's payment of the long-contested dower, he gave a tangible voucher of his good intentions toward the Stuart cause. It was, in sooth, eleven thousand seven hundred and fifty pounds cleverly employed in throwing dust in the eyes of those whose confidence he, by that politic sacrifice, succeeded in winning. The parting between Mary Beatrice and her son was, of course, a sorrowful one. The prince returned to Bar, and from Bar proceeded to Plombieres, where he issued a manifesto, asserting his right to the crown of England, and proclaiming the good intentions of the late princess, his sister, in his favor. This declaration turned, in some measure, the table on the treacherous members of Queen Anne's cabinet, who had played fast and loose with the court of Saint-Germain, and was followed by the disgrace of Harley, Ormond, and Bolingbroke. The young queen of Spain, who was a princess of Savoy, sister to the late Dauphiness Adelaide, and granddaughter of Henrietta of England, kept up an affectionate correspondence with Mary Beatrice, whom she always addressed as her dear aunt. Mary Beatrice received a very pleasing letter from this friendly princess, during her abode at Chalot, telling her how much pain she had felt at the reports of her illness, and thanking her for her goodness in having had prayers for her and her consort put up in the convent of Chalot. Her majesty entreated that those might be continued till after her delivery, as she was now in her eighth month, and should be compelled to remain in bed for the rest of the time. On the birth of the expected infant, which proved a son, the king of Spain wrote with his own hand, to announce that event to Mary Beatrice, and as she was still treated by that monarch and his ceremonious court with the same punctilious respect as if she had been the queen mother of a reigning sovereign, the royal letter was delivered to her in all due form, by the secretary to the Spanish embassy, who came in state to Chalot, and requested an audience of her majesty for that purpose. Mary Beatrice received also a letter from the Princess de Ursins, giving a favorable account of the progress of the Queen, and telling her that the new infant was to be named Ferdinand, a name revered in Spain. Mary Beatrice wrote in reply to the King of Spain, congratulating him on this happy event. In her reply to the Princess de Ursins, after expressing her joy at the safety of the Queen of Spain, she says, I pray you to embrace for me the dear little prince of the Asturias, to whom I wish all the blessings spiritual and temporal that God in his grace may be pleased to bestow, and I beg you to tell him as soon as he can understand what it means, that he has an old great-great-aunt who loves him very much. Meantime, in consequence of the death of the Duke de Berry, the last surviving grandson of France in the preceding May, the court of Versailles was scarcely less agitated with cobbles and intrigues regarding the choice of the future regent for the infant Dauphin than that of England had recently been on the question of the regal succession. The exiled Queen of England has been accused of aiding, with her personal influence, the attempt of Madame de Maintenon to obtain that high and important post for her pupil, the Duc de Maine, Louis the Fourteenth's son by Montpesson, in preference to the Duke d'Orlan, to whom it of right belonged, and for this end she constantly importuned his majesty to make a will conferring the regency on the Duke de Maine. The veteran intrigant, to whom the weight of fourscore years had not taught the wisdom of repose from the turmoils of state, fancied that if her pupil obtained the regency, she should still continue to be the ruling power in France. Louis the Fourteenth was reluctant to make a will at all, and still more so, to degrade himself in the opinion of the world, by making testamentary dispositions, such as he knew would be very properly set aside by the great peers of France. Madame de Maintenon carried her point, nevertheless, by the dint of her persevering importunity. The part ascribed to Mary Beatrice is not so well authenticated, on the contrary, it appears that it was to her that the vexed monarch 
vented the bitterness of his soul on this occasion when he came to shallow to meet her on the twenty eighth of august seventeen fourteen the moment he saw her he said madame i have made my will they tormented me to do it continued he turning his eyes significantly on madame de maintenon as he spoke and i have had neither peace nor repose till it was done mary beatrice attempted to soothe his irritation by commending him for his prudential care in settling the government for his infant heir before his death the answer of the aged king was striking i have purchased some repose for myself by what i have done but i know the perfect uselessness of it kings while they live can do more than other men but after our deaths our wills are less regarded than those of the humblest of our subjects we have seen this by the little regard that was paid to the testamentary dispositions of the late king my father and many other monarchs well madam it is done come what may of it but at least they will not tease me about it any more the queen beatrix eleonora wife of james the second king of england says elizabeth charlotte the mother of the regent orlan lived too well with the maintenon for it to be credible that our late king was in love with her i have seen a book entitled the old bastard protector of the young in which was recounted a piece of scandal of that queen and the late pere de la chaise this confessor was an aged man turned of four score who bore no slight resemblance to an ass having long ears a large mouth a great head and a long face it was ill imagined that libel was even less credible than what they have said about our late king it is rarely indeed that our caustic german princess rejects a gossip's tale and her departure from her wonted custom of believing the worst of every one is the more remarkable in this instance inasmuch as the widowed consort of james the second was the intimate friend and in some things unadvisedly the ally of la vielle maintenon the duchess of orlan complains that the letter had prejudiced the queen against her so that she had on some occasions treated her with less attention than was her due for instance she says when the queen of england came to marley and either walked with the king or accompanied him in his coach on their return the queen the dauphiness the princess of england and all other princesses would be gathered round the king but me for whom alone they did not send this implies a negative rather than a positive slight for the exiled queen certainly had no power of sending for any lady in that court she ought perhaps on observing the absence of madame to have inquired for her especially as she was a family connection of her late lord king james being the granddaughter of his aunt the queen of bohemia and the widow of his brother-in-law and cousin the late duke of orlan our grumbling duchess is however candid enough to attribute the friendship with which mary beatrice honoured maintenon to the idea that ingenuous princess had formed of her sanctity she feigns so much humility and piety when with the queen of england continues the duchess of orlan still speaking of maintenon that her majesty regards her as a saint it was considered a conclusive evidence of the matrimonial tie between louis the fourteenth and madame de maintenon when it was seen that she occupied a fauteuil in the presence of the consort of james the second who never abated one iota of the state pertaining to a queen of england in matters on which that ceremonious court placed an absurd importance as soon as it was known that the king had been to visit queen mary beatrice at chalot all the court considered it necessary to follow the royal example and as she made a point of offending no one by refusing to grant receptions she found herself so much fatigued as to be glad to return to saint germain the following affectionate billet appears to have been written by her to the abbess of chalot after her return it is now eight days since i quitted you my dear mother in the crowd and embarrassed of visits which fatigued me much and were troublesome not only in themselves but from having deprived me of the pleasure of conversing with you it seems to me however that i left you in a state of repose i wish to-day to learn if that continues and if the little depression in which you found yourself had any other effects 
I hope that it is removed, and that your heart is in that peace which I desire for it as for my own. And I pray to God that he will grant it to us, as it is only him who has power to give us what we wish. I shall go tomorrow to saint -Sir, and on Wednesday week to Fontainebleau, if it please God. You shall have tidings of me once before then. Send me yours, which cannot be indifferent to me assuredly, since I love you with all my heart. This letter has no other date than Saturday, but certainly belongs to the period of her last utter loneliness, as there is no mention of husband or children, and the solitary pronoun I, which she uses with reference to her visits to saint and Fontainebleau, tells a melancholy case in which the royal widow stood, after death had bereaved her of her sweet companion and comforter, the Princess Louisa, and cruel circumstances had deprived her of the society of her son. The following spring, strange manifestations of popular feeling in favor of the disinherited representative of the old royal line broke forth in various parts of England. The cries of, No foreign government, no Hanover, down with the roundheads, St. George for England, were reiterated in Oxford, London, Bristol, and Leicester, and other large towns. The oak leaves were, in spite of all prohibition, triumphantly displayed once more, on the national festival of the 29th of May, with the words, A new restoration, superadded in many places. In London, on the 10th of June, white roses were worn, in honor of the birthday of the Chevalier de St. George, and at night, the mob compelled the householders to illuminate, and broke the windows of those who did not, and finished their Saturnalia by burning the effigy of William the Third in Smithfield. It was the 27th anniversary of the birth of the son of Mary Beatrice, and the only one which had been celebrated with anything like popular rejoicings. At Edinburgh, his health was publicly drunk at the town cross by the style and title of King James the Eighth with acclamations. The object of this wild enthusiasm was, like Robert the Unready, too tardy to take advantage of the movement, which might have borne him triumphantly to a throne, if he had been at hand to encourage his friends. He waited for foreign aid. If Henry the Fourth, Edward the Fourth, and Henry the Seventh had done so, neither would have died kings of England. The timidity of Mary Beatrice, arising from the excess of her maternal weakness for her son, continued to paralyze the spirit of enterprise that was requisite for the leader of such a cause. She declared, as Lord Stair affirms, that without a fleet and a proper supply of arms and troops, her son ought not to imperil the lives and fortunes of his devoted friends by attempting a descent either on England or Scotland. It was, probably, for the purpose of impressing this caution on the mind of her son, that we find the royal invalid rousing herself to personal exertion once more, and commencing a journey to Plombieres, in a litter on the 12th of June, to obtain an interview with him, as he was prohibited from entering the French dominions. The Chevalier de St. George came to meet his mother at Plombieres, and after she had reposed herself there for a few days, induced her to accompany him on his return to the court of Bar, where she was most affectionately received by the friendly Duke and Duchess of Lorraine. The Earl of Stair was immediately, as in duty bound, on the alert to trace the proceedings of the exiled queen and her son. On the 24th of July, he writes to his own cabinet. I sent Barton to Lorraine to be informed of the pretender's motions. I met the Abbe Dubois in a wood, and gave him an account of the intelligence I had concerning the pretender. I desired he would be particularly careful in informing himself concerning the pretender's designs, and how far the court meddled with them. I set a man to observe, Lord Bolingbroke. Our ambassador also held secret intelligence with Mr. Hook, a Protestant divine, in the establishment of the Chevalier, formerly chaplain to Monmouth, a fabricator of libels against James the Second, whom that infatuated prince, in an evil hour for himself, pardoned and took into his own service and confidence, fancying that by favors he could convert a factious divine into a friend. Barton returned on the 29th of July from Bar, and on the same day, Lord Stair reports that, The pretender is still there with the queen, his mother, 
everything is quiet and few people there they talk of his that is the pretender going to britain when his mother comes back he will probably set out the following passage in a letter from the duke of berwick to torcy the french minister dated august twenty fourth seventeen fifteen affords an amusing comment on the conduct and character of his renowned uncle i have received a letter from the duke of marlborough in which he expresses to me that he hopes much to enjoy the protection of monsieur le chevalier that is st george accompanying these professions with a second present of two thousand pounds sterling this gives me much hope considering the character of my uncle who is not accustomed to scatter his money thus unless he foresees that it will prove of some utility. End of section 12